Chapter 1, Part 1 of The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by D. Wyckoff. The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass, by Apelius. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter 1, Part 1. The Metamorphosis of Apelius. Book the First. In the following Milesian narration, I will insert various fables, and charm your benevolent ears with an elegant and pleasing murmur, if you will not disdain to look into this Egyptian papyrus, written with the delightful subtlety of a Nilotic reed, and containing an admirable account of men changed into different forms, and, by certain vicissitudes, again restored to themselves. But who I am, I shall briefly thus unfold. The Attic Midas, the Corinthian Isthmus, and the Spartan Tenorus, happy soils, and which, in more felicitous books, were believed to be eternal, are the ancient originals of my race. There, I mean in Athens, I learnt the first rudiments of Grecian literature. Soon after, as a stranger, I came to Rome, and applied myself to the study of the Roman tongue, which, with great labor, I attained to the knowledge of, without the assistance of a preceptor. Behold, then, I solicit pardon if I should offend the reader by the rude utterance of a foreign language. Indeed, this first attempt of mine to write in the Latin tongue corresponds to the desultory matter of which we have undertaken to treat. We will begin, therefore, to narrate a Grecian fable. Reader, attend, and you will be delighted. I went to Thessaly on business, for in that place the foundations of our origin on the maternal side were laid by the illustrious Plutarch, and afterwards by his nephew Sextus, the philosopher, and thus became the source of renown to us. After, therefore, I had passed over the lofty mountains, the slippery valleys, the dewy turf, and the glebous plains, being very weary with riding, for I rode on a Thessalian white horse, who was also very much fatigued, in order that I might shake off my sedentary lassitude by the refreshment of walking, I leaped from my horse, diligently wiped the sweat from his forehead, stroked his ears, drew the reins over his head, and walked him gently, so that the usual and natural aid afforded by the discharge of urine might relieve the inconvenience of weariness. And while he was delighted with his ambulatory breakfast, and in a prone position passed over the meadows with his mouth inclined towards his side, I joined myself to two companions who were riding a little before me. And while I listened to their conversation, the one laughing said to the other, Desist, and do not enter into any further detail of such absurd and incredible fictions. On hearing this, as I was thirsty after novelty, I said, Make me a partaker of the narration. Not that I am inquisitive, but one who wishes to know either all, or certainly most things, and by doing so the delightful pleasantness of tales will, at the same time, smooth the asperity of the hill which we are ascending. But he that laughed before at his companion said, That false narration of yours is as true as if someone should assert that by magical incantation rapid rivers might be made to run back to their source, the sea be congealed, the winds blow without spirit, the sun be stopped in his course, the moon drop her foam, the stars be plucked from their spheres, the day be taken away, and the night held back. 
On hearing this, I said, Do not you, who began the narration, repent of having done so, or be weary of telling what remains to be told? And turning to the other, But you, said I, whose ears are gross, and whose mind is obstinate, refuse your assent to things which, perhaps, are truly narrated. For indeed you are not aware that through depraved opinions those things are thought to be false, which either appear novel to the hearing, or rare to the sight, or arduous from being beyond the reach of thought, but which, if you a little more accurately explored, you would not only find to be evident, but would perceive may be easily accomplished. At length in the evening, while I was endeavoring, in the company of certain voracious guests, to bite a larger piece of a cake consisting of barley flour and cheese, I was nearly choked through the softness of the gluttonous food sticking in my jaws and impeding the egress of my breath. Nevertheless, Lately at Athens, before the porch called Pasil, I beheld with both my eyes a juggler who swallowed a two-handed horseman's sword that had a very sharp edge, and afterwards, for a small sum of money, buried in his lower viscers a hunting spear, and so as to have that part of it downward which threatens destruction. And lo, the iron head of the spear having passed through the groin and being forced out again through the hinder part of the head, an effeminately beautiful boy was seen dancing on the other extremity of the spear. This boy in dancing turned and twisted himself as if he had been without nerves and bone to the admiration of all that were present so that you would have said it was the noble serpent which adheres with slippery embraces to the half-amputated branches of the knotted staff of the medical god. But I entreat you, said I to him who began the tale, to continue it. I alone will give credit to your narration, and will treat you with a dinner at the first inn at which we arrive. This shall be your reward. To which he replied, I take in good part what you promise, and will proceed with my narration. But prior to this, I will swear to you by this Son, the all-seeing God, that what I shall relate is true. Nor will you any longer doubt that it is so, if you go to the next city, which is Hypata, for there the things which were openly transacted are everywhere divulged but that you may first know who I am, from what race I am descended, and in quest of what gain I am now going, here. I am of Aegina, and am traveling through Thessaly, Atola, Beatus, for the purpose of procuring honey, cheese, and other articles of traffic of the like kind. Having found, therefore, that in Hypata, which is the principal city of all Thessaly, new cheese of an excellent flavor was to be sold for a very reasonable price, I hastily betook myself to that place in order to buy the whole of it. As it often happens, however, I came in an evil hour and was frustrated of my hopes of gain, for one lupus, a great purveyor, had bought all of it the day before. Being weary, therefore, through an inefficious celerity, I then went, the evening commencing, to the public baths. When, lo, I beheld my companion Socrates sitting on the ground, half covered with a torn and coarse mantle, and who appeared to be almost another person, he was so deformed by paleness and miserable leanness, for he resembled one of those who, being reduced to the extremity of distress, are compelled to beg in the streets. Hence, though he had been my guest, and was well known to me, yet I approached him with a dubious mind. Alas, my Socrates, I said, what is the meaning of this? What a figure! 
what crime have you committed? Great lamentation and weeping are made for you at home. Tutors are given to your children by a decree of the provincial magistrate. Your wife, having performed the duties which are due to the dead, and being deformed by grief and long-continued sorrow, so that she had almost lost her sight through excessive weeping, has been compelled by her parents to exhilarate herself by the joys of a new marriage. But here you present yourself to the view the resemblance of some wicked ghost to our great disgrace. To this he replied, O Aristomenes, you are ignorant of the slippery turnings and windings, the unstable incursions, and the reciprocal vicissitudes of fortune. And immediately after he had thus spoken, he covered his face, which had been for some time red through shame, with his ragged and coarse mantle, so that the rest of his body, from his navel downward, was rendered naked. But I, not enduring to behold such a miserable spectacle of infelicity, extended my hand to him, that I might help him to rise from the ground. He, however, with his head covered as it was, said, Suffer, oh, suffer fortune still longer, to enjoy the trophy which she has suspended. I have acted in such a way that this must follow. And at the same time I put off one of my two old garments, and speedily clothed, shall I say, or covered him. Immediately after I brought him to a bath, anointed and wiped him, and laboriously rubbed off the enormous filth with which he was defiled. Having also well attended to him, and being weary myself, I supported him, who was fatigued with great difficulty, and brought him to my inn, where I refreshed him with a bed, satisfied him with food, mitigated his sorrows with wine, and soothed him by fabulous narrations. And now our conversation and jests tended to hilarity, and we were not only facetious, but noisy, when he, painfully and profoundly sighing, and striking his forehead with his indignant right hand, exclaimed as follows, Miserable creature that I am, said he, who, while I was intent on gratifying myself with the sufficiently celebrated spectacle of gladiators, have fallen into these calamities. For as you well know, when I went to Macedonia for the sake of gain, I was there detained for the space of ten months, on my return from thence enriched by merchandise, and a little before I came to Larissa, in order to see the above-mentioned spectacle, I was attacked by a band of most desperate robbers in a certain devious and winding alley, from whom, however, after having been plundered by them of all my property, I at length escaped. And being through this reduced to extreme distress, I betook myself to a certain woman that sold wine, whose name was Moreau, and who, though old, was very pleasant and agreeable, and to her I unfolded the causes of my long peregrination, of my anxiety to return home, and of my being plundered of my property on that day. And while I, miserable man, narrated such particulars as I remembered, she, beginning to treat me very humanely, supplied me with an agreeable and gratuitous supper, and afterwards received me to her bed through the instigation of lust. At the same time also that I, unhappy man, lay with her, I contracted a lasting pestilence, a most baneful love, from only being once connected with her, and even gave her those ragged garments which the humane robbers had left me to cover my nakedness. I likewise presented her with the little gain which I obtained by making the short garments of soldiers while I was yet in a good condition of body, 
and thus at length this good wife and ill fortune reduced me to the naked state in which you just now saw me you indeed said i deserve to suffer the most severe of ills if yet there is anything more extreme than that which is last who have preferred venereal pleasure and a wrinkled harlot to your own house and children but he raising the finger next to the thumb to his mouth and being struck with astonishment be silent said he be silent and looking around to see whether he might speak with safety cease said he to revile a divine woman lest you injure yourself by an intemperate tongue why so said i what kind of woman is this powerful and royal tavern keeper he replied she is a divine sorceress and is able to draw down the heavens to elevate the earth to restrain fountains to dissolve mountains to place on high the shades of the dead to thrust down the gods extinguish the stars and to illuminate tartarus itself i beseech you said i take away this tragic tapestry roll up the theatric curtain and speak in a familiar language do you wish said he to hear one or two or many of her deeds for she is capable not only of making her fellow citizens to love her to their own destruction but the indians also the inhabitants of both the ethiopias and even the antichthenes themselves are only the leaves as it were of her art and trifling examples of her skill here however what she accomplished in the presence of many spectators she changed by one word only her lover into a beaver who had by force debauched another woman because that beast, fearing lest it should be taken, frees itself from the hunter that pursues it by the abscission of its own testicles, in order that the same thing might happen to her lover in consequence of his having been connected with another female. She likewise changed into a frog, an innkeeper, who was her neighbor, and of whom she was on that account envious, and now that old man, swimming in a tub of his own wine, and merged in the dregs of it, calls on his ancient guests with a hoarse and courteously croaking voice. She likewise changed one of the advocates of the court, because he had declaimed against her, into a ram, and now that ram pleads causes. The same sorceress also condemned to perpetual pregnancy the wife of her lover, who was now a parturient, by closing her womb, and retarding the egress of the infant, because she had reviled her somewhat severely. And according to the computation of all men, the belly of the miserable woman has been distended for the space of eight years, as if she were about to be delivered of an elephant as this unfortunate woman however and many others had been frequently injured by her arts the public indignation was excited against her and it was decreed that on the following day she should be severely punished by being stoned to death but she frustrated this design by the power of her enchantments and as medea having obtained by entreaty from creon the space of one day prior to her departure burnt the whole of his palace and also his daughter together with the old man with coronal flames or flames at the top of the head thus likewise this sorceress having performed certain deadly imprecations in a ditch as she herself lately told me enclosed all the inhabitants of the town in their own houses by so great a power of incantations that for the space of two whole days neither the bars of the doors could be broken nor the grates be opened nor the walls themselves be dug through till by mutual consent the people unanimously exclaimed 
and swore in the most sacred manner that they would not offer any violence to her, and would afford her salutary assistance if any person should attempt to injure her. Being therefore after this manner appeased, she liberated the whole city. At midnight, however, she conveyed the author of this conspiracy with all his house, with the walls, the ground, and the foundation, closed as it was, into another city, distant from thence a hundred miles, and situated on the summit of a lofty mountain, in consequence of which it was deprived of water, because, likewise, the houses of the inhabitants were built so near to each other that they did not afford any room to this newcomer, she threw the house before the gate of the city and departed. You narrate, said I, stupendous things, my Socrates, and such as are no less cruel than wonderful. And in the last place you have excited in me no small solicitude, or rather fear, for you have thrown at me not a little sharp stone, but a spear, lest that old woman, employing in a similar manner the assistance of some demon, should know the whole of our present conversation. Let us, therefore, quickly betake ourselves to rest, and when we have lightened our lassitude by the refreshment of sleep, fly from hence as far as we can before the dawn of day." While I was yet persuading the good man Socrates thus to act, he, being oppressed with the unusual intoxication and lassitude, snored loudly. But I, after I had closed the door, secured it with bars, and placed my bed against the hinges of it, betook myself to rest. And at first, indeed, I remained for a short time awake through fear, but afterwards I closed my eyes a little about midnight. I was scarcely, however, asleep when the doors were suddenly opened with a force too great to induce anyone to believe that this was effected by thieves, and besides this, the doors were hurled to the ground, the hinges being entirely broken and torn off. The bed, too, which was very short, deprived of one foot, and rotten, was thrown down with great violence, and falling so as to be reversed, covered and concealed me, who was rolled in it, and shaken off the bedstead to the ground. Then I perceived that certain affectations of the mind were naturally excited by contrary causes, for as tears frequently proceed from joy, Thus also, in that extreme fear, I could not refrain from laughing on perceiving myself, from being Aristomenes, made a tortoise. And while prostrate on the floor and looking obliquely, I wait for the issue of this affair, being protected by the situation of the bed, I saw two women of an advanced age, one of whom carried a lighted lamp, but the other a sponge and a drawn sword. With these accoutrements they surrounded Socrates, who slept profoundly. End of chapter 1, part 1ポモンフォーメーション、オートヴォランティア、プリーズヴィズッド、ライブヴォックス、ドッオー。レコーディング、バイシュローミー・アーセリオ。The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass, by Apelius. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter 1, Part 2. Then she who carried the sword said, This, O sister Panthea, is my dearly beloved Endymion, my Ganymede, who, both by day and by night, Has made sport of my youth. This is he who, despising my love, not only defames me by reproachful language, but also betakes himself to flight. But I indeed am deserted by the craft of this Ulysses, and, like another Calypso, am left to lament an eternal widowhood, extending likewise her right hand, and showing me to her Panthea. But this, said she, is his good counsellor Aristomenes, 
who was the author of this his flight, and now, near to death, lies prostrate on the ground with the bed upon him, and who likewise sees all these transactions, and thinks that he shall not be punished for the disgraceful things which he has said of me. I will take care, however, that he shall repent, though late, or rather presently, or even now of his former defamation and his present curiosity. On hearing this, I, miserable man, felt all my members in a cold sweat, and my bowels began to shake with fear, so that the bed, also being agitated and restless, leaped up and down on my back through my palpitation. But, O oh sister, said the good Panthea, shall we first delicerate this man after the manner of the back eye? Or binding his limbs, shall we amputate his genital parts? To this Moreau replied, for I then perceived that her name accorded in reality with the narrations of Socrates. Rather let him live, in order that he may cover with a little earth the body of this miserable creature, Socrates. And immediately after, having moved the head of Socrates to the other side, she plunged the whole of the sword into his body up to the hilt, through the left part of the neck, and diligently received the emission of the blood in a small vessel placed under it, so that no drop of it might ever be perceived. These things I beheld with my own eyes. The good Moreau, however, inserting her right hand through the wound, as far as to the most inward parts of the body, and exploring them, lest, as I think, she should at all deviate from the rites pertaining to a victim, drew out the heart of my unhappy companion, while he, in the interim, his windpipe being cut by the force of the sword, emitted through the wound a voice, or rather a stridulous, uncertain sound, and, with the bubbles of blood, poured forth his soul. But Panthea stopped the whole orifice of the wound with a sponge, and said, Beware, O sponge, born in the sea, that you do not pass through a river. Having thus said, and lifted my bed from the ground, they entirely drenched me with the moisture of the most filthy urine. Afterwards, they had scarcely passed over the threshold, when the doors rose again entire to their pristine state. The hinges settled in their receptacles. The bars returned to the side of the doors, and the bolts to their cavities in the posts. But I, in the state in which I still was, prostrate on the ground, dismayed, naked, cold, and drenched in urine, like an infant that has recently emerged from the womb of its mother, and besides this, half dead, or even surviving myself, and born again after my death, or rather a candidate for the cross, to which I was now destined, said, What will become of me when, in the morning, this my companion shall be found with his throat cut? To whom shall I appear to say what is probable, though I should speak the truth? For they will say, you ought at least to have called for assistance, if you, though so large a man, could not resist a woman. What, was the throat of a man cut before your eyes, and yet you were silent? Why were you not slain at the same time? Why did outrageous cruelty spare you, who witnessed the murder, and suffer you to remain an indicator of the deed? Because, therefore, you have escaped death, now return to it. These things I frequently revolved with myself, and the night verged towards day. It appeared, therefore, to me to be best to leave the inn privately before daylight, and to pursue my way, though with trembling steps. I take my bundle, put the key in the door, and draw back the bolts. But those good and faithful doors which had been spontaneously opened during the night were then scarcely and with great labour unfolded by the frequent insertion of the key. And I then said, Soho, Porter, where are you? Open the door of the inn as I wish to depart before the break of day. But the porter, who was lying on the ground behind the gate of the inn, and was even then half asleep, said, What are you who would begin your journey at this hour of the night, ignorant that the roads are infested by robbers? For though you may wish to die through the consciousness of some crime which you have committed, yet we have not the head of a gourd that we shall die for you. Then said I, It is nearly day, and besides, what can robbers take away from a traveller who is extremely poor? Are you ignorant, O stupid man? that he who is naked cannot be plundered even by ten athletes. To which the porter, weary and half asleep, and turning himself on the other side, replied, How do I know whether you have not killed your companion with whom you came hither yesterday in the evening, and that now you commit your safety to flight? For I remember at that time, i.e. at midnight, I saw Tartarus, which is at the extremity of the universe, and in it the dog Cerberus ready to devour me. And I recollected, indeed, that the good Moreau did not spare my throat through pity, but cruelly reserved me for the cross. Returning, therefore, to my bedchamber, I deliberated with myself about a speedy kind of death. But since fortune had supplied me with no other deadly weapon than my bed alone, I said now, O bed, most dear to my soul, 
who hast endured with me so many sorrows this night, and who art conscious and a witness of what has been transacted in the course of it, and whom alone, when I am accused, I can adduce in proof of my innocence, supply me, who am hastening to the realms beneath, with a salutary instrument of death. Having said this, I began to undo the rope with which the bed was corded, and having tied one end of it to a small beam which was under the window, and with the other made a sliding knot, I stood upon the bed, elevated to destruction, and put my head into the halter. But while with one foot I kicked away the prop by which I was supported, so that the rope being strained about my throat might by the pressure of the weight stop my breath, the rope which was both rotten and old suddenly broke, and I, violently descending from on high, fell upon Socrates, for he lay near me, and, together with him, I was rolled on the ground. And lo, at that very instant the porter rushed into the bedchamber, crying with a loud voice, Where are you that made such haste at midnight, and now lie snoring rolled in the bedclothes? At these words Socrates rose first, whether awakened by my falling, or by the discordant vociferation of the porter I know not, and said, It is not without reason that all these hostlers are execrated, for this impertinently curious fellow, by his unseasonable intrusion, with an intention I have no doubt of stealing something, has roused me, though very weary, from a profound sleep by his outrageous noise. On hearing him say this, I rose up, cheerful and glad, and replete with unhoped-for joy. I said, Behold, O most faithful porter, my companion, my father, and my brother, whom you, being intoxicated, falsely accused me of having slain. And immediately after I embraced Socrates and kissed him for joy. But he, being filled with the scent of the most filthy liquor with which those witches had infected me, vehemently spurned me from him. Take yourself from hence, said he, for you stink like the bottom of a privy. And he began mildly to inquire the cause of this fetid smell. But I, miserable man, having immediately devised an absurd tale, turned his attention to something else, and taking him by the right hand said, Let us go and enjoy the pleasure of a morning walk. So I took my bundle, and having paid the innkeeper for our night's lodging, we departed. We had not proceeded far before everything was refulgent through the rising of the sun, and I curiously and diligently observed the neck of my companion in that part in which I had seen the sword plunged, and said to myself, O oh, foolish man, you certainly have had a most absurd dream, because you have been overwhelmed with intoxication through wine. Behold, Socrates is entire, sound, and safe. Where is the wound? Where the sponge? And in the last place, where is the scar so deep and so recent? Addressing myself to him, I said, Skilful physicians are justly of opinion that horrible and troublesome dreams are the consequence of the body being distended with food and wine. For because I drank too much wine yesterday evening, the rough night exhibited to me dire and truculent images, so that I still fancy myself to be sprinkled and defiled with human gore. To which he, laughing, replied, You were not sprinkled with gore but with urine. Nevertheless, my throat appeared to me also in my sleep to be cut, for I felt a pain in my neck, and thought that my heart was plucked out, and even now my spirit fails me, my knees tremble, I stagger, and wish for some food to refresh my spirits. Behold, said I, a breakfast is ready prepared for you, and having said this, I took the scrip from my shoulders, and placed it on the ground, and hastily extended to him some cheese with bread. I also said, We will sit down near that plane tree, which having done, I also took some bread and cheese from the same scrip and beholding him somewhat more intently as he was greedily eating, I saw him become of a pale yellow colour. At length, also, his natural colour was so disturbed, that on imaging to myself, through fear, those nocturnal furies, the piece of bread which I had first taken, though it was very small, stuck in the middle of my throat, so that it could neither pass downward nor return upward. For the frequency of our going together caused an accumulation of my fear, for who would believe that one of two companions could be slain, without the fault of the other? He, however, after he had devoured a sufficient quantity of food, began to be impatiently thirsty, for he had greedily eaten a great part of a most excellent cheese, and not far from the roots of the plane tree, a gentle river sluggishly flowed, after the manner of a stagnant marsh, and which in its colour emulated silver or glass. Lo, said I, satiate yourself with the milk-white liquor of this fountain. He rose, and, being covered with his short cloak, inclined himself on his knees towards the more equable part of the bank, attempting, with great avidity, to drink the water. 
but he had scarcely touched the topmost dew of it with the surface of his lips when the wound of his throat opened into a deep cavity, and the sponge suddenly rolled out of it, accompanied by a small quantity of blood. Lastly, his body, being without life, had nearly fallen into the river. But I, laying hold of one of his feet, drew it with great difficulty and labour to the upper part of the bank. And after I had lamented my unfortunate companion as much as the time would permit, I buried him in the sandy soil, which is eternally in the vicinity of the river. I also, trembling and exceedingly fearing for myself, fled through various and inaccessible deserts. And as if guilty of homicide, having left my country and my home, and embraced a voluntary exile, I now dwell in Atolia, having there again entered into the connubial state. Thus far Aristomenes, that companion, however, of his, who from the first rejected his narration with an obstinate incredulity, said, There is nothing more fabulous than this tale, and nothing more absurd than this lie. And directing his discourse to me, But you, said he, who are a man of a cultivated mind, as the form of your body and your dress indicate, do you believe in this fable? To this, I replied, I do not think there is anything which may not be affected. But all things happen to mortals according to the decrees of fate. For many things usually happen to me and to you, and to all men, of an admirable nature, and almost incredible, which nevertheless, if narrated to an ignorant person, would lose their credibility. But I, by Hercules, believe in what Aristomenes has said, and give him the greatest thanks for having excited our attention by the pleasantness of a delightful tale and enabled me to accomplish a rough and long journey without weariness and labour, with which kindness I think that my horse also is much gratified, since I have been carried without fatigue even to the gate of the city, not on his back but by my ears, and thus terminated our conversation and our journey, for both my companions turned to the next villages on the left hand. But I entered into the first inn which I perceived and acquired of an old woman who kept a tavern, whether this was the city Hypata, and she gave me to understand by a nod that it was. Do you know, I said, a certain person of the name of Milo, who is one of the principal men of the city? At this question she laughed and said, Milo is deservedly considered to be one of the first men who dwells out of the whole city, and out of the Pomorium. Jesting apart, I said, Tell me, I beseech you, most excellent mother, what kind of man he is, and where he lives. Do you see, said she, those last windows which outwardly look to the city, and that gate on the other side, which fronts the next street, there Milo dwells, who abounds in money and is very opulent, but is extremely avaricious and shamefully sordid. In short, he frequently employs himself in usury on a very large scale, receiving for this purpose pledges of gold and silver, shut up in a little house, and always dwelling on his tarnished money, with a wife who partakes of his misery. Nor does he keep any one besides in his house except one female servant, and is always, when he walks abroad, habited like a mendicant. To this I laughing replied, My Demaeus has kindly and providently consulted for me, who has recommended me in travelling to a foreign country, to such a man with whom, while I stay, I shall have no occasion to fear clouds of smoke, or the smell of the kitchen. Having thus said, I proceeded a little farther, came to the gate, and knocked at the doors, which were strongly barred, at the same time calling to someone to open them. At length a certain girl came forth and said, Ho! You who knock at our doors so violently, what is the kind of pledge on which you want to borrow money? Are you alone ignorant that we admit of no pawn, except it is either gold or silver? Predict better things, I said, and rather inform me whether I shall find your master at home. He is indeed, she replied, but what is the cause of this question? I have brought a letter, I said, written to him by the Corinthian Demaeus. Wait for me, she said, in this very place, while I deliver your message to him. And immediately on saying this, having again fastened the doors, she went into the house. Returning from thence shortly after, and having opened the doors, she said, My master requests you to come in. I accordingly entered and found him sitting on a very little bed, and just then beginning his supper. His wife sat at his feet, and before an empty table, which, showing to me, she said, Behold your entertainment. It is well, I said and immediately I delivered to Milo the epistle of Demaeus, which having hastily read, he said, I love my friend Demaeus, who has procured for me such an illustrious guest. And having said this, he ordered his wife to depart, and desired me to sit in her place, taking hold of my garment likewise, and drawing me, who was reluctant through modesty. Sit there, said he, for through fear of robbers we dare not procure for ourselves any seats. 
nor even as much furniture as is sufficient for domestic purposes. I did what he ordered me to do. He then said, I may rightly conjecture from the excellent form of your body, and from this virgin modesty, that you are sprung from an illustrious race. But my friend Demaeus also asserts the same thing in his letter. I beseech you, therefore, not to despise the poverty of our little house. For, behold, that little bedchamber contiguous to this room, and which is a decent receptacle, will be for your use. Do not, therefore, unwillingly take up your abode with us, for you will render our house more ample by deigning to dwell in it, and will, besides, procure for yourself no small renown. If, being content with a little house, you emulate the virtues of Theseus, the namesake of your father, who did not disdain the slender and poor cottage of the old woman Hecale. Then, calling his maidservant, he said, Photis, take the baggage of our guest, and faithfully place it in that bedchamber, and at the same time bring quickly from the cellar oil to anoint him, a towel to wipe him, and other things useful for the same purpose, and conduct my guest to the neighbouring baths, for he is weary through a journey sufficiently difficult and long. When I had heard these things, considering with myself the mode of living and the frugality of Milo, and wishing to conciliate myself to him in a still greater degree, I said, I am not at all in want of things of this kind, because I carry them with me in all my peregrinations. And as to the baths, I can easily inquire where they are. Do you, Fotis, take this money and procure for me hay and barley for my horse, who has so well conveyed me hither, for this is my principal concern. When this was done, and my things were brought into that bedchamber, I proceeded towards the baths, but first went to the market, in order to procure something for supper. There I saw a great quantity of fish to be sold, and having asked what was the price of them, and refused to give a hundred pieces of money, at which the fishmonger valued them, I bought them for twenty pence. Immediately on departing from thence, Pythias followed me, who had been a schoolfellow of mine at Athens, who, having at length recognised me, stopped me in a friendly manner, and having embraced and gently kissed me, said, Oh, my Lucius, it is certainly a long time since I have seen you, as we have not met before since we left our master. But what is the cause of this your peregrination? You will know, I said, to-morrow. What, however, is the meaning of this? I rejoice that you have obtained your wish, for I perceive the lictors and the fasces, and that your dress is such as perfectly becomes a magistrate. To this he replied, I am a prefect of the market, and an edile, and if you wish to buy any food, I will take care that you shall have it at a reasonable price. But I signified to him that I could not avail myself of his kindness, because I had already provided myself with a sufficient quantity of fish for supper. But Pythias, beholding my basket and shaking the fishes, in order that they might be more easily seen, said, What did you give for this refuse? I replied, I could scarcely obtain them from the fishmonger for twenty pence, which when he had heard, taking hold of me by the right hand, he brought me back again to the market, and said, From which of these men did you buy this rubbish? I pointed out to him a little old man sitting in a corner, whom immediately rebuking in a most severe tone of voice, in consequence of his authority as an edile. Do you neither spare, said he, our friends, nor any strangers, that you sell trifling fish for so great a price, and thus have reduced this city, which is the flower of all Thessaly, to the form of a desert and an inaccessible rock, through the dearness of provisions? But this conduct shall not remain unpunished, for I will now make you know how worthless men ought to be restrained by an edile. And having thrown my basket to the ground, he ordered one of his attendants to stand on the fishes, and trample them under his feet. With which severity of discipline my Pythias, being satisfied, and having persuaded me to depart, he said, I have sufficiently punished, O Lucius, this old man, by causing him to suffer so great a disgrace. This being done, I betake myself to the baths, astonished and perfectly confounded, perceiving myself to be at one and the same time deprived of my money and my supper through the officiousness of my schoolfellow. Having likewise washed myself, I returned to the house of Milo, and afterwards to my bedchamber. And lo, the maidservant Fotis said, Your host invites you to supper. But I, who already knew the parsimony of Milo, gently excused myself by saying that I thought the fatigue of the journey was not to be removed by food, but by sleep. Milo, however, on receiving this message, came himself to me, took hold of my hand, and kindly endeavoured to lead me to supper. And while I delay and modestly resist, he said, You shall not depart from hence till you follow me. Accompanying him likewise what he said with an oath, he drew me, who unwillingly complied with his pertinacity to his bed. And when I was seated, he said, How is our friend Demaeus? Are his affairs prosperous? Tell me likewise all that you know respecting his wife, 
children and servants. He also more accurately inquired of me the causes of my journey, which after I had carefully narrated, he then asked me most particularly concerning my country and the leading men in it, and in the last place he inquired about the prefect of it. But perceiving that I was weary from the molestation of so rough a journey, and also from the length of my narration, that my words were cut short in the midst through sleep, and that lassitude occasioned me to speak indistinctly and to stutter. He at length permitted me to go to rest. I escaped, therefore, from the loquacious and hungry supper of the sordid old man, burdened with sleep and not with dainties, having supped on tales alone, and returning to my bedchamber, I delivered myself to the wished-for rest. End of chapter 1, part 2 Recording by Shiromi Arserio Shiromi.net Chapter 2, Part 1 of The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass, by Apuleius. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter 2, Part 1. Soon as, the night being dispersed, a new sun had made the day, emerging at the same time from sleep and my bed, being likewise anxious and above measure desirous of knowing what is rare and admirable, and recollecting that I was in the midst of Thessaly, where the genuine incantations of the magical art are reported to have originated by the unanimous consent of the whole earth, I diligently considered the several particulars of that narration of my excellent companion Aristomenes, which was occasioned by the proximity of this city, Hypata, to Thessaly, though I was otherwise in suspense from the desire of seeing something wonderful, and my diligence in the investigation of it. Nor was there anything in that city which when I beheld I could believe to be that which it really was but I was induced to think that everything was transmuted into another form by magical incantation, so that the stones which I met with were hardened into that shape from men. The birds which I heard singing had once been in the human form, but were now invested with feathers, and that this was also the case with the trees which were clothed with leaves, and surrounded the pomerium, or precinct of the town and with the fountains of water which devolved their streams from the liquefied bodies of men. I now likewise expected to find that the statues and images would walk, that the walls would speak, that sheep and that kind of cattle would prophesy, and that an oracle would suddenly be given from heaven itself, and the orb of the sun. Being thus astonished, or rather stupefied with tormenting desire, finding no beginning or even trace of the objects of my wish, I rapidly investigated every particular. Nevertheless, while, like one intoxicated, I wander through the whole town from one gate to another, I suddenly, and without knowing where I was, came to the market in which delicate provisions were sold. There, as I was walking quickly, I overtook a certain woman who was surrounded with a great number of servants. Her earrings and her garments were adorned with gold, in the former of which it was wreathed, and was woven in the latter, which demonstrated her to be a woman of the first rank. By her side there stood a very old man, who, as soon as he saw me, said, This by Hercules is Lucius, and at the same time he kissed me. Immediately after he whispered in the ear of the woman something which I did not hear. "'Will you not,' said he, "'approach and salute your parent?' "'I dare not,' I replied, "'salute a woman who is unknown to me.' And immediately blushing, I stood still with my head inclined to the other side. But she, fixing her eyes upon me, said, "'Behold the generous offspring of his most chaste mother, Salvia!' and the other parts of his body also admirably and exactly correspond to each other. For his stature is graceful, his slenderness is succulent, his ruddiness is moderate, his hair is yellow and without affectation, his eyes are azure but quick, and the sight of them is sharp and vigorous like that of an eagle. 
In short, he is everywhere comely, and his gait is decorous and artless. She also added, I have nursed you, O Lucius, with these my hands, and why should I not? For I not only participated with your mother of the same blood, but also of the same education, since we both originated from the lineage of Plutarch, have both of us sucked the milk of the same nurse, and have grown up together in the bonds of consanguinity. And there is no difference between us, except that which arises from dignity. For the marriage of your mother was illustrious, but mine was obscure. I am that Birina, whose name you may perhaps recollect, because it was frequently celebrated among those by whom you were educated. Betake yourself, therefore, confidently to our place of abode, or rather to your own proper house. To this I replied, my bashfulness having been dissipated by the time which she consumed in speaking. Far be it from me, O oh mother, that I should desert my host Milo, without any just cause of complaint. But I will sedulously take care to do whatever can be done by me without violating the rights of hospitality and as often as I have occasion to come this way, I will call upon you. While we were engaged in this friendly altercation, consisting of refusal on my part and invitation on hers, after we had proceeded a little farther, we came to the house of Birina. The courtyard was most beautiful, which supported statues of the goddess of victory, raised on pillars which were quadripartite in the several angles the wings of the statues being stretched on each side without any motion of the rolling sphere and decorating the unstable step of the dewy feet made the images seem as if they were not fixed but were really flying behold too parian marble fashioned into a statue of diana was erected in the middle of the whole place this image was perfectly splendid for the garment of the goddess appeared as if it was blown back by the wind and she seemed as it were to run, and to oppose those that were entering into the house. It was also venerable on account of the majesty of the divinity which it represented. Dogs stood on each side of the goddess, and these likewise were fashioned of marble. The eyes of these seemed to threaten, their ears were erect, their nostrils were open, and their mouths ferocious and if any barking had been heard from the neighbourhood, you would have thought it proceeded from the stony throats of the dogs. That also in which the excellent statuary had given the most consummate specimen of the carver's art was this, that the dogs being erect and with their breasts advanced, the hind feet stood still, but the fore feet seemed to run. Behind the goddess a rock rose, after the manner of a cavern, covered with moss, grass, leaves, and sprigs. In one place vines, and in another shrubs flourishing from the marble. Within the rock the shadow of the goddess was resplendent from the brightness of the marble. In the extreme margin of the rock apples and grapes hung exquisitely elaborated, which art, emulous of nature, represented similar to their exemplars. You would have thought that some of them might have been gathered for food, when autumn, the giver of wine, had breathed on them the colour of maturity. And if you beheld in a prone position the fountains, which, running under the feet of the goddess, vibrated in gentle waves, you would have thought that the clusters of grapes which hung from the vine, among other things in which they resembled reality, were also not destitute of mobility. In the midst also of the stony leaves was a carved Actaean, looking behind him with prying eyes, and now invested with the brutal form of a stag, and both in the marble and in the fountain he was seen to be expecting the coming of Diana to bathe. While attentively inspecting these works of art, I was exceedingly delighted. All that you see, said Birina, is yours and immediately after she ordered with a low voice all the rest of her attendants to depart. And when all of them were gone, By this goddess, she said, my dearest Lucius, how exceedingly do I fear for you, and how much do I wish that you, who are, as it were, my son, may be well advised. Take care of yourself, but especially beware of the evil arts and nefarious blandishments of that Pamphili, the wife of Milo, 
whom you say is your host. She is one of the most renowned witches, and is believed to be mistress of every necromantic incantation, so that by branches of trees and stones and other frivolous things of the like kind, when she has breathed on them with magic words, she knows how to merge into the depths of Tartarus, and into ancient chaos, all this light of the starry world. For as soon as she has beheld any youth of a beautiful form, she is captivated by his elegance, and immediately turns upon him the sight both of her eyes and of her mind. She employs blandishments, she invades his spirit, she binds him with the eternal fetters of profound love. Then, despising those who are not sufficiently obedient to her, and who rank among the vulgar, she changes them in a moment of time into stones and cattle, and any kind of beast but others she entirely destroys. I tremble for you on account of these things, and entreat you to beware of them. For she burns with an eternal love, and you, through your youth and your beauty, are fitted for her purpose. This was what Birena, who was very solicitous for my welfare, said to me. But I, who was otherwise inquisitive, as soon as I heard the name of the magic art, which I always wished to obtain the knowledge of, was so far from dreading the blandishments of Pamphili, that I voluntarily longed to become a proficient in that science, even though at a great price, and to precipitate myself entirely, with an accelerated leap, into the gulf of magic. Hence I hastily and insanely liberated myself from her hand, as from a certain bond, and having speedily said farewell, I flew to the house of Milo. And while, like one deprived of intellect, I thus accelerate my pace, I said, Now, O Lucius, be vigilant and attentive to yourself, for now you have the wished-for opportunity, and you may satiate your mind with admirable tales, which you have long desired to do. Away, then, with puerile fears. Strenuously encounter with the thing itself more nearly. Abstain from venereal connection with your hostess, and religiously reverence the conjugal bed of the worthy Milo. Attack, however, with all your might the maid-servant Fotis, for her form is elegant, her manners are facetious, and her conversation delightful. Yesterday evening, likewise, when you went to rest, she courteously brought you into the bedchamber, gently laid you in bed, very lovingly covered you, and having kissed your head, showed by her countenance how unwillingly she left you, and in the last place she frequently stood still, turning herself and looking behind her. Let us therefore make advances to Fotis, as a thing good, felicitous, and fortunate, though it should not be salutary. While I thus determined with myself, I came to the gate of Milo, yet I did not find either Milo or his wife at home, but only my dear Fotis, who was preparing for her master and mistress a finely seasoned dish of minced meat, together with some broth. And I conjectured indeed by my smell that she was making very savoury food. She herself being neatly dressed in a linen garment, and girded a little higher than usual under her breasts, with a red and very splendid band, stirred round with her beautiful hands that dish of minced meat, and as she frequently stirred it, the gradually vibrating motion of her loins, and the gentle agitation of the flexible spine of her back, produced a graceful undulation. On perceiving this, I was fixed in astonishment, and stood wondering, and at length I said to her, How beautiful and pleasing, my Fotis, is the motion of your loins in stirring that dish of meat! What honeyed broth are you preparing? Happy and more surely blessed he, who is permitted by you to dip his finger in it! Then she, who was otherwise a pleasant and merrily loquacious girl, said, Depart, O miserable man, far from me! Depart from my fire, for if the flame of my love should scorch you, though but in a moderate degree, you will be profoundly burnt. Thus speaking, she looked at me and laughed. I did not, however, depart from her, till I had diligently explored the whole form of her body. 
but why do I speak of other things pertaining to her, since it has ever been my only care sedulously to survey, in the first place, the head and the hair in public, and afterwards to enjoy them at home? In this decision I am confirmed by considering that this part of the body has a conspicuous position, and is the first thing that presents itself to our sight, and that the native splendour of the hair effects the same thing in the head, as the delightful colour of a beautiful garment in the other members of the body. Lastly, most women, in order to exhibit their native gracefulness and allurements, divest themselves of all their garments, and long to show their naked beauty, being conscious that they shall please more by the rosy redness of their skin than by the golden splendour of their robes. But, though it is a thing not lawful to speak of, and may there never be so dire an example of such a thing, if you deprive a woman of the most surpassing beauty of her hair, and strip her face of its native elegance, though she were sent from the heavens, produced from the sea, and nourished in the waves, though, I say, she were Venus herself, surrounded by all the graces, and attended by the whole family of loves, girded with her cestus, fragrant with cinnamon, and dropping balsam as she moves, yet if she were bald, she would not be able to please her own Vulcan. How beautiful is the hair when it is of a pleasing colour, shines with a glittering light, is vividly refulgent when opposite to the rays of the sun, or is more mildly resplendent, and varies its appearance in a different gracefulness. At one time emitting a brightness like that of gold, it sinks into a slender shade of the colour of honey. At another, with a blackness like that of a crow, it emulates the azure flowers of the neck of doves, or now anointed with Arabian drops, separated by the slender tooth of a sharp comb, and tied behind the head, it presents itself to the eyes of the lover. It then, like a mirror, reflects a more pleasing image. How beautiful, when being thick, it is agglomerated with prolific abundance on the crown of the head, or, extended in a long series, flows down the back. Lastly, so great is the dignity of the hair of the head, that though a woman should be adorned with gold, rich garments, precious stones, and every other ornament, yet she would not seem to be decorated, unless her hair was gracefully divided. But in my photis, not studied, but neglected ornament, added elegance to her person. For her copious hairs, gradually falling pendulous on the hind part of her neck, and being afterwards distributed through the neck, and leisurely reclining on the flexuous border of the top of her garment, were, after being a little conglomerated in the extremity, fastened by a knot to the crown of her head. I could not, however, then any longer sustain the torment of such transcendent pleasure, but immediately gave her a most luscious kiss in that part where the hair ascended to the summit of her head. Then she turned herself toward me, and looking at me obliquely and with petulant eyes, So then, you novice, said she, you have taken a sweet, and at the same time a bitter draught. Take care, lest from the excessive sweetness of the honey you do not procure for yourself the lasting bitterness of gall. Why do you say so, my delight? I replied, since I am prepared, being renovated, to be roasted by that fire, even for one kiss. And having said this, and embraced her more closely, I began to kiss her more ardently. And now she, co-germinating with me into an equality of love, exhaling from her open mouth the odour of cinnamon, and ravishing me with the nectarious touch of her tongue, I said to her, I shall perish, or rather I am already a lost man, unless you will be propitious. To which she replied, having again kissed me, Be of good courage, for I am enslaved to you by mutual desire, nor shall our pleasure be deferred any longer, but as soon as it is night, I will give myself to your embraces. It was scarcely, however, yet noon, when Berena sent to me hospitable gifts, videte, a fat pig, five hens, and a caddis of wine, valuable for its age. Then I, having called Fotis, said, 
Behold, Bacchus, the exciter and armour-bearer of Venus, is come of his own accord, for the voyage of Venus alone requires such provision as this, videte, that through the whole of the wakeful night the lamp may abound with oil and the cup with wine. The rest of the day I passed in bathing, and afterwards in supping, for, being invited by the good Milo, I sat at his scanty table as much as possible out of the view of his wife, in consequence of recollecting the admonitions of Birena, and tremblingly cast my eyes upon her as if I was beholding the Lake Avernus. But as I continually looked at Fotis, who waited on us, my mind was refreshed by the view. As it was now evening, Pamphili, beholding the lamp, said, It will rain abundantly to-morrow. And on her husband asking her how she knew that to be the case, she answered, That this was predicted to her by the lamp. At this Milo, laughing, said, We nourish in this lamp a great sibyl, who sees from the candlestick as from a watch-tower all that is transacting in the heavens, and therefore surveys even the sun itself. To this I subjoined, These are the first specimens of this kind of prediction, nor ought it to seem wonderful that this flame, though small, and the work of human hands, should nevertheless have a recollection of that greater and celestial fire as of its parent, and through this should divinely presage and enunciate to us what the source of its existence is about to effect in the summit of the heavens. For with us at Corinth a certain Chaldean stranger now disturbs the whole city with his admirable predictions, and divulges to the common people the arcana of fate for the sake of gain. Thus, for instance, he would tell the day on which the nuptial knot would be tied, or the foundations of walls would be established so as to remain for ever, and what day would be auspicious to the merchant, or an anniversary to the traveller, or adapted to navigation. Lastly, to me inquiring of him what would be the result of this my journey, he answered, that it would be attended with many very admirable and different events. For, he said, that at one time I should obtain a sufficiently flourishing renown, and that at another I should write a great history and an incredible fable and compose books. Milo, laughing on hearing this, says, Of what stature was this Chaldean, and what was his name? I replied, He was a tall man, and of a dark complexion, and his name was Diophanes. It is the same person, said Milo, and no other, who, having similarly predicted many things to many in this city, and gained through it no inconsiderable wealth, or rather a great sum of money, unhappily experienced an inauspicious or that I may speak more truly, a cruel fortune. For on a certain day, when being surrounded with a great crowd, he distributed destiny to all around him, a merchant, whose name was Cerdo, came to him desiring to know what day would be the fittest to take a journey. But when Diophanes had selected and pointed out to him the proper day, and Cerdo, having opened his purse and taken out the money contained in it, had counted a hundred pence, which he intended to give him as the reward of his predictions. Behold, a certain youth of noble family, coming behind him and taking hold of his garment, embraced and kissed him most cordially. But Diophanes, having in his turn also kissed the youth, and at the same time desired him to sit near him, was stupefied, as it were, by the unexpected sight of his friend, and forgetting what had just then occurred, said to him, how long is it, my much-wished-for friend, since you came into these parts? To this the other answered, I came about the beginning of the evening. But do you also, brother, inform me in your turn how it happened that you sailed so quickly from the island of Euboea to this city, and have passed over both sea and land? In answer to this, Diophanes, that excellent Chaldean, being deprived of intellect, and not yet himself, said, May our enemies and all those who are hostile to us meet with the like cruel and Ulyssian peregrination. For the ship itself in which we sailed, being injured by various storms, and having lost both the mast and the rudder, could not be impelled to the opposite shore, but was merged in the gulf. 
and we, having lost all our property, were scarcely able to save ourselves. Whatever we could scrape together, either from the pity of strangers or the benevolence of our friends, was all taken from us by a band of robbers, and my brother, whose name was Arisuatus, being the only one that resisted their violence, was unhappily slain before my eyes. While Diophanes was sorrowfully relating these particulars, the merchant Cerdo, taking up the money which he had designed to pay for the prediction, immediately ran away. Then, however, Diophanes, being at length roused from his stupor, perceived the injury which he had sustained through his imprudence, especially when he saw that all of us who surrounded him burst into loud laughter. But I wish, Lucius, that the Chaldean may have predicted what is true to you alone among all of them, and that you may be happy, and make a prosperous journey. During this prolix narration of Milo, I silently lamented, and was not a little angry with myself, that having voluntarily introduced a series of unseasonable tales, I had lost a good part of the night, and the most delightful fruit of it. At length, therefore, I boldly said to Milo, Let Diophanes bear his destiny, and again expose to the perils both of land and sea the money which he may obtain by his predictions. But suffer me, who am still weary from the toil of yesterday, to betake myself quickly to rest. Having said this, I rose up and went to my bedchamber, and there I found a most elegant arrangement of delicacies. For the bed of the less male servants was laid on the floor, at a considerable distance from the door, in order, I suppose, that they might not be a witness of the nocturnal murmurs. A small table stood by my bed, sufficiently laden with the rich remains of the whole supper, and two cups already half full of water, only waiting for the admixture of wine. Near these also was a stone bottle, the orifice of which gradually dilated, and from which the wine could easily be drawn. I was scarcely laid down when, behold, my Fotis, her mistress having now retired to rest, approached, scattering roses upon the bed, some of which also she carried in her swelling bosom. Having likewise closely kissed me, tied a garland round my head, and strewed upon me flowers, she seized a cup, and pouring warm water into it, extended it to me, that I might drink. But before I had drunk the whole, she gently took it from me, and gradually diminishing with her lips what was left, and at the same time fixing her eyes on me, she sweetly sipped it, a second and a third time also, and frequently we pledged each other. End of chapter 2, part 1「Chapter Two, Part Two of the Metamorphosis or Golden Ass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Metamorphosis or Golden Ass by Apuleius, translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter Two, Part Two. It happened on a certain day that Birina earnestly desired me to take a small supper with her, and when I very much excused myself, she said she would never forgive me if I refused to come. I went therefore to Fotis to ask her advice, considering her assent as an auspicious omen, who, though she was unwilling that I should depart from her the breadth of a nail, yet she kindly granted me a little respite from our amatory war. But take care, said she, that you return early from supper, for a furious band of the most noble youth of the city disturbs the public peace. Hence you will everywhere see men that have been murdered lying in the middle of the streets, nor can the aid afforded by the prefect of the province, on account of its great distance, defend the city from so great a calamity. But the splendour of your fortune may create snares for you, and your being a foreigner may render you contemptible. Do not disturb yourself, I said, my Fotis, for I shall return early, not only because I prefer my own pleasures to the banquets of others, but also in order that I may remove your fear. 
Nevertheless, I shall not go unattended, for I shall carry with me the succour of my safety, since I shall have, depending from my side, my accustomed sword. Thus prepared, I betook myself to supper. There I found many guests, and as she was a woman of rank, they consisted of the flower of the city. The banquet was sumptuous, the beds were splendid with ivory, and covered with cloth of gold. The cups were ample, some of which were more precious than others, but all of them were equally beautiful. This was of glass adorned with figures exquisitely wrought. There stood one of crystal, perfectly pure. Here was a cup of bright silver, and there of glittering gold. And in another place stood one of amber, admirably excavated, so as to be fitted for a drinking vessel. In short, whatever might be believed to be impossible to be effected was there. The servants who distributed the food were numerous and magnificently clothed, and the delicacies were abundant. Virgins, elegantly ministrant, attended, and boys with curled locks and beautifully attired, frequently handed to the guests old wine in gems fashioned into cups, and now the lamps being introduced, convivial conversation abounded, together with frequent laughter, liberal jests and pleasant jibes. Then Birina thus addressed me, Do you find yourself comfortable in our country? For I know that we excel all other cities in temples and baths and other public works. We likewise abound with provisions. Certainly we have here tranquil liberty, and the stranger who is intent on business may here find a multitude of men resembling those of Rome. But the unambitious stranger will find here rural quiet. Lastly, the whole province comes to this place for the sake of solitary pleasure. To this I replied, What you say is true, nor have I thought myself to be anywhere more free than I am here. But I am very much afraid of the dark and inevitable retreats of the magic discipline, for it is said that not even the sepulchres of the dead are secure, but that certain relics and fragments of dead bodies are snatched from the burning pyres, for the purpose of being subservient to the destruction of the living. And old witches, at the very moment of the preparation for a funeral, outstrip by the rapidity of their speed the burial of strangers. In addition to what I thus said, another person observed, Here indeed they do not even spare any of the living, and one whom I know, having suffered something of this kind, was mutilated in his face, which was everywhere deformed. In the meantime, unrestrained laughter diffused itself through the whole banquet, and the eyes of all the guests were turned towards a certain person who sat in a corner apart from the rest of the company. This man, being confused by the pervicaciousness of all those who were looking at him, and indignantly muttering to himself, was preparing to rise and go away. But Birina said to him, Do not go, my telephron, but stop a little while, and with your usual urbanity resume your narration from the beginning, that this my son Lucius also may partake of the pleasure produced by your facetious tale. To this he said, you indeed, madam, always preserve an inviolable probity, but the insolence of certain persons is not to be borne. Thus he, being moved with indignation. The urgent entreaties, however, of Birina, who conjured him by her own life to give the narration, forced him at length to comply. Telephron, therefore, having made a pile of the coverlets, leaning on his elbow and raising himself a little on the bed, extended his right hand, and composed the articulation of his fingers, after the manner of orators. Having likewise shut the two lowest fingers, he expanded the rest in a prominent position, and gently smiling, with his thumb stretched out, began as follows. While I was yet a pupil, I went to Miletus to see the Olympic Games, and as I wished also to visit these places of this famous province, having travelled all over Thessaly, I came with ill omens to Larissa, and while roving through every place, the money which I had brought with me for my journey being very much diminished, I was exploring some means of mitigating my poverty, I beheld in the middle of the forum a certain tall old man. 
he stood on a stone and proclaimed with a loud voice if any one wishes to be the guardian of the dead body of one deceased he shall be well rewarded for the undertaking then i said to one that was passing by what is the meaning of this proclamation are the dead in this place accustomed to run away he answered be silent for you are very young and perfectly a stranger and you are also ignorant that you are in the middle of thessaly where witches everywhere lacerate with their teeth the faces of the dead and such conduct is to them the solace of the magic art to this i replied tell me i beseech you in what does this funeral guardianship consist in the first place said he you must incessantly watch through the whole night with open and unwinking eyes continually fixed on the dead body nor must your sight ever be diverted from this object nor in the smallest degree turned from it for these worst of witches having transformed themselves into any brutal body creep in latently so that they easily elude the eyes both of justice and the sun for they change themselves into birds and besides this into dogs and rats and even into flies then too they oppress the guardians with sleep by employing dire enchantments nor can any sufficiently define the magnitude of the frauds which they devise for the sake of gratifying their libidinous appetite notwithstanding this however not more than four or six pieces of golden coin are offered as the reward of such a dangerous undertaking and in addition to this which i had almost forgotten if he who watches does not on the following morning restore the dead body entire he is compelled to repair the whole of whatever has been bitten and taken from it with discerptions from his own face on hearing this i invigorated my mind with a masculine strength and going directly to the crier i said cease to proclaim any farther a guardian is present ready prepared for you tell me what the recompense will be you will receive said he a thousand pieces of money but be very careful o young man to preserve the dead body of one of the principal persons of this city from most iniquitous harpies you narrate to me i said absurdities and mere trifles you behold in me a man of iron sleepless and certainly more sharp-sighted than lynceus himself or argus and one who is all i i had scarcely finished when he immediately brought me to a certain house the gates of which being closed he introduced me through a narrow back door and pointed out to me a bedchamber which was dark in consequence of the window shutters being closed and a woman clothed in a black garment weeping near whom the crier standing said this man confidently offers to watch the dead body of your husband for the proposed reward but she removing to each side the hair that hung down before her face which even in sorrow was beautiful and beholding me said endeavour i beseech you to perform the office which you have undertaken vigilantly lay aside all care i said and only procure for me some overplus adapted to the labour of my undertaking to this assenting she hastily arose and brought me into another bedchamber there she disclosed with her hand a dead body that was covered with very white linen in the presence of seven witnesses who had been introduced into the room and having wept for a long time and desired those that were present to bear testimony she diligently pointed out to them every particular a certain person at the same time describing in a writing-table the parts of the body which he severally touched for that purpose behold said she his nose is entire his eyes are in a sound condition his ears are safe his lips have not been violated and his chin is whole you worthy citizens be witnesses of this and having said this she sealed the tables and departed but i said to her be so good madam as to order that all things may be procured for me which are necessary to this undertaking what are these said she i replied a large lamp sufficient oil to supply it with till it is daylight warm water with wine vessels and a cup and a tray furnished with the remains of the supper then she shaking her head said begone foolish man 
who dost expect supper and the relics of feasting in a house full of sorrow and in which for so many days no smoke has been seen do you think that you have come hither to feast rather assume as adapted to this place sorrow and tears and at the same time turning to her maid-servant she said Mirina, immediately give him a lamp and oil and shutting me in the bedchamber she departed i therefore being thus left alone to the solace of the dead body having rubbed my eyes and armed myself to vigilance soothed my mind by singing when lo the twilight commenced the night advanced still deeper and deeper night and at length midnight and my fear became greatly increased but then a weasel suddenly creeping into the bedchamber stood opposite to me and looked very sharply at me so that the little animal disturbed my mind by its great audacity at length however i thus spoke to it depart impure beast and hide yourself with little mice that resemble you before you experience our powerful blows why do you not go away the animal fled and immediately left the chamber but directly after a profound sleep suddenly merged me into its unfathomable depths so that not even the delphic god himself could easily distinguish which of us two that were prostrate was more dead i thus inanimate and requiring another keeper was nearly not there scarcely had the streperous song of the crested cohort proclaimed a truce to-night when i being at length roused and terrified in the extreme ran to the dead body and taking the lamp with me and uncovering the face of the corpse i scrutinized every member and found all was right when lo the miserable wife entered weeping with the witnesses of yesterday being very solicitous for the event and immediately falling on the body and kissing it frequently and for a long time she explored everything by the testimony of the lamp then turning herself she called philodespotus the steward of her house and ordered him to pay me without delay the wages of a good guardian this being immediately presented to me we give you the greatest thanks she said o oh, young man and by hercules for having so well accomplished this undertaking we shall afterwards rank you among the rest of our domestics to this being delighted with the unexpected gain and astonished at the sight of the glittering pieces of gold which i frequently shook in my hand i said indeed madam you may consider me as one of your servants and as often as you may be in want of my assistance confidently command it i had scarcely thus spoken when the domestics execrating the nefarious omen of my words took up arms of every kind and pursued me one began to strike me on the face with his fist another on the shoulders with his elbows by some i was kicked and by others my hair was plucked off and my garment was lacerated and thus being mangled and torn in pieces by reproaches and maledictions like the proud youth adonis or orpheus the son of the muse calliope i was thrust out of doors and while i recover myself in the next street and, and too late call to mind my inauspicious and imprudent speech and confess that i deserved to suffer even more blows than i had received behold the dead body was now carried out accompanied for the last time by lamentations and clamour and was brought through the forum with all the pomp of a public funeral and according to the rites of his country in consequence of having been one of the principal men of the city to the side of the corpse came a certain old man tearing his native hair and seizing the bier with both hands and with a voice raised indeed but interrupted with continual sighs he proclaimed by your faith o citizens and by your public piety give assistance to your murdered fellow-citizen and severely revenge a most atrocious deed on this abominable and wicked woman for she and no other has destroyed by poison this miserable young man the son of my sister in order that she might gratify her adulterer and invade his hereditary possessions after this manner the old man loudly uttered querulous lamentations interrupted by sobs in the meantime the common people began to rage and were impelled to a belief of the crime by the probability of its having been committed 
they clamorously call for fire, they demand stones, and they incite the boys to the destruction of the woman. But she, loudly lamenting, and adjuring all the divinities in the most sacred manner possible, denied that she had perpetrated so great a crime. The old man therefore said, Let us refer the decision of the truth to divine providence. Saklas the Egyptian is present, who ranks among the first of the prophets, and who agreed with me some time since for a great reward, to recall for a little while the soul of this dead man, from the realms beneath, and to reanimate this body. And having thus said, he brought into the midst of the bystanders a certain young man, clothed in linen garments, who had on his feet shoes made from palm leaves woven together, and whose head was entirely shaven. The old man likewise, having for a long time kissed his hands and embraced his knees, said, O oh, priest, take pity on me, I beseech you, by the celestial stars, by the gods of the infernal regions, by the natural elements, by the silence of night, the Coptic enclosures, the Nilotic increments, the Memphitic arcana, and the Pharaic sistra. Give to this body a short use of the sun, and infuse a small portion of light in eyes buried in eternal night. We do not wish to resist fate, nor to deny the earth a thing which is her own, but we only request a short space of life as a solace of vengeance. The prophet, being thus rendered propitious, took a certain herb, and laid it thrice on the mouth of the dead body, and placed another on the breast of it. Then, turning himself to the east, and silently imploring the increments of the august sun, he raised the eager attention of those that were present to so great a miracle by the form of such a venerable apparatus. I mingled myself with the crowd, and standing on a certain more elevated stone, which was behind the bier, I observed everything with inquisitive eyes. And now the breast of the corpse began to swell with respiration, the salubrious vein to have pulsation, and the body to be filled with spirit. The corpse also arose, and thus spoke to the young man, Why, I beseech you, do you bring me back to the offices of a momentary life, after I have drunk of the Lethean cup, and have swum over the Stygian marshes? Desist, I pray you, now desist, and suffer me to remain in my rest. These words were heard from the body. But the prophet, being a little more excited, said, Why do you not narrate everything to this crowd, and disclose the secrets of your death? Do you not think that the furies can be called forth by my imprecations, and that your wearied limbs may be tormented? To this the reanimated body answered from the bier, and thus with a groan addressed the people. I was destroyed by the nefarious arts of a new wife, and being compelled to take an envenomed potion, I delivered to an adulterer my yet tepid bed. Then the egregious wife assumed confidence from the present circumstances, and resisting, with a sacrilegious mind, contends against her confuting husband. The vulgar are inflamed and divided into contrary parties. These contend that the most execrable woman should be immediately buried alive with the body of her husband. Others are of opinion that no credit should be given to the lying testimony of a dead body. The subsequent speech, however, of the corpse dissolved this contest, for again profoundly groaning it said, I will give you, I will give you manifest documents of unviolated truth, and will indicate to you what is known to no one else. Then, pointed to me with his finger, When this most sagacious guardian, said he, of my body, diligently watched over me, old enchantresses, ardently longing after the spoil of my members, and on this account having frequently been in vain changed into other forms, when they found they could not deceive his sedulous attention, having at length thrown over him the dark mist of drowsiness, and buried him in profound sleep, they did not cease to call me by my name, till my infirm joints and cold members struggled by sluggish endeavours to obey the mandates of the magic art. Then this man, who was alive indeed, but dead only with sleep, because he had the same denomination with myself, rose, 
ignorant of what had been transacted on hearing his name, and spontaneously walking like an inanimate shadow, though the doors of the bedchamber were carefully closed, suffered mutilation instead of me, his nose first, and afterwards his ears, being amputated through a certain chink, and that other things might correspond with the fraud, they accurately adapted to him wax, fashioned in the shape of his mutilated ears, and provided him with a waxen nose similar to his own. And now the miserable man stands here, having obtained the reward, not of his vigilance, but of his mutilation. On hearing this, I, being terrified, began to try my fortune. With my hand I take hold of my nose, it follows my hand, I touch my ears, and they fall off, and while I am pointed out by the direct fingers and oblique nods of those that were present, while there was an ebullition of laughter, I escape between the feet of the surrounding crowd, wet with frigid perspiration. Nor, being thus mutilated and exposed to ridicule, could I return to my paternal abode, but with my hair falling on each side of my face, I concealed the wounds of my ears, and covered the disgrace of my nose with this linen cloth closely applied to it. As soon as Telephron had brought this narration to an end, all the inebriated guests were again dissolved in laughter and while they asked permission to drink the health of their friends, Birina thus addressed me. Tomorrow comes as a day, which it has been usual to celebrate from the earliest infancy of this city, on which day we alone of all men propitiate the most sacred god of laughter with hilarity and mirth. Your presence will render him more pleasing to us, and I wish you could devise anything from your own proper pleasantry of a joyous nature in honour of the God, in order that we might, in a greater and more perfect degree, please so great a divinity. It is well, I said, and what you request shall be done. And by Hercules, I wish I could invent something very festive, which might excite immoderate laughter. After this, being myself distended with much wine, I immediately rise, through the admonition of my servants, who informed me that it was now night, and having hastily bid farewell to Birina, I proceed homeward with staggering steps. And while we go through the first broad street, the torch to which we trusted was extinguished by a sudden blast of wind, so that, being scarcely liberated from the darkness of unexpected night, it was with difficulty and weariness that we could reach our home, our toes frequently striking against the stones. But when we now drew nearer to our street, behold, three men of strong and vast bodies rushed with greatest violence against our gate, and were not in the smallest degree terrified by our presence, but frequently attacked it with a greater accumulation of force, so that to all of us, and especially to me, they appeared to be robbers, and of the most cruel description. Immediately, therefore, I seize a sword, liberated from my bosom, and which I carried with me, concealed in my garments, for these purposes. Without delay I threw myself into the midst of the robbers, and plunged my sword profoundly into the body of each that presented himself in the contest, till at length they expired before my feet, pierced with many and deep wounds. And when I had thus fought, Fotis being awakened by the tumult, and having opened the gate, I entered into the house, breathing with difficulty, and wet with perspiration. Immediately also I delivered myself to bed and sleep, being as much fatigued with the slaughter of the stubborn robbers as if I had killed the tricorporal Gerion. End of chapter 2, part 2 Chapter 3, part 1 of The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass, by Lucius Apuleius, translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter 3, Part 1 
Now Aurora rode through the heavens, lashing with rosy hand her horses decked with ruddy trappings, and night restored me, snatched from secure quiet, to the day. But my mind was in a fluctuating state from the recollection of the deed which I had perpetrated in the evening. At length, however, collecting my feet under me, joining together my hands upon my knees, with my fingers twined in each other, and thus sitting on my bed, I wept abundantly now representing to myself in my imagination the forum the judicial processes the condemnation and lastly the executioner shall i find said i to myself any judge so mild and so benevolent as to be able to pronounce me innocent who am imbrued with the blood of a triple homicide and defiled with the gore of so many citizens this is the journey which the Chaldean Diophanes pertinaciously proclaimed would be to me glorious. Frequently revolving these things with myself, I deplored my fortune. In the meantime there was a violent knocking at our doors and a great tumult before our gate, and without delay a great eruption being made into the house every part of it was filled with magistrates and their attendants and a miscellaneous crowd. Immediately also two of the lictors, laying hold of me, by order of the magistrates, led me along without any resistance on my part. And when we came into the next street, immediately all the city pouring forth in a great crowd followed us in a wonderfully compact body. And though I walked sorrowfully with my head inclined to the ground, or rather to the realms beneath, yet by looking obliquely I saw a thing altogether admirable. For among so many thousands of people that surrounded me, there was not any one who was not ready to burst with laughter. At length, having passed through all the streets, and after the manner of those who, with lustral sacrifices, expiate by circumforaneous victims the anger of the gods, being led by an angular circumduction into the forum, I was placed by the tribunal. And now the magistrates were seated in the lofty pulpit, now the public crier proclaimed silence, when suddenly all the assembly with one voice requested that a cause of so much consequence might be tried in the theatre, on account of the concourse of the people, which might be attended with danger from its multitude and compression. Immediately the people everywhere running to the theatre filled the seats of it with a wonderful celerity. The entrances also, and the whole of the building, were crowded. A great part of the populace stood clinging to the pillars, some were pendant from the statues, others were half conspicuous from the windows and the beams of the building, and all, through an ardent desire of seeing, paid no attention to their own safety. Then the public ministers led me through the middle of the proscenium, like some victim, and placed me in the midst of the orchestra. A certain accuser, therefore, who was of an advanced age, being again called by the loud bellowing of the crier, rose up, and having poured water into a certain vessel, which was slenderly perforated like a strainer, and through which water flowed by drops, for the purpose of limiting the time of speaking, thus addressed the people. A transaction is now brought before you, O oh, most holy citizens, which is by no means of a trifling nature, but especially regards the peace of the whole city, and which, by a weighty example, will be profitable to others. Hence it will be most proper that all and each of you should endeavour for the public dignity, that this nefarious homicide may not go unpunished, for having cruelly slain so many of the citizens." nor must you think that I have been induced by any private grudge to accuse him more bitterly from a peculiar hatred. For I am the prefect of the night guard, nor do I believe that my sedulous vigilance hitherto can be blamed by any one. I will therefore faithfully narrate the transaction itself, and the deeds that were perpetrated this night." When, about the third watch, I had gone round the whole city, observing everything with exact diligence from door to door, I beheld this most cruel young man everywhere committing homicide with his drawn sword, and three persons, having been now ferociously slain by him, were laid before his feet, still breathing, and their bodies leaping in an abundance of gore. 
and he indeed being justly alarmed by the consciousness of so dire a deed, immediately fled, and having escaped into a certain house through the protection of darkness, was there concealed during the whole of the night. By the providence of the gods, however, which never suffers the guilty to go unpunished, I took care, before he had clandestinely escaped, to bring him, as soon as it was morning, before your venerable tribunal. You have therefore before you an accused person, one who is defiled with so many murders, one who is evidently guilty, and one who is an arraigned stranger. Courageously, therefore, pass sentence on a foreigner, for that crime, for the commission of which you would severely punish one of your own citizens. My most bitter accuser, having thus spoken, stopped his loud voice. But immediately after, the crier ordered me to begin to speak, if I wished to make any reply to what had been said. I, however, at that time could do no more than weep, not by Hercules so much looking to my terrible accusation as to my miserable conscience. Nevertheless, assuming a divinely inspired boldness, I answered as follows. I am not ignorant how difficult it is for one who is accused of the murder of three citizens to persuade so great a multitude that he is innocent, though he should speak the truth and voluntarily confess the fact. But if your humanity will allow me a public audience for a short time, I can easily show you that I have sustained the danger of my life, not for having deserved to lose it, but through the fortuitous event of a reasonable indignation which has unjustly caused me to be accused of so great a crime. For, as I was returning from supper, somewhat later than usual, and besides this being intoxicated, which I will not deny was truly my crime, I beheld before the gates of my lodging, but I dwell with your worthy fellow-citizen Milo, certain most cruel robbers attempting to gain an entrance and to pluck the doors of the house from the hinges, and having with great violence torn off all the bars by which the doors were fastened, they deliberated with themselves concerning the destruction of the inhabitants. Lastly, one of them, who was more prompt with his hands and larger in his body, incited the others by these words, Hark ye, my lads, let us attack those within the house while they are asleep, with manly minds and active strength. Let all doubt and all sluggishness be banished from our breast. Let slaughter stalk with a drawn sword through the whole house. Let him who lies asleep be slain, and him who endeavours to resist be knocked down. Thus we shall depart from hence safe, if we leave no one in safety in the house. I confess, O citizens, I thought it was the duty of a good member of the community, as through fearing exceedingly both for myself and my hosts, I was armed with the sword which I carried with me on account of dangers of this kind, that I should endeavour to put to flight and terrify these most iniquitous robbers. But these perfectly barbarous and atrocious men by no means betook themselves to flight, and though they saw that I was armed, yet they audaciously resisted. The battle is arrayed, and at length the leader and standard-bearer of the rest, having attacked me with great force, immediately endeavoured to beat me down with a stone, having seized me by the hair with both his hands, and caused me to recline backward. But while he strove to obtain the stone, I, with a sure hand, happily laid him prostrate. And soon after I slew another, who was adhering to and biting my feet, with a blow levelled at the middle of his shoulder-blade. And the third I pierced in the breast, as he was incautiously running against me. Thus peace being vindicated, and the house of my host, and the common safety being protected, I believed that I should not only be without punishment, but also that I should be thought worthy of the public praise, for I have never been accused even of the smallest crime, but have always been respected by my acquaintance, and have always preferred innocence to every earthly good. Nor am I able to discover why I now undergo this accusation of a just revenge, which I was incited to take against the worst of robbers, since no one can prove either that prior to this affair there was any private enmity between us, or that those robbers were ever at all known by me. 
or certainly some spoil should be shown, through the desire of obtaining which, it may be believed, that I perpetrated such an unlawful deed. Having thus said, tears again bursting forth, and with my hands suppliantly extended, I sorrowfully deprecated now these, and then those, by the public pity, and by the love of those dear pledges, their children. And when I thought that all of them were now moved by humanity, and were sufficiently affected by the commiseration of my tears, calling to witness the eye of justice and the sun, and commending to the providence of the gods my present casualty, when I had raised my eyes a little higher, I beheld all the people ready to burst into loud laughter, and also my good host and father, Milo, dissolving as well as the rest into excessive laughter. But I then said silently to myself, Alas, where is faith, where is conscience? I indeed am a homicide, and am capitally convicted, for the safety of my host. He, however, not content that he has not afforded me the solace of defence, laughs at my destruction. In the meantime a certain woman, arrayed in black, ran through the middle of the theatre, weeping and lamenting, and carrying in her bosom an infant and behind her was another old woman, in ragged and filthy garments, who also testified her grief by similar lamentations. Both of them also shook with their hands branches of olive, which were scattered about the bier on which the dead bodies were laid, and beating their breasts and mournfully weeping, exclaimed, By the public compassion, by the common law of humanity, take pity on these young men who are unworthily slain, and give to our widowhood and solitude the solace of revenge. At least afford assistance to the miserable fortune of this infant, who is left destitute in the first years of his life, and make a propitiatory sacrifice to your laws and public discipline, with the blood of this robber. Afterwards the magistrate, who was the elder, arose and thus addressed the people. Concerning the crime, indeed, which must be severely punished, he who committed it cannot deny it. One only care, however, remains for us, and which is also of a secondary nature, that we should search after the other persons who were the associates of the accused in the perpetration of so great a crime, for it is not probable that one man alone could have deprived of life three such robust young men. The truth, therefore, must be extorted by torments. For the servant who attended the accused has privately fled, and the thing is brought to this issue, that he may by torture be compelled to declare who were the partakers of his wickedness, in order that the dread of so dire a faction may be entirely removed. And without any delay, fire and the wheel, after the manner of the Greeks, and afterwards every kind of whips, were introduced. My sorrow was very much increased, or rather was doubled, because I was not permitted to die entire. But that old woman, who had disturbed everything by her weeping, said, O oh, best of citizens, before you fix to the cross this destroyer of my unhappy sons, suffer the dead bodies of the slain to be uncovered, that being more and more incited to a just indignation by an inspection of the form, and at the same time of the age of the deceased, you may treat him with a severity proportioned to the magnitude of the crime. These words were applauded, and immediately the judge ordered me to uncover with my hand the dead bodies which were placed on the bed. The lictors, by the command of the magistrates, instantly compelled me, in consequence of my struggling, and for a long time resisting, the renovation of the preceding crime by a new exhibition. Lastly, therefore, taking hold of my right hand, they extended it to my destruction on the dead bodies. At length, vanquished by necessity, I yield, and though unwilling, snatching off the pole, I disclosed the bodies. But, good gods, what an appearance did the thing assume! What a prodigy! What a sudden change of fortune! For, as I was now in the possession of Proserpine, and was considered as one of the family of Pluto, I suddenly became stupefied with wonder on finding things assume such a contrary aspect. Nor could I, in appropriate words, explain the form of this new spectacle. 
for those bodies of the men that were slain were three inflated bladders, mangled in different parts, and as far as I could remember of my Vespertine battle, they were cut in those places in which I appeared to myself to have wounded the robbers. Then the laughter, which, through the cunning of certain persons, had been for a short time repressed, burst forth unrestrained among the people. Some exceedingly rejoiced, others, by the compression of their hands, mitigated the pain of their belly, and all of them leave the theatre full of joy, and at the same time looking back on me. But I, from the time that I laid hold of the pole, stood fixed and cold like a stone, no otherwise than one of the other statues or columns of the theatre. Nor did I emerge from the infernal realms till my host Milo came, and took me by the hand, and with gentle force drew me with him, reluctant as I was, and frequently sobbing, and again weeping. He likewise brought me to his house through certain winding ways, having for this purpose selected the most solitary streets, and by various conversation consoled me, who was still sad, and even then trembling. Nor could he by any means mitigate my indignation of the injury I had sustained, and which stuck more profoundly in my mind. But lo, the magistrates themselves, with their insignia, immediately entering into our house, strove to appease by addressing me as follows. We are not ignorant, O Lucius, of your dignity or your lineage, for the nobility of your illustrious family is extended through the whole of this province. Nor have you, for the sake of contumely, suffered that for which you so excessively grieve. Dismiss, therefore, all the present sorrow from your breast, and expel this anguish from your mind. For this jest, which we solemnly celebrate in public every year, in honour of the most pleasant god of laughter, always flourishes with some new invention. The god also everywhere propitiously and lovingly attends the author of the invention, nor will he ever suffer you to be oppressed with mental grief, but will perpetually exhilarate your countenance with a serene gracefulness. All this city likewise will reward you with the greatest honour for the favour which you have conferred on them, for it will denominate you its patron by public decree, and will ordain that a brazen statue of you shall be erected. To these words I answered, to you indeed, O most splendid and principal city of Thessaly, I shall be mindful that my gratitude may be equivalent to such honours. But let me persuade you to keep statues and images for those who are more worthy and more excellent than I am. Having spoken thus modestly, and for a little while smiling with a cheerful countenance, and pretending as much as possible to be joyful, I courteously bade the departing magistrates farewell and behold a certain servant running into the house said to me your mother birina requests you to take notice that the hour of the banquet is approaching at which you promised yesterday to be present but i trembling at these words and abhorring her house even at a distance said tell your mistress that i would most willingly comply with her request if i could do so without violating my promise for my host, Milo, conjuring me by the most powerful divinity who presides over this day, compelled me to promise that I would sup with him this evening, nor does he leave me, nor will he suffer me to depart from him. On this account I must defer supping with her to another time. While I was yet thus speaking to the servant, Milo, taking me firmly by the hand, brought me to the next bath, having previously ordered that the bathing utensils should be sent to us when we were there. But I, avoiding the eyes of all men, and declining the laughter of those I met, and of which I had been the artificer, walked covertly by his side. Nor did I remember how I washed or wiped myself, or how I again returned home. Such was the shame that I felt, and so much was I astounded on seeing myself pointed out by the eyes, the nods, and the fingers of all men. Lastly, having hastily taken a small supper with Milo, and excusing myself on account of a great pain in my head, occasioned by my continual weeping, and this excuse being readily granted, I betook myself to rest. End of chapter 3, part 1
Chapter Three, Part Two of the Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ted Garvin. The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass, by Pulius, translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter Three, Part Two. Lying therefore sorrowful in my bed, I revolved in my mind all that had happened to me, till at length my Fotis, having put her mistress to bed, came to me very much unlike herself, for she did not bring with her a joyful face, nor mirthful speech, but came with a sorrowful aspect and wrinkled forehead. Lastly, having spoke doubtfully and timidly, she said, I, of my own accord, confess that I have been the cause to you of this molestation and immediately she drew a whip from her bosom and extending it to me said revenge yourself i beseech you on a perfidious woman or rather inflict on me some greater punishment nevertheless do not i entreat you believe that i voluntarily occasioned you this anguish and sorrow may the gods be more favourable to me than that you should suffer on my account the smallest anxiety and if anything adverse is likely to befall you may the whole of it be immediately washed away with my blood and if anything adverse is likely to befall you, may the whole of it be immediately washed away with my blood. But that, which I was ordered to do, for the sake of another thing, has, through my evil destiny, been converted to your injury. Then I, being urged by my usual curiosity, and longing to have the latent cause of this deed unfolded, thus answered, That whip, the most iniquitous and audacious of all things, which you have destined to scourge yourself with, shall be destroyed being broken into pieces by me, before it shall touch your most soft and milk-white skin. But tell me faithfully, I beseech you, what deed of yours the malignity of fortune converted to my destruction. For I swear by your head, which is most dear to me, that I would not believe any one who should assert that you have thought of anything baneful to me, nor would I give credit to it, though you yourself should affirm it. Moreover, uncertain, or even adverse events, cannot cause innoxious thoughts to become the subject of blame. When I had finished these words, I thirstily imbibed love from the eyes of my photos, which were moist and tremulous, faint with precipitate lust, and half open, through ardent and absorbing kisses. So she, being refreshed with joy, said, Suffer me, I beseech you, in the first place, carefully to shut the door of the bedchamber, lest I should commit a great crime, through the profane petulance of the words that may fall from me. And having thus said, she barred and firmly bolted the door, and thus, returning to me, and embracing my neck with both her hands, she said to me, in a low and very diminished tone of voice, I fear, and profoundly tremble, to disclose the hidden affairs of this house, and to reveal the arcane secrets of my mistress. But I anticipate better things of you and your erudition, who, independently of the superior dignity of your birth, and the sublimity of your genius, are initiated in many sacred mysteries, and consequently know the sacred faith of silence. Whatever, therefore, I shall commit to the penetralia of this religious breast of yours, I beseech you to preserve perpetually shut within its recesses, and to remunerate the simplicity of my narration by the tenacity of your taciturnity, for the power of love, by which I am bound to you, compels me to indicate those things to you, which, of all mortals, are known to me alone." now you shall know all the state of our house now you shall know the wonderful secrets of my mistress to which the souls of the dead are obedient and the elements are subservient and by which the stars are disturbed and the divinities are compelled nor does she ever employ the force of this art in a greater degree than when she has lustfully beheld a young man of a graceful form which is the thing that happens to her frequently now also she vehemently loves a certain boeotian youth who is beautiful in the extreme and in order to allure him ardently employs all the power and machinations of her art i heard her yesterday in the evening i heard her i say with these my own ears threaten the sun with nebulous obscurity and perpetual darkness if he did not more rapidly set and sooner give place to the night so as to afford her an opportunity of exercising the enchantments of magic yesterday she accidentally beheld this youth sitting in a barber's shop as she was returning from the bath and ordered me secretly to take away his hairs, which then lay on the ground, and had been cut off by the scissors. These the barber found me diligently and furtively collecting, and because we were in other respects publicly infamous, 
through exercising the malefic discipline he took hold of and severely reproved me will you not cease o most infamous woman he said to seal the hairs of beautiful young men unless however you desist from this wickedness i will take you without delay before the magistrates and following his words by deeds he explored with his hands and drew out enraged from between my breasts the hair which was there concealed being grievously affected by this deed and considering with myself the manners of my mistress who is accustomed to be excessively enraged and to beat me most cruelly when she is disappointed in a thing of this kind i deliberated about making my escape but on your account i immediately rejected that design when however i departed from thence sorrowful lest i should return with hands perfectly empty i beheld a certain person shearing with a pair of scissors the skins of goats and when i saw that these were properly bound together were inflated and stood of their own accord i took a sufficient quantity of the hairs of them which were scattered on the ground and were yellow and therefore similar to those of the boeotian youth and these i delivered to my mistress dissembling the truth so at the beginning of the night before you departed from supper pamphile my mistress being now beside herself ascended into a gallery which was covered with narrow pieces of wood instead of tiles this gallery which she privately frequents is situated in the higher part of the house has an aperture exposed to the winds and a prospect of the eastern and all the other climates of the world especially adapted to these arts and in the first place she adorned her deadly workshop with its usual apparatus viz with every kind of aromatics with plates of metal engraved with unknown characters with nails taken from shipwrecked vessels and with the members of many lamented bodies exposed to the open air and also of those that had been buried here were noses and fingers there the nails by which culprits had been fixed to the cross and to which portions of flesh adhered and in another place the blood of those was preserved that had been slain and mangled skulls snatched from the teeth of wild beasts then having charmed the yet breathing fibres she made a libation with different liquors at one time with fontal water at another with the milk of cows and at another with mountain honey she likewise made a libation with mead after this she committed to the live coals to be burnt with many aromatics those plaited goat hairs and then with the unconquerable power of the magic discipline and the occult force of the gods who were compelled by incantations those bodies the hairs of which smoked with a crashing noise were immediately changed into a human form and became sentient and heard and walked where also the scent of their spoils attracted them with thither they came and desiring to enter the house in the place of the young boeotian they knock at the gate when lo you being intoxicated and deceived by the darkness of the night and bravely armed with a drawn sword like insane ajax yet not lacerating whole herds as he did who was hostile to live cattle but far more bold you deprived of life three inflated goat skins in order that your adversaries being laid prostrate without any stain of blood i might now embrace you not as a homicide but as a slayer of bladders and thus through the facetious narration of photis merrily jesting with each other i said now therefore i may enumerate this as the first glory which my fortitude has obtained and which is as it were one of the twelve labors of hercules so that my prowess in having slain three bladders may be considered as co-equal to the destruction of the tricorporal geryon or the three-headed cerebus in order however that i may sincerely and willingly pardon you for the fault through which you involve me in such great anguish of mine accomplish what i most ardently desire and show me your mistress when she attempts anything pertaining to this divine magic discipline so that when she invokes the gods i may at least see her changed into another form for i am most vehemently desirous of obtaining a nearer and more accurate knowledge of magic though you yourself do not appear to me to be ignorant of and unskilled in things of this kind for i know and perfectly experience in myself that you are not destitute of this knowledge since you detain me voluntarily bound and subjected to you like a slave as i have always despised matronal embraces by those bright eyes of yours and by your ruddy lips splendid hair open mouth kisses and fragrant breasts lastly i neither am anxious to return home nor am i making any preparations for that purpose nor is there anything which i prefer to this night to this she replied how much do i wish o lucius to effect that which you desire but my mistress on account of the envy and malevolence of others 
has always been accustomed to perform such arcana alone, remote from the sight of every one. I prefer, however, the gratification of your request to my own safety, and I will diligently accomplish what you wish, exploring for this purpose a fit opportunity. Do you only, as I at first admonished you, faithfully preserve in silence a thing of such great consequence? And now, sleep being infused into our eyes, which were enfeebled with wakefulness, detained us in bed till it was broad day. Having passed a few nights voluptuously after this manner, Photis, on a certain day, ran to me, agitated and trembling exceedingly, and informed me that her mistress, because she had not hitherto made any proficiency in her amours, by other arts, would, on the following night, assume wings and be changed into a bird, and would, thus transformed, fly to the object of her love. I cautiously, therefore, prepared myself for the survey of a thing of such importance. And now, towards the beginning of the night, Photis brought me, with doubtful and silent steps, to that lofty chamber, and ordered me to look through a certain chink of the door, that I might see what was transacted. And, in the first place, indeed, Pamphile divested herself of all her garments, and having opened a certain small chest, took from thence many boxes, from one of which the covering being removed, she rubbed herself, for a long time, with an ointment contained in it, from the extremities of her feet to the crown of her head. When, also, with the lamp in her hand, she had said much in a low voice, she shook her limbs with a tremulous agitation, and from these, lightly fluctuating, soft feathers extend themselves, and strong wings burst forth, the nose is hardened and incurvated, the nails are compressed and made crooked, and Pafil becomes an owl. Being thus changed, and emitting a querulous sound, she made a trial of herself, and gradually leapt from the earth, and soon after, being raised on high, she flew out of doors, with all the force of her wings. Thus she, indeed, was voluntarily changed by her own magic arts. But I, who was not enchanted by any magic words, but only astounded at what was then transacted, seemed to be anything else rather than Lucius. Thus, being exterminated from intellect, and astonished, even to insanity, I was dreaming, though awake, so that, for a long time rubbing my eyes, I endeavored to ascertain whether I was in a vigilant state. At length, therefore, returning to an animate aversion of the present transactions, I took hold of the right hand of Photis, and applying it to my eyes, I said, Suffer me, I beseech you, to reap the great and singular fruit of your love, while the occasion offers, and give me a little ointment from the same box. This, my sweetest, I entreat you to grant, by those eyes of mine, which are devoted to you, and thus, by conferring on me a benefit which can never be remunerated, bind me to you a perpetual slave and now cause it to come to pass that I may stand near you, my Venus, a winged Cupid. Would you, said she, my paramour, act fraudulently by me, and compel me voluntarily to throw an axe at my legs? Shall I thus preserve my Lucius for the Thessalian virgins? Where shall I seek for him when he is changed into a bird? When shall I see him? May the celestial powers, I said, avert from me that crime, that I, who born on eagle's wings, should be able to fly through all heaven, and be the sure messenger of Jupiter, or the joyful bearer of thunder, should not, after I had obtained this dignity of wings, frequently fly to my nest. I swear to you, by that sweet little knot of your hair, with which you have bound my spirit, that I prefer no other female to my photos. This also occurs to my thoughts, that when once, being rubbed with that ointment, I am changed into a bird of that kind, i.e. into an owl, I ought to avoid all houses, for what a beautiful and agreeable lover will an owl be to matrons. Do we not also see that these nocturnal birds, when they have entered into any house, are solicitously caught and nailed to the doors, that, by their torments, they may expiate the calamity which they portend to the family by their inauspicious flight? But tell me, what I had almost forgot to inquire, what I must say or do, in order that I may return to this my form of Lucius, having divested myself of those wings. Be not solicitous, she said, about this, for my mistress has shown to me everything which can again change such forms into the human shape. You must not, however, think that she did this through any benevolence towards me, but in order that I might be able to afford her a salutary remedy when she returns home. Lastly, consider with what small and frivolous herbs a thing of such magnitude is affected, for a little of the herb dill, put into fountain water, with the leaves of the laurel, is given as a lotion, and also to drink. Having frequently asserted this, she went into the bedchamber with great trepidation, and took out a box from the chest, 
which I, having first embraced and kissed, and prayed that it would favour me with prosperous flights, hastily divested myself of all my garments, and having ardently put my hand into it, and taken from thence a sufficient quantity of the ointment, I rubbed with it the members of my body. And now, balancing my arms with alternate efforts, I longed to be changed into a similar bird. No plumes, however, nor any wings germinated, but my hairs became evidently thickened into bristles, my tender skin was hardened into a hide, and the extremity of my hands, all my fingers, having lost their number, coalesced into several hoofs, and a long tail proceeded from the extremity of my spine. My face was now enormous, my mouth was long, and my lips immoderate and pendant. Thus, also, my ears increased excessively, and were clothed with rough hairs. And while, destitute of all hope, I consider the whole of my body, I see that I am not a bird, but an ass, and complaining of the deed of Photis, but being deprived both of the human gesture and voice, I silently expostulated with her, which was all I could do, with my underlip hanging down, and beheld her sternly and obliquely, yet with humid eyes. But she, as soon as she beheld me thus changed, struck her forehead with her indignant hands, and exclaimed, Wretch that I am, I am undone. Trepidation, and at the same time festination, have beguiled me, and the similarity of the boxes has deceived me. It is well, however, that a remedy for this transformation may be easily obtained, for, by only chewing roses, you will put off the form of an ass, and will immediately become again my Lucius. And I wish I had prepared for this evening, according to my custom, some garlands of roses, for then you would not have suffered the delay even of one night. But as soon as it is morning, a remedy shall hastily be procured for you. After this manner she lamented. But I, though I was a complete ass, and instead of Lucius, a laboring beast, yet retained human sense. Lastly, I deliberated much, and for a long time with myself, whether I ought not to slay that most iniquitous and wicked woman, by frequently kicking and biting her. But better thoughts recalled me from the rash design, lest by punishing Photus with death, I should again extinguish for myself salutary succor. Shaking, therefore, my dejected head, dissembling my temporary injury, and submitting to my most severe misfortune, I betake myself to that most excellent horse in the stable, on which I rode, where also I found another ass dwelling, who belonged to my late host Milo. And I thought that this my horse, if there is in dumb animals any secret and natural fidelity, would, being impelled by a certain knowledge and pity, afford me a lodging and the rights of hospitality but by jupiter hospitalis and the secret divinity of faith that excellent horse of mine and the ass moved their heads towards each other and immediately consented to my destruction for when they beheld me approaching to the manger with my ears fallen they furiously attacked me with hostile heels fearing for their food and i am driven far away from that barley which in the evening i had placed with my own hands before that most grateful servant being thus treated and expelled to a solitary place, I went to a corner of the stable. While I reflect with myself on the insolence of my companions, and meditate vengeance on my perfidious horse, when, on the following day, I should become Lucius again by the assistance of roses, I beheld a resemblance to the goddess of Pona, placed in an excavation or niche, in the middle of a pillar, which, also having a middle situation, supported the beams of the stable. This image was carefully adorned with garlands of roses, which had been recently gathered. At length, therefore, recognizing my salutary aid, I boldly rise, precipitately borne along with hope, making all the exertion I could, with my four feet extended and stretching out my neck, and very much advancing my lips, I most strenuously endeavored to snatch the garlands. While, however, I was endeavoring to accomplish this, my boy, to whose care my horse had always been committed, suddenly beholding me indignantly arose and said how long shall we endure this vile ass who a little before was hostile to the food of the laboring beast and now attacks even the statues of the gods but i will now cause this sacrilegious beast to be both weak and lame and immediately searching for something with which he might strike me he found a bundle of wood accidentally lying there and selecting from thence a leafy staff larger than all the rest he did not cease to beat me unfortunate as i was till being frightened by a loud knocking at the doors, and a great tumult, and by the trembling voices of the neighbors, exclaiming there were thieves, he betook himself to flight. And without delay, a band of robbers, having entered the house by violence, seized on everything in it, and an armed multitude surrounded all the parts of the house. 
The robbers also, running everywhere, opposed themselves to those who flew to give assistance. All of them being furnished with swords and torches, illuminate the night, and the coruscations of swords resembled the light emitted by the rising sun. Then attacking a certain treasury, firmly closed with very strong bars, which was placed in the middle of the house, and was filled with the wealth of Milo, they broke it open with powerful axes. And from this, when completely opened, they took away all the riches, and divided them among themselves, having hastily tied the bundles into which the portions of the booty were made. The multitude of the bundles, however, surpassed the number of those that were to carry them. Then being brought to extreme poverty, through too great an abundance of wealth, they led forth us two asses, and my horse, from the stable, loaded us with the heaviest burdens they could, and expelled us with the blows of staves from the house which was now empty. Leaving also one of their companions behind as a spy, who might inform them what inquiry was made about the robbery, they led us rapidly, and at the same time frequently beating us, through the trackless paths of the mountains. And now I, through the weight of things of such magnitude, and through the difficulty of ascending to the summit of the mountain, and the length of the way, was not in any respect different from a dead body. It occurred to me, however, late indeed, but seriously, that I should fly to civil aid, and liberate myself from so many miseries, by invoking the venerable name of the emperor. At length, it being now broad daylight, as we passed through a certain populous village, which was much frequent on account of fairs, I tried to invoke the august name of Caesar, in the midst of a crowd of Greeks, but I could only utter the letter O, clearly and strongly, and was not able to enunciate the name of Caesar. The robbers also, despising my dissonant clamor, and striking in all parts my miserable hide, left it at length, through laceration, not even fit for the purpose of a sieve. But at length Jupiter, whose providence extends to all things, procured for me unexpected safety. For while I passed by many small farms and large houses, I beheld a certain very pleasant little garden, in which, besides other delectable plants, there were virgin roses, wet with morning dew. Ardently desiring these, and brisk and joyful with the hope of safety, I came nearer to them. And while, with undulating lips, I longed to eat them, a far more salutary thought occurred to me, viz., that if I should again become Lucius, being divested of the asinine form, I should meet with certain destruction by the hands of the robbers, who would either suspect me of being skilled in the magic art, or would fear that I should betray them by my accusation. At that time, therefore, I necessarily abstained from roses, and enduring my present fortune, bit my bridle under the form of an ass. End of chapter 3, part 2「four part one of the Metamorphosis or Golden Ass This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ted Garvin. The Metamorphosis or Golden Ass by Puleius, translated by Thomas Taylor, chapter four, part one. Nearly about midday, when the power of the sun causes everything to be hot, we turned into a certain village, to some old men who were known by, and familiar with, the robbers. For their first salutation, their long conference, and their mutual kisses, enabled me to perceive this, though I was an ass, for they presented them with gifts from the things which were on my back, and by whispers seemed to indicate that these gifts were obtained by plunder. And now, having lightened us of all our burden, they sent us into the nearest meadow, that we might there freely feed. Society and feeding, however, could not detain me with the ass, or with my horse, because I was as yet unaccustomed to eat hay. But as I was now perishing with hunger, I boldly entered into a little garden which I saw behind the stable, and filled my belly abundantly with proverbs, though they were raw. Invoking likewise all the gods, I inspected every place, in order to see if by chance I could find in the neighboring gardens some rose trees resplendent with a fiery redness. For the solitude of my situation now afforded me good hope, that if, being removed from the public road, and concealed by groves of trees, I should, by taking the remedy, be raised on my feet, I should then, unseen by any one, be again transformed into the human shape, from the prone step of a four-footed beast. Whilst, therefore, I was fluctuating in that sea of thought, I beheld, a little further, a valley shaded by a leafy grove, among the various plants and most pleasant verdure of which, 
bright colour of red roses shone forth to the view and now in my breast which was not entirely brutal i thought that the grove was sacred to venus and the graces in whose shady recesses the royal splendour of that genial flower the rose was reticent then having invoked joyful and prosperous event i ran rapidly so that by hercules i myself thought that i was not an ass but that through excessive velocity i was changed into a swift horse that agility however an excellent endeavour of mine could not prevent the malignity of my fate for when i was now nearer to this place i no longer saw those fresh and delectable roses wet with divine dew and nectar which felicitous brambles and blessed thorns produce nor did i behold any valley but only the margin of a river's bank environed with thick-set trees these trees had oblong leaves like the laurel and produced extended and reddish cups after the manner of a flower that has no scent which nevertheless are fragrant are called by the unlearned vulgar by a name not at all rustic laurel roses and when eaten are deadly to all cattle being entangled with such adverse fates and rejecting even safety itself i spontaneously longed to eat of those venom roses but while i slowly approached in order to pluck them a certain young man who as it appeared to me was a gardener perceiving the great loss he had sustained by my having destroyed all his herbs furiously ran to me with a great staff in his hand and taking hold of me inflicted on me so many blows that i should have been in danger of losing my life unless i had at length prudently given assistance to myself for with my posterior parts elevated i frequently kicked him with my hind feet and having severely punished him and laid him prostrate at the foot of the next mountain i liberated myself by flight immediately however a certain woman viz the wife of the gardener as soon as she beheld him from an eminence prostrate and half dead flew to him with lamentation and howling in order that by her own commiseration she might be the occasion of my present destruction for all the rustics being excited by her lamentations immediately called out their dogs and everywhere incited them that being driven by fury they might rush upon and tear me in pieces i therefore being without doubt at that time near to death when i saw that the dogs who were congregated and exasperated against me were large and numerous and fit to fight with bears and lions availing myself of the counsel suggested by the existing circumstance put an end to my flight and again with rapid steps returned to the stable from which i came but the rustics having seized me the dogs being with difficulty restrained and bound me with a very strong thong of leather to the staple of a post would without doubt have scourged me to death if my belly compressed by the pain of the blows filled with those raw herbs and disordered with a slippery flux had not by ejecting dung as though through a tube driven away some besprinkling them and others by the fetid odour which was emitted from my now broken shoulders and without delay it being now nearly noon the robbers again led us from the stable heavily laden and especially me whose burden was far greater than that of the rest now also when a good part of the journey was finished i being exhausted with the length of the way oppressed with the weight of the burden and fatigued with the blows of the staffs and likewise now being lame and staggering from the worn-out condition of my hoofs as i was walking near a certain rivulet of gently flowing and winding water i thought having happily found an excellent opportunity i would cunningly lie down with my legs bent under me fully determined not to rise from thence whatever blows might be inflicted on me and being also prepared not only to be beaten but to die pierced with the sword for i thought that being now perfectly exhausted and debile i should be dismissed on account of bodily infirmity or that the robbers would certainly divide the burden which i carried on my back between the two other beasts partly through impatience of delay and partly through a desire of accomplishing their destined flight and that instead of a deeper revenge they would leave me a prey to wolves and vultures my evil destiny however prevented the execution of so excellent a design for the other ass having divined and preconceived my intention suddenly feigning lassitude fell down with all that he carried and lying as if he was dead did not endeavour to rise either by the blows of the staves or by being pricked and raised in all parts by the tail the ears and the legs till the robbers being wearied with posthumous hope and having conferred with each other in order that their flight might not be retarded by attending so long on a dead or rather stony ass they divided his burthen between me and the horse cut off his legs with a drawn sword 
and drawing him, still breathing, a little out of the public road, threw him down a lofty precipice into a neighboring valley. Then I, considering with myself the destiny of my unhappy companion, determined, laying aside guile and fraud, to prove myself to my masters to be a worthy ass. For I heard them saying to each other that we should soon stop, and that then the whole of our journey would be finished, in consequence of having arrived at the place of their abode. At length, having passed over a little hill of easy ascent, we arrived at the destined place, where all the bundles being untied, and brought into their habitation, as I was now liberated from my burden, I refreshed myself by rolling in the dust, instead of making use of a bath. Both the thing, however, and the occasion itself demand, that I should here give a description of the places and the cavern in which the robbers dwelt. For thus I shall at the same time make trial of my own genius, and enable the reader to perceive clearly whether I was also an ass in understanding and sense. There was a dreadful mountain shaded by the trees of a forest, and lofty in the extreme. The oblique windings of this, in the part of which it was surrounded by the most rugged and therefore inaccessible rocks, were environed with valleys full of very deep receptacles of water, and everywhere thick set with thorns, which afforded a native defense. The streams of a fountain falling from the summit of the mountain spread themselves in large bubbles, and rolling through the declivities, poured forth water as bright as silver, and being now divided into many rivulets, and irrigating those valleys with stagnant floods, they enclosed the whole like a calm sea, or a sluggish river. Where the borders of the mountain end, a lofty tower rose over the cavern, fortified by a sheep cot consisting of strong hurdles, well adapted for the habitation of sheep, and having its sides every way extended. Before the door, small branches expanded themselves, so as to serve instead of a wall, and which you might certainly, on my authority, denominate the courtyard of robbers. Nor was it scarcely anything else than a small cottage, covered in a disorderly manner with reeds, in which spies, selected by lot from the band of robbers, as I afterwards found, watched by night. Into this place, where they had with difficulty penetrated, one after another, with their members compressed, on account of the narrowness of the entrance, I and my companion being secured by a strong bridle before the door, they thus spoke in anger to a certain old woman, who was bent with the weight of old age, and to whom alone the safety and protection of so many young men appeared to be committed. Do you, who are the last relics of the grave, the chief disgrace of life, and the only thing loathed by hell, thus idly sitting at home, sport with us, nor afford any solace to these our labors so great and so dangerous, by at least providing for us a supper, though late? You, who are accustomed to do nothing else by day and by night, than greedily ingurgitate wine in your insatiable stomach, the old woman, trembling and fearful, on hearing them thus speak, replied, But, O oh young men, my most puissant and faithful preservers, there is an abundance of pottage for you well boiled, with a pleasant flavor. There is also a great quantity of bread, wine plentiful poured into well-purified bowls, and warm water prepared according to custom for your hasty bath. When she had thus spoken, they immediately undressed themselves, and being naked, refreshed by the heat of a great fire, sprinkled with water, and anointed with oil, they reclined before tables largely furnished with food. They were, however, scarcely seated, when behold a far greater number of other young men entered, whom you would immediately suppose to be similarly thieves, for they also brought with them plunder, viz. gold and silver coin, vases, and silken garments interwoven with golden threads. These being refreshed by similar bathing, seated themselves on the beds of their companions, and some of them, being selected by lot, were ministrant to the rest. They eat and drink in a disorderly manner, and pottage and bread and bowls of wine were heaped in abundance on the tables. They play clamorously, they sing streperously, and they jest contumelously, and in everything else resemble the Theban Lepithae and the semi-brutal centers. Then one among them, who surpassed the rest in strength, said, We indeed bravely broke open the house of Milo, of Hypata, and besides so great an abundance of wealth, which we strenuously procured for ourselves, through our fortitude we departed to our camps with all our band in safety, and have returned home with an increase of eight feet. If this is to be at all considered as contributing to our gain, but you, who have robbed in the Boeotian cities, have brought back a debile number of your troop, having lost your most brave leader Lamachus, 
whose life I should deservedly prefer to all the spoil which you have brought home. His too great fortitude, however, was his destruction. But the memory of so great a man will be celebrated among that of illustrious kings, and the leaders of armies. As to you, who are frugal robbers, you exercise the scrutinizing art in small and servile thefts, timidly creeping through baths, and the little houses of old women. To this one of the latter band replied, Are you alone ignorant that larger houses are much more easily plundered? For though large houses contain a great number of servants, yet each of these is more attentive to his own safety than to the wealth of his master. But men who lead a frugal and private life more sharply defend and guard their fortune, if small, at the hazard of their life, or if ample, preserve it cautiously concealed. And in the last place the thing itself will verify what I have asserted. For we had scarcely arrived at Thebes, the city of seven gates, when while we diligently inquire after the wealth of each of the citizens, which is the primary study of this our art, a certain usurer named Chrysaros, who was master of a great sum of money, was not concealed from us, who through the fear of offices and public employments pretended with great art not to be opulent. Lastly, this man living alone, and remote from others, contended with a small, well-fortified cottage, but beggarly in his apparel, and sordid in his expenditure, set brooding over his bags of gold. We agreed, therefore, first to break into his house, in order that, despising the resistance of only one hand, i.e. the hand of Chrysoros, we might, without any difficulty, quietly obtain all his wealth. Without delay, therefore, as soon as it was night, we waited before his gate, as it did not appear to us to be prudent either to take it off the hinges, or remove it, or break it open lest the noise of the folding door should raise all the neighborhood to our destruction. Then that magnanimous standard-bearer, our Lamachus, through confidence in his well-tried valor, gradually introducing his hand into that part of the gate which was perforated for the purpose of putting in the key, endeavored to draw back the bolt. But Chris Rose, the most iniquitous of all bipeds, having been for some time awake and perceiving what was transacted, gradually crept to the door with a gentle step, and at the same time preserving a profound silence, and suddenly, with the most powerful effort, fastened the hand of our leader, with a great nail, to a plank of the door. Leaving him also thus fixed by a deadly bond, he ascended to the roof of the cottage, and from thence vociferating with a very loud voice, beseeching his neighbors, and calling them by their respective names, and admonishing them to regard their common safety, he exclaimed that his house was unexpectedly on fire. Thus every one, being terrified by the proximity of the impending danger, anxiously ran to procure assistance. Then we, being placed in the ambiguous peril either of falling into the hands of those who were alarmed by the cries of Chrysoros, or of deserting our companion, devised, by his consent, the occasion requiring it, a strenuous remedy. For we cut off that part of the arm of our leader which joins the hand to the shoulder, by a blow inflicted through the middle articulation and having left the arm there, we bound up his wound with many rags, lest the drops of blood should betray our steps, and hastily took with us what remained of Lamachus. And while, ignorant of the men in the place, we are urged by the great tumult, and terrified into flight by the instant danger, he, not being able either to follow us rapidly, or to remain where he was securely, the magnanimous and transcendently brave man, entreating us with many words and many prayers, exhorted us by the right hand of Mars, and by the faith of our oath, to liberate him, who was a good fellow-soldier, both from torment and captivity. For how is it possible that a bold robber can survive his right hand, by which alone he is able to plunder and kill? He added that he should be sufficiently happy to be willingly slain by the hand of one of his associates, and when he could not persuade any one of us to commit a voluntary parricide, he drew his sword with the hand that remained, and having for a long time kissed it, plunged it with a most powerful stroke through the middle of his breast. Then we, venerating the vigor of our magnanimous leader, diligently wrapped his mutilated dead body in a linen garment, and committed it to the sea to be concealed. And now our Lamachus lies buried in all that element, and he indeed tr terminated his life in a manner worthy of his virtues. Moreover, Alchemus could not withdraw himself from the sinister knot of fortune by his sagacious undertakings. For he, having broken open the cottage of an old woman, while she was asleep, when he had ascended into an upper bedchamber, and ought immediately to have slain her by strangling her, 
was willing first to throw to us everything out of a loftier window in order that we might take it away and when he had now strenuously thrown out all her goods and was not willing to spare even the bed of the sleeping old woman having rolled her out of it he prepared in like manner to throw out the counterpane which covered her but the most iniquitous woman falling at his knees deprecated him as follows why o oh my son i beseech you do you give the poor and lacerated furniture of a miserable old woman to my opulent neighbours to whose houses this window extends alchemist being deceived by the crafty cunning of these words and believing that what she said was true fearing lest what he had thrown out before and what he might throw out afterwards should through his mistake not fall into the hands of his associates but into other houses thrust his body out of the window in order that he might sagaciously survey every thing and particularly the contiguous houses of which the old woman had spoken while however he was attempting this strenuously indeed but without sufficient caution that most wicked old woman while yet he was inclining downwards and pendulous and perfectly astounded with the survey threw him out headlong with an impulse which though feeble was nevertheless sudden and unexpected but he falling not only from a great height but also on a prodigiously great stone which happened to lie near the house separated and burst the articulation of his ribs and vomiting rivers of blood escaped from life without being long tormented having first narrated to us what had been transacted him we also buried in a manner similar to the funeral of our former leader and gave him as a good companion to lamachus then suffering the wound of a double loss and rejecting our theban enterprise we went to the next city which is platea there we found a certain man of great fame whose name was Demacaris, about to exhibit the spectacle of gladiators for this man being of most noble birth and excelling in wealth and liberality procured pleasures for the public with a splendor worthy of his fortune where is the man whose genius is so great or whose eloquence is so powerful as to be able to explain in appropriate words the several species of the manifold apparatus here were gladiators famous for the dexterity of their hand there hunters of well-tried celerity and in another place criminals preparing for their banquets with insane tranquillity food to fatten wild beasts there were stages consisting of beams fixed in each other towers formed from the junction of planks after the manner of a circumforaneous house in which were elegant pictures and which were the beautiful receptacles of the hunting which was to be exhibited in the circus and besides this who can enumerate the multitude and the different kinds of wild beasts for with the greatest diligence he had been careful to procure from abroad those noble sepulchres of condemned heads but besides the other apparatus of so beautiful a spectacle he had procured in some way or other with all the wealth of his patrimony a great number of very large bears for besides those which he had captured by hunting and besides those which he had bought for a great price he also solicitously nourished others with sumptuous care which his friends contending with each other in kindness had sent him as gifts this apparatus however of the public pleasure so illustrious and so splendid could not escape the noxious eyes of envy for these bears being unwearied with their long captivity and at the same time macerated with the burning heat of summer and being also morbid from long indolence were seized with a sudden pestilence and reduced to a very inconsiderable number hence you might everywhere see lying in the streets ferine shipwrecks of half animated bodies then the ignoble vulgar whom rude poverty compelled to seek for sordid succor to their emaciated belly and gratuitous food began to run to the meat which was scattered everywhere finding this to be the case i and this fabulous thought of the following subtle stratagem we brought to our lodging a bear which surpassed the rest in fatness of body as if we intended to prepare it for food and having perfectly stripped the skin from the flesh and carefully preserved all his nails the head of the beast being also left entire as far as to the confine of the neck we attenuate the whole hide by diligently scraping it and sprinkling it with ashes reduced to a fine powder expose it to the sun to be dried and while it is purified by the heat of that celestial fire we in the meantime being powerfully fattened with the muscular flesh of the bear made those of the troop that were present take the following oath viz that one of our number who excelled the rest not so much in strength of body as in fortitude and who especially should undertake this voluntarily should assume the form of a bear being covered with that skin 
and that also, being brought into the house of Democares, he should afford to us an easy entrance through the gate, in the opportune silence of the night. This crafty transformation encouraged many of our most valiant associates to engage in the undertaking, and Thrasyleon, being elected by the suffrages of the band in preference to the rest, adventured the peril of that doubtful machine, the hide of the bear. And now, with a serene countenance, he concealed himself in the hide, which was now pliable and tractable through its softness. Then we sewed up the extreme parts with a fine seam, and covering the opening of it, though very narrow, with a multitude of surrounding hairs. We also put the head of Thrasyleon into the skin, near the throat, in which the neck of the beast had been cut off, and having left small holes about the nostrils and eyes, for the purpose of respiration, we enclosed our most brave associate, who was now entirely made a brute, in a cage which we had bought for a small sum of money, into which he hastily crept with constant vigor of mind. Thus the first principles of the fallacy being begun, we proceeded as follows to the rest. Having obtained by inquiry the name of one Nicanor, who derived his origin from a Thracian race, and between whom and Democares there was the greatest friendship, we counterfeited a letter, in which that excellent friend was made to say that he had dedicated the first fruits of his hunting to Democares as an ornamental gift. And now, the evening being far advanced, trusting to the assistance of darkness, we presented to Democares the cage in which Thrasyleon was enclosed together with that forged epistle. But he, admiring the magnitude of the beast, and being delighted with the opportune liberality of his friend, ordered that ten pieces of golden coin should be immediately told out, from the little coffers which he had with him, to us who had brought him so acceptable a present. Then, as novelty is accustomed to excite the minds of men to sudden spectacles, many ran together to the brute, admiring its size, whose more curious inspection our Thrasyleon restrained in a sufficiently crafty manner, by advancing towards them in a threatening attitude. And the citizens, with one according voice, proclaimed Democares completely happy and blessed, who, after so great a destruction of wild beasts, had been able to resist, in some way or other, the attacks of ill fortune by a new supply. He ordered, therefore, that the beast should be immediately taken to his newly fallowed land, and that he should be brought back from thence, when it was requisite, with the greatest care. To this, however, I subjoined, Be careful, sir, that you do not suffer this animal, who is fatigued with the heat of the sun, and the length of the way, to be mingled with a crowd of many wild beasts, and which I hear are not well, but rather provide some place of your house for him, which is open and exposed to the wind, or rather, which borders on some lake, and is cool. Do you not know that animals of this kind always couch in shady groves and humid caves, and on pleasant hills and near gallant fountains? Demacaris, being alarmed by these admonitions, and considering with himself how many wild beasts he had already lost, assented, without hesitation, to what I said, and readily permitted us to put the cage wherever we pleased. But I said, we also are ready to watch by night, in this very place, before the cage, in order that we may more accurately administer meat to the beast seasonably, and give him his accustomed drink, as he is fatigued from the inconvenience of the heat, and the trouble he has suffered, in being brought hither. To this Demacaris answered, We are not in want of your labor, for now nearly all my servants are, from long custom, skilled in feeding bears. After this, having bade him farewell, we departed, and going out of the gate of the city, we beheld a certain monument, raised at a considerable distance from the public road, in a solitary and secret place. There we opened certain coffins, which, through rottenness and age, were only half covered, and which contained dead bodies, that were now nothing but dust and ashes, as the receptacles of our future spoil. And having, according to the rules of our art, observed the time of the night in which the moon does not shine, and in which sleep powerfully invades and oppresses the hearts of mortals with his first impetus, we stopped, with our band armed with swords, before the doors themselves of Democares, as if we had come, according to agreement, to plunder his house. Nor did Thrasyleon less accurately creep out of his cage, availing himself of that time of the night which is adapted to theft, and immediately slew, with a sword, all the guards that were sleeping near him, and directly after the porter himself. Taking the key also, he opened the folding doors of the gate, and to us, who promptly ran and were received into the interior parts of the house, he pointed out a treasury, where, in the evening, he had cunningly seen many silver vessels deposited. 
this being immediately broken open through the force of our compact cohort i ordered each of my associates to take as much gold and silver as he could quickly conceal it in those, those habitations of the most faithful dead and returning with speedy steps reiterate his burdens for i said that i alone would remain before the doors of the house attentively observing everything that occurred till they returned as this would contribute to our common good for it appeared to me that the form of a bear running through the middle of the house was adapted to terrify any of the servants who might happen to be awake for who however brave and intrepid he might be would not on beholding the stupendous form of so great a beast especially in the night immediately betake himself to flight and keep himself terrified and trembling in his bolted chamber end of chapter four part one Chapter Four, Part Two of the Metamorphosis or Golden Ass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lee J. Seipel. The Metamorphosis or Golden Ass by Apuleius, translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter Four, Part Two. Sinister events, however opposed all these plans, which were prepared with salutary counsel. For while we were anxiously awaiting for the return of our companions, a certain menial boy, being disturbed, so the gods ordained, by the noise, crept gently forward, and seeing the bear running without restraint through the whole house, he observed the greatest possible silence, returned from whence he came, and told everyone, as far as he was able, what he had seen in the house, and without delay, the whole house was filled with a numerous assemblage of servants. The darkness of the night was illuminated with torches, lamps, wax and tallow candles, and other instruments of nocturnal light. Nor did any one among so great a multitude come without arms, but all of them being furnished with clubs, spears, and drawn swords, occupy and defend the entrance of the house. They also excited those hunting dogs that have long ears and rough hairs to repress the beast. Then I, the crowd of servants still increasing, left the house with a retrograde flight, but concealing myself behind the gate, I beheld Thrasilon wonderfully resisting the dogs. For though he was arrived at the last goal of life, yet not being forgetful either of himself or of us, or his pristine fortitude, he struggled against the gaping jaws themselves of Severus. Lastly, reclaiming with spirit the scenic person which he had voluntarily assumed, at one time flying and at another resisting, with the various figures and gestures of his body, he at length escaped from the house. Yet, though he had gained his liberty abroad, he was not able to procure his safety by flight. For all the dogs of the next street who were sufficiently fierce and sufficiently numerous mingled themselves in the troop of those hunting dogs which at the same time came out of the house and pursued him in a similar manner i then beheld a miserable and deadly spectacle our thrasilon surrounded and besieged by troops of dogs cruelly attacking and lacerating him with numerous bites lastly not enduring to see him suffer such great pain, I mingled myself with the surrounding crowd of people, and thus dissuaded the instigators of the dogs, this being the only thing in which I could give secret assistance to my excellent associate. O oh, great and extreme wickedness, I said, we are destroying a large and very precious beast. My artful address, however, to the crowd was of no advantage to the most unhappy youth, for a certain tall, and a robust man, running out of the house, instantly thrust a spear through the middle of the viscera of the bear. And the like was also done by another person. And behold, many having shaken off fear, contended with each other, and drawing near to, and piercing him with their swords. But Thrasilon, the illustrious ornament of our band, having at length that spirit of his, which was worthy of immortality, vanquished, but not his patience, did not violate the faith of his oath by any vociferation or howling. But being now lacerated by the bites of the dogs, 
cut in pieces by the sword, and imitating with all his might the bellowing of a wild beast, enduring also, with a generous vigor, his present calamity, reserved for himself glory, and rendered back his life to fate. Nevertheless, he had struck that crowd with such great terror and fear, that till dawn, and even when it was broad daylight, no one dared to touch the beast, even with his finger, though he was prostrate on the ground. At length, however, a certain butcher, who was a little bolder than the rest, having slowly and timidly cut open the belly of the beast, stripped the magnificent robber of the bear's hide by which he had been concealed. Thus Therasalon also perished for us, but has not perished so far as pertains to renown. We therefore, having immediately collected those bundles which the faithful dead had preserved for us, and quitting with rapid step the boundaries of Plataea, frequently considered with ourselves that no fidelity was to be found in life, because faith, hating our perfidy, had descended to the region of departed spirits and the dead. Thus all of us, being fatigued with the weight of our bundles and the roughness of the way through which we traveled, and also having lost three of our associates, we have brought these spoils which you see. After he had thus ended his speech, they poured out wine from golden bowls to the memory of their dead associates. And afterwards, having soothed the god Mars by certain hymns, they slept for a short time. But that old woman distributed to us fresh barley in abundance and without measure, so that my horse, indeed, having obtained such a great plenty and enjoying it alone, might think that he was received at a pontifical banquet. I, however, though at other times, well, I was a man, I had also eaten barley, gradually broken, diminished by the long-continued section, and boiled in broth, having explored a corner in which the remainder of the bread, belonging to the whole band, had been heaped together, strenuously exercised my jaws, which had been injured by long fasting, and now began to be covered with the webs of spiders. And behold, when the night was far advanced, the robbers, being roused from their sleep, removed their camp, and being variously equipped, so that one part of them was armed with swords, but another was transformed into nightly ghosts, they left their abode in hasty steps. Nevertheless, not even impending sleep could prevent me from eating incessantly and greedily. And though before, when I was Lucius, I could depart from the table, contented with one or two loaves, yet then indulging my belly, which was so capacious, I had now nearly eaten the third canister of bread. The bright light of day found me intent on this employment. At length, however, being impelled by asinine shame, but reluctantly departing from thence, I assuaged my thirst in a neighboring rivulet. Not long after this, the robbers returned, very anxious and solicitous, bringing with them no bundle whatever, nor even a mean garment, but armed alone with swords, they brought with all their hands and all their forces of the band a virgin of a beautiful form and as the magnificence of her habit indicated one of the first rank of that country the virgin was by hercules an object of desire even to such an ass as i was but she was brought in by them lamenting and tearing her hair together with her garment as soon as they had entered into the cavern they thus addressed her in words intended to mitigate her grief as you are in perfect security, both with respect to your life and your modesty, give a truce to your sorrow for a few days for the sake of our gain, the necessity of our poverty compelling us to adopt this mode of life. But your parents, though they are very avaricious, will nevertheless, without delay, give, out of the great wealth which they have accumulated, a sum of money adequate to the redemption of their daughter. By these and similar babblings, the grief of the virgin was by no means appeased, for she wept immoderately with her head placed between her knees. They, however, called to the old woman within the cavern and ordered her to sit with the virgin and console her as much as possible with bland conversation, and then they betook themselves to their accustomed employment. But the virgin could not be recalled from her tears, which she had begun to shed, by any words which the old woman employed, but deploring more profoundly her condition and agitation which she suffered from her continual sobbing made me also weep, 
and she thus lamented, Is it possible that I, miserable creature, can either cease to weep or consent to live when deprived of such a house, of so many attendants, of such dear little slaves, and of such venerable parents, since I am now become the prey of unhappy rapine, and made a slave, servilely enclosed in this stony prison, and prevented from the enjoyment of all those delicacies in which I was born and nurtured, I am placed in doubt of my life, and in fear of the torments of executioners, being thus in the power of so many and such outrageous robbers, and of a horrid band of gladiators. The virgin, having thus lamented, and being debilitated with mental grief, the tension of her throat, the fatigue of her body, she dismissed her marked eyes to sleep. She had scarcely, however, closed her eyes, when shaking off sleep, after the manner of those who are furiously agitated by the nymphs, she began to afflict herself much more grievously, and also to beat her breast with her cruel hands, and to strike her beautiful face. Profoundly sighing also, she thus replied to the old woman, who earnestly inquired what were the causes of her new and restored sorrow. Now, alas, I am utterly undone. Now I have renounced salutiferous hope. A halter or a sword, or certainly a precipice, must doubtly be embraced by me. On hearing this, the old woman became somewhat more incensed, ordered her with severe countenance to tell her the cause of her sorrow, or why, having been asleep, she thus suddenly renewed her immoderate lamentations. Do you design, she said, to defraud my young men of the great sum of money which they will obtain for your redemption? But if you persist any further in indulging this immoderate grief, despising those tears of which robbers make no account, I will cause you to be burnt alive. The virgin, being terrified by these words, kissed the hand of the old woman and said, Spare me, my parent, and being mindful of human piety, afford some little aid to my most afflictive condition. For I do not think that commiseration is entirely extinguished in you, who are venerably hoary through more extended age. In the last place, therefore, survey the scene of my calamity. A beautiful youth of first rank among his fellow citizens, whom the whole city publicly elected for its son, and who, besides this, was my cousin, surpassing me by three years only in age, who was nourished and educated with me from infancy, and separably dwelt with me in the same house, and partook of the same bedchamber and bed, was affianced to me by mutual affection of holy love, and who some time since had been destined by nuptial vows to the marriage compact, and was registered as wedded by the consent of our parents. This youth had emoliated victims in the temples and sacred edifices, accompanied by a great multitude of relatives and neighbors. The whole house was covered with laurel, was luminous with torches, and resounded with a nuptial song. Then my unhappy mother, supporting me in her bosom, gracefully decorated me with nuptial ornaments, and frequently giving me sweet kisses, extended with anxious wishes her future hope of offspring. When on a sudden, robbers armed like gladiators, rushing in with great violence, raging as in war, and shining with drawn and threatening sword, did not bring with them the hand of slaughter or rapine, but immediately invaded our bedchamber in a condensed and conglobed band, and without any reluctance or even the smallest resistance on the part of our servants, they tore me away, miserable creature, lifeless with dire dread, from the bosom of my trembling mother. Thus our nuptials were disturbed and dissolved, like those of Pyrethus, the daughter of Anthrax. But behold, now also my misfortune is renewed, or rather is increased, by a most inauspicious dream. For I seem to myself to be violently expelled from my home, from my bedchamber, and lastly, from the bed itself, and hurried through inaccessible deserts to call on the name of my most unfortunate husband. He, however, as soon as he was deprived of my embraces, even then being perfumed with ointments and adorned with wreaths of flowers, followed my footsteps while I fled with foreign feet. And while he loudly implored the assistance of the people, lamenting the rape of his beautiful wife, one of the robbers, being moved in indignation through his importunate pursuit, slew the unhappy youth, my husband, by striking him with a great stone which he found lying before his feet. 
But I, being terrified by the atrocity of the spectacle, am tremblingly roused from the deadly dream. Then the old woman, receiving her lamentations with a sigh, thus began, Be of good courage, my mistress, and do not terrify yourself with the vain fictions of dreams. For not to mention that the images of diurnal sleep are said to be false, nocturnal visions sometimes signify events contrary to what they represent. Lastly, to weep, to be beat, and sometimes also to be slain in dreams, announces a lucrative or prosperous event, while on the contrary, to laugh, to fill one's belly with delicious food, or to be dissolved in venereal pleasure, predicts affliction from sorrow, bodily disease, or other evils. I, however, will recall you from your grief by pleasant narrations and old woman's fables. In a certain city lived a king and queen who had three daughters of conspicuous beauty. Of these, the two elder, though of the most agreeable form, were not thought too lovely to be celebrated by the praises of mankind. But the beauty of the younger sister was so great and illustrious that it could neither be expressed nor sufficiently praised by the poverty of human speech. At length, a multitude of citizens an abundance of strangers whom the rumor of the exalted spectacle had collected together, full of ardent zeal, stupid with admiration of her inaccessible beauty, and moving their right hands to their mouths while their forefinger was placed on their erect thumb, venerated her with religious adorations as if she had been the goddess Venus herself. And now fame had pervaded the neighboring cities and contiguous regions, and had reported that the goddess whom the azure profundity of the deep brought forth, and the dew of the foamy billows nourished, now everywhere exhibiting her divinity, was conversant with the midst of the people, or certainly that once more from a new bosom of the celestial stars, not the sea but the earth, had produced another Venus. Endued with virgin-like flower, thus opinion increased immensely every day, thus extended fame wandered over the neighboring islands a great part of the continent and the multitude of provinces now many mortals by long journey on land or over the deep passages of the sea came to behold the glorious specimen of the age no one sailed to paphos no one to nidus or even to cythera for the spectacle of the goddess venus the sacred concerns of the goddess were abandoned her temples were deformed her ceremonies neglected, her images uncrowned, and her desolate altars defiled with frigid ashes, while a girl was supplicated in her stead, and the divinity of so great a goddess was appeased in the human countenance, and the name of the absent Venus was propitiated in the morning progressions, victims and banquets of the Virgin, and now the people frequently assembling in the streets and throwing flowers intertwined with garlands or loosely scattering them, prayed to her divinity. This immoderate translation of celestial honors to the worship of a mortal virgin inflamed the vehement mind of true Venus, so that, impatient with indignation and raging high in her agitated head, she thus discoursed with herself, Behold the ancient parent of the nature of things, lo, the first origin of the elements. Behold the bountiful Venus of the whole universe, the honor of whose majesty is divided with a mortal girl, and whose name, raised to the heavens, is profaned by sore terrestrials. Indeed, by sharing in common the expiations which are offered to divinity, I sustain an uncertain part of deputed veneration, and a girl of noxious morality bears about my celestial image. It is in vain that the shepherd, Paris, whose justice and faith the mighty Jupiter approved, preferred me to such great goddesses, on account of my illustrious form. But she who thus rejoices, whosoever sh she be, shall not usurp my honors, for I will cause her to repent of her illicit beauty, and immediately she calls her son, that winged and sufficiently rash youth, who, with his depraved manners, contemning public discipline, armed with flames and arrows, running through other men's houses by night, and corrupting the matrimony of all, commits such mighty wickedness with impunity, and effects nothing useful and good. Him, though haughty by genuine license, she stimulates by her words. She brings him to the city, and openly shows him Psyche, for this was the name of the girl, 
and having told him the whole tale concerning the emulation of her beauty, groaning and raging with indignation. I beseech thee, says she, by the leagues of maternal love, by the sweet wounds of thine arrow, by the mellifluous burnings of that flame, to afford thy parent full revenge through your reverence of me, and severely punish that rebellious beauty. Above all, willingly effect this one thing, that the virgin may be detained by most ardent love of the lowest of mankind, whom fortune has deprived of his dignity, patrimony, and safety, and so infirm that he may not find his equal in misery throughout the world. Having thus spoke, and for a long time, and closely embraced her son with ardent kisses, she sought the neighboring margin of their affluent shore, and with rosy feet trod on the topmost dew of the vibrating waves. Behold, now the water of the profound sea was appeased from its vertex, and the marine train, which she just began to wish, appeared without delay, as if she had previously commanded its attendance. The daughters of Nereus were present, singing choruses, and Portunus, rough with his cerulean beard, and Cilicia, heavy with her fishy bosom, small Polymon, the charioteer of the dolphin, the company of the tritons everywhere furrowing the sea, and while this softly blows his sounding shell, that with a silken covering resists the unfriendly ardor of the sun, another carries a mirror before the eyes of his mistress, the others swim under the two yoked car, such was the train which attended Venus, proceeding to the ocean. In the meantime, Psyche perceived no advantage to herself from her admirable beauty. She was seen by all and praised by all, yet no one, neither kings nor nobles, nor any of the common people, approached as a suitor for her possession in marriage. They admired, indeed, her divine form, but they all admired it as an image artificially polished. Sometime prior to this, her two sisters, whose moderate beauty had not been celebrated by mankind, having been married to suitor kings, now obtained happy nuptials. But the virgin Psyche, sitting desolate at home, lamented her deserted solitude, sick in her body and wounded in her soul, and though pleasing to all nations, she hates the beauty in herself. But the most miserable father of the most unfortunate daughter, suspecting the celestial hatred and fearing the wrath of the gods, questioned the most ancient oracle of the Milesian god and sought so great a divinity by prayers and victims nuptials and a husband for the sorrowful virgin. Apollo, therefore, though a Grecian and Ionian, on account of the builders of Malaysia, gave the following article in Latin verse. On some high mountain's craggy summit place, the virgin, decked for deadly nuptial rites, nor hope a son-in-law of mortal race, but a dire mischief, viperous and fierce, who flies through ether and with fire and sword, tires and debilitates whate'er exists, terrific to the powers that reign on high. E'en mighty Jove the winged destroyer dreads, and streams and Stygian shades abhor the pest. The king, whose days till then had been crowned with felicity, on hearing this sacred oracle, returned slowly home, oppressed with sorrow, and disclosed to his wife the mandates of the unpropitious fate. Many days were passed on this occasion in grief, weeping, and lamenting, but the cruel injunctions of the dire oracle now required to be accomplished. Now preparations were made for the deadly nuptials of the most miserable virgin. Now the nuptial was changed into a funeral torch, and the sound of the Zion, or conjugal, pipe into the querulous Lydian measure. A joyful hymnal song closed with mournful howling, and the wretched bride wiped away her tears with her own nuptial veil. The whole city likewise lamented the sad destiny of the royal house, and public mourning was immediately proclaimed on the occasion. The necessity, however, of complying with the celestial mandates importunately urged the miserable psyche to her destined punishment. The solemnities, therefore, of the mourning full marriage being accomplished with extreme sorrow, the living funeral takes place, followed by all the people, and the weeping psyche attends not her nuptials, but her obsequies. However, while her sorrowful parents, who were overwhelmed with such a mighty evil, endeavored to delay the execution of the nefarious sentence, she herself exhorted them to a compliance in the following words. Why do you torture your unhappy old age with long-continued weeping? Why do you waste your spirits 
which indeed are more mine than yours, with such frequent groans? Why do you deform your countenances, which in my sight are so venerable, with unavailing tears? Why do you lacerate my eyes in your own? Why do you thus tear your hoary hairs? Why thus beat your venerable breasts? These must be rewards which you are to receive of my surpassing beauty, the truth of which, having suffered a deadly blow from villainous envy, you too late perceived. Alas! Then should you have wept and lamented, then bewailed me as one lost, when the people of the nation celebrated me with divine honors, and when with one voice they called me a new Venus. I now perceive, I now clearly see, that I perish through the name of Venus alone. Lead me away, and place me on the rock to which I am destined by the oracle. I am in haste to accomplish these happy nuptials. I am in haste to see my noble husband. Why do I delay? Why do I avoid his approach, who is born for the destruction of the whole world? The virgin, having thus spoke, was silent, and with undaunted steps mingled herself with a splendid procession of people that followed her. They advanced to the destined rock of a lofty mountain, on the summit of which, having left the royal maid alone, with the nuptial torches extinguished by their tears, they returned home, with dejected heads and desponding hearts, and her miserable parents, indeed, sinking under the weight of such a mighty calamity, shut up the gates of their palace, hid themselves in darkness, and abandoned themselves to perpetual night. But the mild gales of the gently blown zephyr gradually raised Psyche, as she stood trembling and weeping on the summit of the rock. Her garments, through the tranquil breath of God, orbicularly expanding and bearing her through the hollows of the valley. At the bottom of the mountain, softly reclined her on the bosom of a flowery turf. End of chapter 4, part 2, recording by Lee J. Seipel. Chapter 5, part 1 of the Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ted Garvin. The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass, by Puleus. Translated by Thomas Taylor, Chapter Five, Part One. Psyche, therefore, agreeably reclining in the flowery valley on a bed of dewy grass, the mighty perturbation of her mind being appeased, enjoyed delightful repose. And being now sufficiently refreshed with sleep, she rose with a more composed mind and saw a grove thick planted with vast and lofty trees, and a fountain in the middle of the grove gently falling with glassy water. Near the lapse of the fountain there was a royal house, which was not raised by human, but by divine hands and art. You might know, from the very entrance of the palace, that you beheld the splendid and pleasant residence of a god. For the lofty ceilings, which were curiously arched with citron wood and ivory, were supported by golden pillars, and all the walls were ornamented, in every part, with silver carving, beasts of various kinds presenting themselves to the view, in the vestibule of the palace. Wonderful was the man, indeed, and endued with prodigious skill, or rather it was some demigod or god, who fashioned the silver carving with such exquisite subtlety of art. But the very pavement itself consisted of small shells, admirably decorated with pictures of various kinds. Blessed, thrice blessed, are those who tread on gems and bracelets. The other parts, too, of this wide extended and regularly disposed palace were precious, beyond all price, and the walls being everywhere strengthened with bars of gold, were so refulgent with their own splendor, that, even in the absence of the sun, they made for the palace a day of its own. So bright were the bedchambers, the porches, and the folding doors. The furniture, too, was answerable to the majesty of this abode, so that it might very properly be considered as a celestial palace, built by mighty Jupiter, for his correspondence with mankind. Psyche, invited by the delightful aspect of the place, approached to it, and assuming a little more confidence, entered within the threshold of the place. Presently after, being allured by the charms of the beautiful vision, everything she surveyed filled her with admiration, and in the more elevated part of the house, she beheld a magnificent repository in which immense riches were contained indeed there is not anything in this universe with which this place is not replete but amidst the admiration which such prodigious wealth excited this was particularly wonderful that this treasury of the whole world was not secured by any bars 
or doors, or guards. Here, while the eyes of Psyche were ravished with delight, a voice, denuded of its body, thus addressed her. And why, my mistress, it said, are you astonished at such vast riches? All these are yours. Betake yourself, therefore, to your bedchamber, and refresh your weary limbs on the bed, and when you think proper, repair to the bath, for we, whose voices you now hear, are your servants, who will diligently administer to all your commands, and while we wait on your person, prepare royal banquets for your repast. Psyche, perceived the goodness of divine providence, and complying with the admonitions of the incorporeal voices, first refreshed herself with sleep, and afterwards with the bath. Immediately, too, perceiving, in an adjacent semicircular building, near an elevated seat, every apparatus requisite for supper, she willingly reclined herself, considering this place as accommodated to her refreshment, and instantly nectarious wines, and numerous dishes of various kinds of food, were served in, without any visible attendance, by the mere impulse of a certain spirit. Psyche, at the same time, perceiving no one, but alone hearing certain words, and having voices alone for her servants. After the table was furnished with this splendid banquet, a certain person entered, and sang, without being seen. At the same time an invisible musician played on the harp, and last of all her ears were ravished with a full chorus from an invisible band. After these pleasures were finished, the evening now persuading to repose, Psyche retired to her bed, and when the night was far advanced, a certain gentle sound approached her ears. Then, fearing for her virginity, on account of the profound solitude of the place, she trembles, and is filled with horror, and dreads that of which she is ignorant beyond any calamity. And now her unknown husband approached, ascended the bed, made her his wife, and hastily left her before the rising of the morning light. Immediately the attendant voices, who were the ministers of the bedchamber, took care of everything necessary on the occasion. This course was continued for a long time. The novelty, by its constant repetition, as it was natural it should, became at last delightful, and the sound of the uncertain voices was the solace of her solitude. In the meantime, the parents of Psyche grew old in unwearied sorrow and lamentation, and the report of her destiny becoming more widely extended, her elder sisters came to know all the particulars respecting it, and immediately, being overwhelmed with sorrow, hastened to the presence of their afflicted parents. On that very night, the husband of Psyche thus addressed her, for the hands and the ears were the only media of their present communication. Most charming Psyche, and dear wife, more cruel fortune now threatens thee with a deadly danger, which, I think, ought to be guarded against with the utmost attention. For now your sisters, who are disturbed through the belief of your death, in consequence of endeavouring to discover the place of your abode, will soon arrive at the rock on which you were lately exposed. If you should chance to hear any of their lamentations, neither make them any reply, nor even turn your eyes towards them, for by doing otherwise you will be the cause of the greatest grief to me, and of extreme destruction to yourself. Psyche assented, and promised that she would act agreeably to her husband's desire. But as soon as he, together with the knight, were fled, the most miserable Psyche consumed the whole day in tears and lamentations, exclaiming that she was now entirely lost, since, securely confined in a blessed prison, she was deprived of human conversation, and not permitted to give salutary assistance to her sorrowing sisters, nor even so much as to see them. Neither refreshing herself, therefore, with the bath, nor with food, but weeping abundantly, she retired to rest. But her husband, coming more early than usual, and embracing her weeping, thus expostulated with her. Is this my psyche, which you promised me? What can I, your husband, now expect from you? What can I now hope for, since neither by day nor by night, nor even in the midst of our conjugal embraces, you cease to be tormented with grief? But come, act now as you please, and comply with the pernicious desires of your soul. However, when you begin too late to repent of your folly, call to mind my serious admonitions. Psyche, after this, had recourse to prayers, and while she threatens that she shall die if her request is denied, extorts from her husband permission to see her sisters, to assuage their grief and enjoy their conversation. Thus he pardoned the entreaties of his new wife, and permitted her, besides, to present her sisters with as much gold and as many jewels as she pleased. But he again, and repeatedly admonished her, with the utmost earnestness, not to be persuaded, by their pernicious advice, to inquire concerning the form of her husband, nor by a sacrilegious curiosity hurl herself from such an exalted fortune, and by this means deprive herself of his embraces. 
she thanked her husband for his indulgence and becoming in consequence of it more joyful but says she may i suffer death a hundred times rather than be deprived of thy most pleasing embraces for i love thee most vehemently thee whoever thou art even as i love my own soul nor would i compare thee to cupid himself but this also i beseech you grant to my prayers that your servant zephyr may convey my sorrowful sisters in the same manner in which he brought me hither then pressing his lips with persuasive kisses murmuring alluring words and fondly folding him in her arms she thus addressed him in soothing accents my dear husband sweet soul of thy psyche be not averse to my request the husband vanquished by the power of venus reluctantly gave his consent and promised that all things should be accomplished according to her desire and afterwards in consequence of the reproach of mourning vanished from the arms of his wife but the sisters having inquired their way arrived in haste at the lofty rock on which psyche was left abandoned and there wept and beat their breasts till the rocks resounded with their repeated lamentations and now they called on their miserable sister by her proper name till the spreading sound of their mournful voices gliding down the declivities of the mountain reached the ears of psyche who distracted and trembling ran out of her palace and thus addressed them why do you in vain afflict yourself with miserable lamentations i whom you deplore am now present cease therefore your complaints and at length dry up those tears which you have so long shed for my loss since you may now embrace her whom you have so vehemently mourned then calling zephyr she acquaints him with her husband's commands who entirely obedient to the mandate of cupid brought them borne on the most gentle gales in safety to psyche now they embrace and are embraced and mingle their mutual caresses with frequent and hasty kisses and the joy of finding her alive after they had considered her as dead soon put a period to their lamentations and tears but come said psyche enter with me into my house and recreate your afflicted mind with your psyche having thus spoken she led them into her golden palace brought their ears acquainted with the populous family of voices that were subservient to her commands and sumptuously refreshed them in a most beautiful bath and with the delicacies of her immortal table but as soon as her sisters were satiated with this affluence of celestial riches they began to nourish envy profoundly in their hearts and at last one of them with a very particular and curious importunity inquired who was the master of these celestial possessions and who and what sort of a person her husband was psyche however by no means violated her husband's injunctions or suffered them to depart from the secret recesses of her bosom but devising an answer adapted to the occasion told them that he was a beautiful youth whose cheeks were yet only shadowed with down and that he was for the most part occupied in rural enjoyments and in hunting on the mountains unless by any slip in the course of her conversation she should betray the secret advice having loaded them with rich presents of gold and jewels she called zephyr and ordered him to carry them to the lofty rock this being immediately accomplished these admirable sisters as they were returning home burning with the rancor of increasing envy discoursed much with each other and at last one of them thus began do but take notice how blind cruel and unjust fortune has proved were you my sister pleased to find that we though born of the same parents should maintain such a different rank in life we who are elder are delivered over to be servants to husbands in a foreign country far exiled from our native land and parents but this youngest sister the offspring of exhausted vigour is raised to the enjoyment of this prodigious affluence and of a god for her husband though she does not know how to use in a proper manner such an abundance of good you saw sister what a prodigious quantity of bracelets the house contained what a number of shining garments what bright gems and what heaps of gold she treads upon in every part of the palace if to all this she possesses a husband so beautiful as she asserts him to be no one in the universe can live a happier life than herself indeed it may happen through long continued association and corroborated affection that her husband who is a god may at length make her a goddess by hercules it must be so for she already conducts herself in a lofty manner and the woman certainly breathes the goddess who has voices for her servants and commands even the winds themselves but i miserable creature am in the first place tied to a husband more aged than my father and in the next place to one who is balder than a gourd and shorter than a pygmy and who secures every part of his house with bolts and chains but i replied the other sister am destined to endure a husband 
whose body is distorted with an articular disease, and though on this account he seldom rewards my pains with conjugal embraces, yet I am forced to spend a great part of my time in rubbing his distorted fingers, which are almost hardened into stone, with fetid fomentations, defiling these delicate hands with nasty rags and stinking poultices, thus acting the part of a surgeon more than that of a wife. You indeed, my sister, seem to bear all this with a patient or rather servile soul, for I will speak what I think without restraint. But, for my own part, I can no longer endure that such a blessed destiny should have fallen to one who does not deserve it. But only recollect in what a proud and arrogant manner she behaved towards us. By her boasting and immoderate ostentation, she betrayed the haughtiness of her swelling mind. Of her immense riches gave us but a very trifling part, and immediately after, being weary of our company, ordered us to be turned out of doors, and to be puffed and hissed away. But I am not a woman, nor do I breathe, if I do not hurl her headlong from such mighty possessions. And if our contumely affects you as it ought, let us both join, in vigorous consultation, how we may accomplish this design. In order to this, let us neither acquaint our parents, nor anyone else, with our intention, nor inform them that we know anything of her safety. It is sufficient that we ourselves have seen what it repents us to have seen, and let us not be the messengers of her happy condition to our parents and the people, for those are not properly blessed whose riches no one is acquainted with. She shall know that we are not servants, but her elder sisters. And now, indeed, let us depart to our husbands, and visit our own poor habitations, for such they are when compared with her abode, and being furnished with more compressed thoughts, let us return with greater firmness to the punishment of her pride. The two wicked sisters consider this evil advice as good, and concealing the precious gifts which they had received from Psyche, dishevelling their hair, tearing their faces with dissembled grief, and renewing fictitious tears, returned to their parents. These, however, the wounds of whose sorrows they had again opened by their narration, they hastily take their leave of, big with the madness of envy, and return to their own habitations, machinating nefarious guile, or rather parricide, against their innocent sister. In the meantime, Psyche's unknown husband thus again admonished her in his nocturnal discourses. Do you perceive what a mighty danger fortune is preparing for you at a distance, and which, unless you are more firmly guarded against than you have hitherto been, will soon assault you near at hand? Those perfidious she-wolves are, with mighty endeavors, forming base stratagems against you, the sum of which is, that they may persuade you to explore my countenance, which, as I have often told you, if you once see, you will see no more. If, therefore, those worst of sorcerers come again, armed with noxious minds, and I know they will come, avoid all discourse with them, but if through genuine simplicity and tenderness of disposition you are not able to accomplish this, at least be careful not to hear nor answer any inquiries concerning your husband." For now we shall have a family of our own, and thy as yet infantine womb is pregnant with an offspring, which, if you conceal my secrets in silence, will be divine, but if you profane them, will be mortal. Psyche rejoiced in the consoling thoughts of a divine offspring, and was elated with the glory which would result from her future pledge, and with the dignity of a maternal name. She therefore anxiously numbered the increasing days and departing months, and being ignorant in everything relative to conception, wondered how her wealthy womb could receive such an abundant increase. But now those pests and most cruel furies, her sisters, breathing viperous virulence, and hastening their departure, sailed with impious celerity. Then again the momentary husband thus admonished his psyche. The last day, and the most extreme misfortune, are now arrived. The malicious sex and hostile blood have taken arms, removed their camp, drawn the army into battle array, and sounded the charge. Now thy nefarious sisters are aiming with a drawn sword at thy throat. Alas, most dear Psyche, what mighty calamities now press upon us! Take pity, both on yourself and me, and by a religious countenance of tongue, deliver your house, your husband, yourself, and our little one, from the misfortune of impending ruin. Neither see nor hear those wicked women, who, after the deadly hatred which they have conceived against thee, and having trampled on the ties of blood, deserve not to be called sisters, when, like the sirens, standing on the mountain, they shall make the rocks resound with their deadly voices. Psyche, in words interrupted by sighs and tears, thus replied, 
you have for some time convincing proofs of my fidelity and taciturnity and the strength of my mind shall be no less approved by you in the present instance only order zephyr to repeat his former office and at least grant me the sight of my sisters since i am not permitted to behold thy sacred image by thy fragrant and every way pendulous locks by thy cheeks tender smooth and like my own by thy breast glowing with i know not what kind of heat by my hopes of at least knowing thy face in this little one i beseech thee to comply with the pious prayers of thy suppliant indulge me in the desired embraces of my sisters and recreate with joy the soul of psyche who is devoted to thy will for then i shall no longer be anxious to explore thy countenance now nothing can hinder me from thy embrace not even the darkness of night for i hold thee my life in my arms the husband being fascinated by these words and by her soft embraces wiped away her tears with these fragrant locks assured her that her desires should be fulfilled and immediately anticipated the light of the emerging day but the two sisters who were confederates in mischief without calling on their parents direct their course with precipitate velocity from the ships to the rock and not waiting for the assistance of the elevating wind leap on high with licentious temerity zephyr however not unmindful of the royal mandate though unwilling to execute it restored them reclining on the bosom of the gently blowing gales to the appointed place then with feet equally rapid they enter the palace concealing the foe under the name of sister embrace their prey and veiling a treasury of profoundly hidden fraud under a joyful countenance thus flattered her psyche not now so slender as you were before since you are now almost a mother what mighty good do you think you bear for us in your womb with what prodigious joy will you exhilarate the whole of our house oh how happy shall we be through the nurture of the golden infant who if he corresponds in beauty as he ought to do to his parents will be born a perfect cupid thus by disassembled affectation they gradually invade the soul of their sister who as soon as they had refreshed themselves from the fatigue of their journey with warm baths regaled them on a couch in a most splendid manner with all the dainties of a royal banquet she ordered a harp to speak and some one immediately sang to its harmony flutes to be blown and they immediately sounded a musical band to sing in chorus and it instantly sang and though invisible ravished the souls of the hearers with the most mellifluous notes but the malice of these wicked women was not softened by the honeyed sweetness of the music but turning their discourse to the destined fraudulent snares they began in a dissembling manner to inquire what sort of a person she was married to and from what family he was descended then she through her too great simplicity having forgot the former account which she had given of her husband invented a new story respecting him she told them that her husband was of the next province that he carried on a trade with abundance of money and that he was now of a middle age a gray hair being that here and there scattered on his head and without prolonging the conversation any further she again committed them to the charge of the winds while she had loaded them with costly presents but while they returned home sublimely riding on the tranquil breath of zephyr they thus discoursed with each other what can we say sister of the monstrous lies of that foolish creature at one time her husband is a young man with the down just beginning to spread over his chin and at another time he is of a middle age shining with hoary hairs who can this be that in a short space of time experiences the alteration of a sudden old age you may depend upon it my sister that this vile woman either forged the lie to deceive us or that she does not herself know the form of her husband but whichever of these is the case she must be deprived of these riches with the utmost expedition indeed if she is really ignorant of the form of her husband she must have married a god and through this pregnancy of hers she will present us with a god however should she happen to be the mother of a divine offspring which heaven forbid i should immediately hang myself let us therefore in the meantime return to our parents and by a well-coloured deceit prevent them from apprehending our design end of chapter five part one Chapter Five, Part Two of the Metamorphoses, or Golden Ass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Metamorphoses, or Golden Ass, by Apuleius, translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter Five, Part Two. The sisters, thus inflamed 
having called on their parents in a hasty manner, and passed through a night of interrupted sleep, fly as soon as it was morning to the rock, and by the usual vehicle of the wind, descend rapidly down to Psyche, who, with forced tears, they craftily addressed. Happy in your own imagination, and blessed only in your ignorance of evil, you sit here inattentive to your own danger. But we, who watch over your affairs with a vigilant care, are miserably tormented at your lost condition. For, by diligent search, we have discovered, nor can we conceal from you the cause of our mutual grief in your own misfortune, that a vast serpent, who glides along the plain in various volumes, whose neck is swollen with noxious poison, and whose mouth widely gapes through profound gluttony, secretly sleeps with you by night. Now call to mind the Pythian oracle, which declared you was destined to marry a fierce and terrible beast. And many of the inhabitants of this place, who haunt all round the country, have observed him returning home from his prey in the evening, and gliding through the shallows of the neighboring river. These declare that he will not long feast you with delicious delicacies, but that, as soon as a full womb shall have given maturity to your pregnancy, he will then devour you as a richer morsel, so that you have only to consider whether you will comply with the desires of your sisters, who are anxious for your dear preservation and avoiding death, live with us secure from danger. But if you are wedded to the vocal solitude of this country retreat, or to the filthy and dangerous enjoyment of clandestine venery and the embraces of a poisoned serpent, we have at least acted as pious sisters in thus admonishing you of your danger. Then the miserable Psyche, as being full of simplicity and of a pliant disposition, is seized with terror at the dire relation, and being thus quite beside herself, loses the remembrance of all her husband's admonitions and her own promises, and hurls herself headlong into a profound abyss of calamity. Trembling, therefore, and pale, and with an almost lifeless voice, she thus addressed them in broken words. You, indeed, most dear sisters, have acted as it was proper you should, and with becoming piety towards me. And it appears to me that those who gave you this information did not invent a lie, for I have never yet beheld my husband's face, nor do I know who or what he is. But only hearing him by night, I endure a husband of an uncertain condition, and one that perpetually avoids the light of day. I am therefore of your opinion that he is some monstrous beast, who always terrifies me from attempting to behold him, and threatens some prodigious evil as the consequence of curiosity respecting his countenance. Therefore, if you are able to give any salutary assistance to your sister, who is thus dangerously situated, defer it not for a moment. These wicked women, having thus found an avenue to their pernicious design, by a full discovery of their sister's condition, laying aside the concealments of covered artifice, invade the trembling thoughts of the simple girl with the drawn sword of deception. At length, therefore, one of them thus began. Since the ties of blood oblige us to have no fear of danger before our eyes in the pursuit of your safety, we will discover to you the only way which leads to your preservation and which has been the result of long-continued cogitation, secretly conceal a very sharp razor, which has been perfectly well set, in that part of the bed on which you are accustomed to lie, and provide likewise an elegant lamp, full of oil, and shining with a splendid light. Hide this lamp in some part of the enclosing tapestry, and, having acted with the utmost secrecy in these preparations, as soon as with furrowed steps he ascends the accustomed bed, is stretched at length, and held fast in the fetters of his first and soundest sleep. Then, silently leaving the bed, and tripping along softly with naked feet, free the lamp from its dark concealment, take advantage of its light to accomplish your illustrious undertaking, and, with a bold heart, elevated right hand, and strenuous exertion, cut off the head of the noxious serpent." nor shall our assistance be wanting to you in this affair, but we shall wait near with impatient anxiety till you have procured your safety by his death, and then, bringing away with you all your invisible attendants, we will join you, who are a woman 
in votive nuptials to a man. With such pernicious discourse, having inflamed the bosom of their now perfectly ardent sister, they left her, fearing in the highest degree the very confines of such a mighty evil, and, by the wanted impulse of the winged gale, being raised on the rock, immediately hurl themselves from thence with rapid flight, and having ascended the ships, depart to their respective habitations. But Psyche, being left alone, if she can be said to be alone, who is hurried by the pernicious furies, is tossed with sorrow like a raging sea, and though her designs were fixed, and her mind was obstinately bent to accomplish what she intended, yet she now was beginning to apply her hands to the impious work, and she staggers with uncertain determinations, and is distracted with the apprehension of her approaching calamities. She is now full of speed, then dilatory, now bold, then fearful, now diffident, then angry, and what is the most wonderful of all, in the same body, she loves her husband, and hates the beast. However, as soon as the evening draws on the night, she prepares with precipitate haste the instruments of her nefarious enterprise. The night came, the husband was present, and after the first embrace, he fell into a profound sleep. Then Psyche, who was otherwise of an imbecile body and mind, yet, the cruelty of her fate assisting her, is now corroborated. Hence, taking out the lamp, and snatching the razor, her boldness transformed her sex. But, as soon as, by the light of the lamp, the secrets of the bed stood revealed, she saw the most mild and sweet of all wild beasts, even the beautiful god Cupid himself, most beautifully lying on the bed, by whose aspect the lamp itself participated of hilarity, and the razor repented itself of its sacrilegious edge. But Psyche, terrified at the amazingly beautiful countenance of the god, impotent of mind, and sinking through deadly paleness and trembling, fell on her knees, and could not tell where so properly to hide the steel, as in her own bosom, which, indeed, she would have done, had not the razor, afraid of a crime so prodigious, fled just then out of her rash hand. And now, as she kneels weary on the ground, by often beholding the beauty of his divine countenance, she finds herself refreshed. She sees the genial locks of his golden head, largely anointed with ambrosia, the ringlets gracefully entangled, wandering over his milky neck and purple cheeks, some pendulous before and some behind, by whose excessive radiance the very light of the lamp shone with a wavering splendor. On the shoulders of the volatile god, wings of a shining whiteness were seen, and though they were not in motion, yet the outward tender and delicate down, tremulously rebounding, was unquietly wanton. The rest of his body was smooth and elegant, and such as Venus did not repent of bringing forth. At the foot of the bed lie his bow, his quiver, and his arrows, the propitious weapons of the mighty god. These, while Psyche with an insatiable mind handles and explores with eager curiosity, and admires her husband's arms, she draws out of the quiver one of the arrows, and with the tip of her finger touching the point to try its sharpness, by the bold pressure of her trembling hand she pierced the flesh so deep that some small drops of rosy blood spread themselves with dewy sprinkling on her skin. Thus ignorant Psyche voluntarily fell in love with love. Then, burning more and more with the desire of Cupid, gazing on his face with insatiable eyes and multiplying petulant kisses, her only fear was, lest he would wake too soon. And while, astonished through such a mighty good, her wounded mind fluctuates, the lamp, whether through vile perfidy, or noxious envy, or whether it longed to touch, as it were, kiss, such a beautiful body, threw out a drop of boiling oil from the summit of its light on the right shoulder of the god. Strange, O bold and rash lamp, that thou shouldest burn the very god of all fire, though some lover first invented thee, that he might for a longer time enjoy by night the object of his desire. The god, thus burnt, leapt from his bed, 
and seeing the evidence of forfeited fidelity, silently flew away from the hands and eyes of his most unhappy wife. But Psyche, immediately, and with both her hands, caught hold of his right leg as he was mounting, being the miserable appendix of his sublime flight through the cloudy regions, till at length, through weariness, she fell to the ground. Her lover, God, however, not yet deserting her as she lay on the ground, flew to a neighboring cypress tree, and, being severely agitated, thus spoke to her from its lofty top. Most simple Psyche, I, unmindful of the commands of my mother Venus, who ordered me to cause you to be enamored of some mean and miserable son of the vulgar, chose rather to fly to you as a lover myself. I know that I have acted in this respect lightly, and I, who am so excellent an archer, have wounded myself with my own arrow, and have made you my wife that I might, it seems, be considered by you as a beast, and that you might cut off my head, which bears those very eyes by which you are beloved. This was the danger, of which I so often warned you to beware. This was the mischief I so benevolently admonished you to consider. But those egregious counsellors of yours shall speedily suffer from me the punishments of such pernicious advice, while I shall only punish you by my flight. Thus spake Cupid, and, with the conclusion of his speech, sprang from his pinions on high. But Psyche lay prostrate on the ground, gazing on her soaring husband as long as he remained in sight, and afflicting herself with lamentations in the extreme. When, however, by the rowing of his wings, distance had rendered him invisible, she threw herself from the bank of the next river headlong into its stream. But the gentle river, in honor of the god, who used to burn the waters themselves, and fearing for himself, immediately on the back of an innoxious wave, delivered her safe to the flowery bank. It happened at that time that the rural god Pan sat at the margin of the river, embracing the goddess Kana, and teaching her to sing in all manner of gentle strains. Near them a wanton herd of kids browsed on the grassy bank. The shaggy god who was not ignorant of the misfortunes of Psyche, called her gently to him, and thus allured her in soothing language. Most elegant girl, I am indeed a rural person, and a shepherd, but through the benefit of an extended old age I have acquired abundance of experience, and, if I rightly conjecture, since prudent men boast the power of divination, and from your stumbling and often reeling gait, from the extreme paleness of your countenance, and from your perpetual sighing and sorrowful eyes, you labor under an excess of love. Listen, therefore, to me. Attempt no more to drown yourself, or to put an end to your existence by calling any other kind of death to your assistance. But cease to grieve, lay aside your sorrow, and rather by prayers worship Cupid, the greatest of the gods, and strive to please him by bland obsequiousness, as he is a delicate and luxurious youth. The pastoral god, having thus spoken, Psyche made no reply, but adoring the salutary divinity, departed from the place. But before she had traveled far, with painful steps, pursuing an unknown path, she drew near to a city in which the husband of one of her sisters was king. This, as soon as she understood, she desired that her arrival might be announced to her sister. Psyche was accordingly introduced to her, and when the embraces of mutual salutation were over, to her sister inquiring the cause of her visit, she thus began, You doubtless remember the advice you gave me. I mean that I should destroy with a razor the beast that lie with me under the name of a husband, before, through voracious gluttony, he destroyed me. But as soon as, by the assistance of the conscious light, I beheld his countenance, I saw a spectacle perfectly wonderful and divine. The very son himself of the goddess Venus, Cupid himself, I say, sunk in gentle sleep, and, while struck with astonishment at the sight of such a mighty good, and disturbed through too great an abundance of pleasure, I labored under the want of enjoyment by a most dire misfortune. The boiling oil bubbled to the summit of the lamp and leaped on the shoulder of the god, being immediately awakened by the pain, 
when he beheld me armed with the weapon and the light. From whence, said he, proceeds this desire wickedness of thine? Immediately quit my bed, and depart from my sight. I will now immediately join myself in marriage to your sister, mentioning you expressly by name. And then he ordered Zephyr to blow me beyond the boundaries of his habitation. Psyche had scarcely ended her narration, when the sister, agitated by the incentives of lust and baneful envy, having deceived her husband by a preconcerted fiction respecting the death of her parents, immediately set sail for the rock on which Psyche had been exposed. And, though another wind then blowed, yet, elated with blind hope, she exclaimed, Receive me, Cupid, a wife worthy of thy embraces, and thou, Zephyr, receive thy mistress. Thus leaping as high as she was able, she fell headlong from the mountain, unable, even when dead, to arrive at the palace of Cupid. For her limbs were torn in pieces by the rocks as she fell, and her bowels became, as they deserved to be, food for birds and beasts of prey. Nor was the vengeance which remained to be inflicted slow in its approaches, for Psyche, with wandering steps, arrived at another city, where her other sister reigned, who, deceived and sinning in the same manner, hastened to the rock, and died just in the same way her sister had done before. In the meantime, while Psyche, wandering over various realms, anxiously searched after Cupid, he, though the pain from the wound from the lamp, lay groaning in the bedchamber of his mother. Then that extremely white bird, the seagull, who swims with his wings on the waves of the sea, hastily merged himself in the profound bosom of the ocean. There, placing himself near Venus, as she was bathing and swimming, he informed her that her son was severely burnt, and that he was groaning with the pain of the wound, and that his cure was doubtful. Thus, besides this, the whole family of Venus was everywhere reviled. In the first place, Cupid, because he had retired to a mountain, in order to have illicit connection with a girl. And in the next place, said he, yourself, by thus withdrawing to swim in the sea. Hence it is said, continued the bird, that there was no longer any pleasure, elegance, and festivity to be found, but that everything is inelegant, rustic, and horrid, that nuptial ties, social friendships, and love of children are no more, but that in their place have succeeded enormous filth, and the bitter loathing of sordid compacts. Thus did this loquacious and impertinent bird defame the son of Venus, by murmuring scandal in her ear. But Venus, being enraged by this information, suddenly exclaimed, in a firm tone of voice, So then, this hopeful son of mine has got a mistress. Come, tell me, thou, who alone dost serve me with affection, tell me the name of her who has solicited the ingenuous and naked boy, and whether she is one of the tribes of nymphs, or of the number of the goddesses, or of the choir of the muses, or belonging to my own train of the graces. The loquacious bird was not silent. But my mistress, said he, I am not certain, though, if I well remember, he is said to have been vehemently in love with a girl, whose name is Psyche. Thus Venus, being indignant, exclaimed, Does he thus love her, who is a rival of my beauty, and who is emulous of my name? And does he mean to make me, who first brought him to the knowledge of her, act the part of a bawd. Thus complaining, she immediately emerged from the sea, and hastened to her golden bedchamber, where she found her son sick, as she had been told, and so vehemently raving through the pain, that she heard him before she reached the doors. This is fine conduct indeed, said she, and very agreeable to our dignified birth, in your temperance. In the first place, that you, should trample on the precepts of your mistress and mother, and so far from tormenting my enemy with soiled love, take her to your licentious and immature embraces, on purpose that I might suffer the indignity of having my enemy for my daughter-in-law. Doubtless thou dost presume, thou trifler, corrupted and unbeloved boy, that I am too old to have another son. Know, therefore, that I will beget another son, much better than thou art, or rather, that, 
you may be more sensible of the disgrace, I will adopt one of my little slaves, and on him I will bestow those wings and flames, that bow and those arrows, and all my furniture which I gave you for purposes, very different from those to which you employ them. For you received no part of this apparatus from your father's possessions. But thou hast been of a perverse disposition from thy very childhood, and hence it is that thou hast so often struck thy elders, and even thy mother herself, even me, thou parricide. Besides, you despise me as if I were a widow, nor are you afraid of your valiant father-in-law, the mighty God, whom, to my torment, you have supplied with many a virgin. I shall take care, however, to make you repent of this frolicsome trick of yours, and render your nuptials sharp and bitter. However, being thus derided, what shall I do? Where shall I betake myself? How shall I punish that little deceiver? Shall I solicit assistance from my enemy? Sobriety, whom I have so often offended, through the luxury of this fraudulent boy, must I have recourse to that rustic and filthy woman? I abhor the very thought. Yet the consolation of revenge is not to be despised. I must therefore apply to her, and to her alone, for she will severely chastise this trifler. She will rifle his quiver, disarm his arrows, unbend his bow, extinguish his torch, and punish his body with still sharper remedies. Then, I shall believe atonement has been made for the injury I have received, when I have shaved off those locks, which, with these hands of mine, I have so often bound with a golden bandage, and cut off those pinions which I have dyed in the nectarious fountain, my bosom. Having thus given vent to her passion, full of venereal bile, she rushed impetuously out of doors. But Ceres and Juno immediately attended her, and, perceiving her angry countenance, asked her why she did so great an injury to her the gracefulness of her sparkling eyes, by such a sullen contraction of her brows. To whom Venus thus replied, You are come very opportunely to be the executioners of that violence which has taken possession of my ardent breast. I beg, therefore, that, with the utmost care and diligence, you will inquire after the fugitive psyche, for that infamous report respecting my house and the conduct of my unworthy son cannot be unknown to you. Then the two goddesses, being ignorant of what had happened, thus endeavored to mitigate the raging anger of Venus. What offense has your son committed, that you so violently oppose his pleasures, and are impatient to destroy her whom he loves? What crime, we beseech you, can he be charging with, in loving, without restraint, a beautiful virgin? Can you be ignorant of his sex and youth? Or have you, indeed, forgot how old he is? What, because he carries his years elegantly, would you consider him as a boy? Is it possible that you, who are his mother, and besides this a woman of understanding, can be determined always to pry inquisitively into his sport, blame his luxury and amours, and reprobate, in your beautiful son, your own arts and delights? But what god or man will suffer you to disseminate everywhere, among the people, amorous desires, when you restrain the gallantry of your own house, and thus shut up the public shop of female vices? The fear of his darts induced them to pay this flattery to absent Cupid, in a gracious patronage of his cause. But Venus, indignant that her injuries were thus ridiculously treated, with haughty mane and mighty step, passed on to the ocean. End of chapter 5, part 2chapter 6 part 1 of the metamorphosis or golden ass this is the librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the metamorphosis or golden ass by apuleius translated by thomas taylor chapter 6 part 1 in the meantime Psyche was driven about from place to place, variously wandering, and with restless mind inquiring after her husband. 
her desire of finding him increasing in proportion to the difficulty of the search. For, though she had incurred his anger, she hoped she should be able to appease him by suppliant prayers, if she could not allure him by the tender blandishments of a wife. Perceiving, therefore, a temple on the summit of a lofty mountain, "'How can I tell?' said she. "'But this may be the residence of my lord.' And immediately she directed her hasty steps thither, incited by hope and desire, though spent with unceasing toil. And now, having gained the highest ridges of the mountain, she enters the temple, in which she saw ears of corn, some of which lay in a heap, some were twisted into garlands, and some were mingled with ears of barley. Here, likewise, were scythes, and all the instruments of harvest, but scattered in a confused and careless manner, and thrown, as is usually the case in the heat of summer, out of the weary hands of the reapers. Psyche, on seeing this confusion, curiously separated the mingled heaps, and properly arranged them, when separated, believing that she ought not to neglect the temples and ceremonies of any divinity, but that she should implore the benevolent pity of all the gods. The bountiful Ceres, whose temple this was, finds her thus anxiously and sedulously employed, and addresses her at a distance as follows. Alas, miserable Psyche, Venus, full of rage and indignation, inquires after thy footsteps with anxious search, dooms thee to the most severe punishments, and importunately demands revenge, with all the powers of her divinity. Canst thou therefore now busy thyself about my affairs, or think of anything else but thy own safety? Then Psyche, throwing herself at the feet of the goddess, watering them with abundant weeping, and sweeping the ground with her disheveled locks, entreated pardon of her divinity with numerous prayers. I beseech thee, says she, by thy fruit-bearing right hand, by the joyful ceremonies of harvest, by the occult sacred concerns of the cystae, by the winged car of thy ministrant dragons, the furrows of the Sicilian soil, the rapacious chariot, and the detaining earth, by the dark descending ceremonies attending the marriage of Persephone, and the ascending rites which accompanied the luminous discovery of thy daughter, and by other arcana which Eleusis, the attic sanctuary, conceals in profound silence, support the soul of Psyche, thy suppliant. Suffer me to conceal myself in that heap of corn for a few days, till the raging anger of so great a goddess is mitigated by time or at least permit me to stay here to my bodily powers, weakened by long continuing labor, become invigorated by an interval of rest. To this prayer Ceres thus replied, I am moved by your weeping supplications, and desire to assist you, but I cannot with propriety incur the displeasure of the kindred goddess, to whom I am united by an ancient league of friendship. Depart therefore from this temple immediately, and take it in good part, my not detaining and making you a prisoner. Psyche, being thus repulsed, contrary to her hopes, and oppressed with a double sorrow, retired from the temple, and in a dark grove of the valley, beneath the mountain, beheld a fane of elegant structure, and, unwilling to omit any way, though dubious, which might lead to better hope, and determined to employ the pardon of every god, she suppliantly approached the sacred doors. Here she perceived splendid gifts, and parts of garments interwoven with golden letters, fixed to the branches of the trees and the pillars of the temple, the letters signifying that these were votive offerings for the benefits received, and exhibiting the name of the goddess to whom they were dedicated. Then Psyche, throwing herself on her knees and embracing the altar, having first wiped away her tears, thus prayed, O oh, sister! and wife of the mighty Jupiter, whether thou dost possess the ancient temples of Samos, which glories in thy querulous infancy, or in thy nurture, or whether thou dost frequent the blessed seats of the happy Carthage, which adores thee as a virgin, riding through the heavens in a lion-yoked car, or dost preside over the illustrious walls of the Argives, near the banks of Inachus, which celebrate thee, now married to the thunderer, and the queen of the gods. O oh, thou, whom all the east venerates under the name of Zygia, and all the west denominates Lucina, be thou, Juno, the saviour of this my extreme misfortune, 
and deliver me, weary with the toils of such long continued labours, from the fear of my present impending danger, for I know that thou art accustomed voluntarily to relieve the distresses of the pregnant. Juno immediately presented herself to Psyche, supplicating, in all the august dignity of her divinity, and said, I would most willingly have my daughter-in-law, Venus, yield to your prayers, but decency will not permit me to act contrary to the will of Venus, whom I have always loved as my own daughter. Besides, the law forbids me to receive into my protection any fugitive servant without the consent of her mistress. But Psyche, now terrified with this second shipwreck of her fortune, and despairing of being able to recover her volatile husband, having laid aside all hopes of safety, thus consulted with her own thoughts. What other relief for my sorrows can now be either attempted or procured, since even goddesses cannot, though willing, afford me assistance? To what place shall I again direct my wandering steps, when entangled in such inextricable nets? Concealed in what habitations or darkness can I escape the inevitable eyes of the mighty Venus? Assume, therefore, a masculine mind, my soul. Bravely renounce all thy vain little hopes. Voluntarily surrender thyself into the hands of thy mistress, and try, though late, to mitigate her rage by the modesty of thy behavior. Besides, thou mayest perhaps find him in the house of his mother, whom thou hast so long sought for in vain. Being thus persuaded to enter on her dubious duty, or rather certain destruction, she considered with herself how she should begin her supplications to Venus. Venus, however, refusing to employ earthly remedies in her inquiries after Psyche, returned to heaven. She orders the chariots to be made ready, which Vulcan, having fabricated with subtle skill, arched like the horned moon, and precious with a waste of gold, had presented her before the consummation of her marriage. Four white doves, out of many that nestled about the bedchamber of their mistress, joyfully turning about their painted necks, assume the yoke, decorated with gems, and having taken up their mistress, gladly fly with her to heaven. The chariot of the goddess was attended by a flock of sparrows, wantoning with loud chirpings, and by other birds who sing sweetly, all of them announcing the approach of Venus in the most mellifluous notes. The clouds give way, the heavens unfold themselves to their daughter, and the lofty ether receives the goddess with joy. Nor does the singing family of Venus fear opposing eagles or rapacious hawks. Then, immediately, she directed her steps to the royal palace of Jupiter, and proudly demanded the necessary assistance of the vocal god Mercury. Nor did the azure bow of Jupiter refuse assent. Then Venus, accompanied by Mercury, joyfully descended from heaven, and in her flight thus anxiously addressed him, My Arcadian brother, you well know that your sister Venus never did anything without the presence of Mercury, nor are you ignorant how long I have sought in vain for my lurking female slave. Hence nothing remains to be done but for you to proclaim her in a public manner, and propose a reward to him that shall find her. Take care, therefore, that my commands are speedily executed, and clearly describe the marks by which she may be known, that no one may plead ignorance for the crime of unlawfully concealing her. At the same time she gave him a small volume, in which the name of Psyche was written, and every other particular respecting her, after which she immediately returned home. Nor was Mercury negligent in the performance of her commands, for, running everywhere, through all nations, he cried, in the following words, If any one can seize in her flight, or discover where a fugitive king's daughter, a servant of Venus, and of the name of Psyche, lays concealed, let him or her repair to Mercury, the crier, at the temple of Venus, Myrtia, and receive, as a reward of the discovery, seven sweet kisses from Venus herself, and one exquisitely delicious touch of her charming tongue. Mercury, having thus executed the proclamation of Venus, the desire of such a mighty reward, excited ardent endeavors in all mortals to obtain it, 
and this circumstance took away from Psyche all thoughts of any further delay. And now, as she approached the gates of her mistress, she was met by one of the servants of Venus, named Custom, who immediately exclaimed, as loud as she was able, At length, then, most wicked slave, do you begin to know that you have a mistress? And do you likewise pretend to be ignorant of the great fatigue we have endured in endeavouring to find you out? But it is well that you have fallen into my hands, for now you have entered within the very gates of hell, to receive, without delay, the punishment of such obstinate contumacy. After she had thus reviled Psyche, she audaciously twisted her hands in her hair, and dragged her along without resistance. But as Venus, as soon as she beheld her, thus brought into her presence, burst into a loud laugh, such as agitates those who are transported with vehement rage, and, shaking her head, at length, says she, have you thought proper to come and pay your respects to your mother-in-law? Or did you rather come to see your sick husband, who is yet dangerously ill through the wound which you gave him? But take courage, for your reception will be of such as a good mother-in-law ought to give. Where then, says she, are my servants, solicitude and sorrow? These, immediately attending, in obedience to the commands of their mistress, scourged and afflicted other torments on the miserable Psyche, and afterwards brought her again into the presence of Venus. Then Venus began laughing. Behold, says she, her swelling belly moves my compassion, since it is through this that she is to make me a happy grandmother. Happy indeed am I, who, in the very flower of my age, shall be called a grandmother, and the son of a vile slave shall be dignified with the appellation of the grandson of Venus, though indeed I foolishly call him my grandson, for marriage is unequal, and besides this, made in a village, without any witnesses, and without the father's consent, can never be deemed legitimate, so that thy offspring must be a bastard, even if I should suffer thee to bring him into the light. Having thus said, she flew upon her, rent her garments in many places, tore her hair, beat her on the head, and severely chastised her in various ways. Then, taking wheat, barley, millet, poppy seed, vetches, lentils, and beans, and mixing them in one globular heap, she thus spoke to her. You seem to me a servant so deformed as to be incapable of deserving your lover by any other means than the diligent performance of menial employments. I will, therefore, make trial of your abilities as a housewife. Take and separate this mass of seeds, and having properly disposed the several grains apart from each other, give me a proof of your expedition, by finishing the task before evening. Thus spoke Venus, and immediately after, departed to a wedding supper. But Psyche, astonished at the prodigious command, sat silent and stupid, without moving a hand to the disordered and inexorable mass. Then a little ant, a native of the fields, vehemently commiserating such prodigious difficulty and labor, and execrating the stepmother's cruelty towards the wife of the mighty god Cupid, rapidly summoned together the populous tribe of neighboring ants, and thus addressed them, Take pity, ye active nurslings of the all-parent earth, take pity, and with prompt celerity assist the wife of love, a beautiful young woman who is now in a dangerous situation. Immediately the six-footed people rushed forth to her assistance in undulating tribes, and with the utmost diligence separated the whole heap, grain by grain, and having properly sorted the confused mingled species, rapidly vanished from her sight. But Venus, on the commencement of night, returns from the nuptial banquet, moist with wine, fragrant with rich ointments, and having her body elegantly bound with shining roses and as soon as she saw the diligence which had been exerted on the wonderful labor, Most vile creature, said she, this is not the work of your hands, but of his, whom, to your own and his own misfortune, you have pleased. And, throwing her a piece of household bread, she retired to rest. In the meantime, Cupid was very closely confined to his bedchamber, in the interior part of the house, 
partly lest he should injure his wound by petulant luxury, and partly lest he should associate with his beloved. Thus the lovers, being separated from each other under one roof, passed away, exhausted with grief, the cruel night. But as soon as Aurora had ushered in the morning, Venus, having called Psyche, thus addressed her. Do you perceive yonder grove which stretches itself to a considerable distance along the margin of a river, whose deepest whirlpools look down upon a neighboring fountain? There shining sheep of a golden color wander about, feeding without a shepherd. I think it fit that you should bring me immediately a flock of that precious wool, whatever may be the difficulty of procuring it. Psyche willingly rose, but not with any intention of executing this command, but to procure rest from her misfortunes, by hurling herself headlong from the rock into the river. But when she came to the brink, a reed, the sweet nurse of music, being divinely inspired, thus prophetically spoke in soft and harmonious murmurs, Psyche, exercised in mighty sorrows, neither pollute my sacred waters by thy most miserable death, nor yet venture to approach the formidable sheep on the opposite bank, while, borrowing heat from the burning radiance of the sun, they are transported with savage rage, and are the destruction of mortals, either by their sharp horns, stony foreheads, or venomous bites. But when the meridian sun has driven the cattle to the shade, and the serene spirit of the flood lulled them to rest, then you may hide yourself under yonder lofty plane tree, which drinks of the same river with myself, and as soon as the sheep have mitigated their fury, on shaking the leaves of the neighboring grove, you will find the woolly gold everywhere sticking to the roots of the trees. Thus the simple and humane reed taught the wretched Psyche how to accomplish this dangerous enterprise with safety. Psyche, therefore, observing all the directions, found her obedience was not in vain, but returned to Venus with her bosom full of the delicate golden fleece. Yet she was not able to procure the approbation of her mistress by this her second perilous labor. But Venus, smiling bitterly with severe eyebrows, thus addressed her, I am not ignorant that you are not the performer of this task also, but I will now try whether you are endowed with a courageous mind and singular prudence. Do you see the summit of yonder lofty mountain, from which the dusky waters of a black fountain fall, and which, confined in the channel of the neighboring valley, irrigate the Stygian marches, and supply the hoarse streams of Cocytus? Bring me immediately in this little urn, liquid dew drawn from the most inmost influx of the lofty fountain. Thus speaking, she gave her a vessel of polished crystal, and at the same time threatened her more severely than before. But Psyche, with the utmost celerity, ascended to the very summit of the mountain, presuming that there, at least, she should find the period of her most miserable life. However, when she arrived at the confines of the vertex, she saw the deadly difficulty of the vast undertaking. For a rock enormously lofty, and inaccessibly rugged, vomited from its middle the horrid waters of the fountain which immediately falling headlong in winding streams, rushed suddenly through a narrow channel into the neighboring valley. On the right and left hand they creep through hollow rocks, over which the fierce dragons stretch out their long necks, and with unwinking vigilance keep a perpetual watch. And now the vocal waters shook themselves, and exclaimed as they rolled along, Depart! What do you attempt? Look and see what you do! Take care! Fly, or you will perish. Psyche, therefore, petrified through the impossibility of accomplishing the task, though she was present in body, was absent in mind, and being perfectly buried under the huge bulk of the inextricable danger, was even deprived of the benefit of tears, the last solace of the wretched. But the sorrow of the innocent soul is not concealed from the penetrating eyes of Providence. For the rapacious eagle, that royal bird of Jupiter, on a sudden flew to her with expanded wings, calling to mind his ancient obligations to Cupid, for enabling him to elevate to heaven the Phrygian cupbearer, Ganymedes, to Jupiter, and reverencing the divinity of Cupid, 
in the labors of his wife, deserted the lofty paths of Jupiter, and bringing with him seasonable assistance, thus addressed her. Can you, in other respects, of an undesigning disposition, and unexperienced in attempts of this kind, ever hope to steal one drop of this most holy and no less terrible fountain? Have you not heard, at least, that these Stygian waters are formidable even to Jupiter himself, and that, as you swear by the divinity of the gods, so they are accustomed to swear by the majesty of Styx? But give me that little urn. Immediately, therefore, taking it in haste, and poising it on his moving wings, he sailed between the cheeks of raging teeth, and the three forked vibrating tongues of the dragons, and steering his course to the right and to the left, drew off the reluctant waters, which previously admonished him that he might depart in safety, because he pretended that Venus herself wanted some of the water, and had ordered him to procure it. And on this account his access to the fountain was facilitated. Psyche, therefore, joyfully receiving the full urn, returned with the utmost celerity to Venus. Yet she was not able, even by the accomplishment of this dangerous enterprise, to appease the anger of the raging goddess. For, threatening her with still more severe endurance, she thus addressed her, a smile, the harbinger of ruin, accompanied her words. You appear to me to be a profound and malevolent magician, or you never could, with so much dexterity, have performed my commands. But there is one task more, my dear, which you ought to perform. Take this box, she immediately gave it to her, and direct your course to the infernal regions and the deadly palace of Pluto. Then, presenting the box to Persephone, say, Venus requests you to send her a small portion of your beauty, at least as much as may be sufficient for one short day for she has consumed all the beauty she possessed, through the attention which she pays to her diseased son. But return with the utmost expedition, for it is necessary that I should adorn myself with the beauty of Persephone, as I must go to the theatre of the gods. End of chapter 6, part 1「of the Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass, by Apuleius, translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter 6, Part 2. Psyche was now truly sensible that she was arrived at the extremity of her evil fortune, and clearly perceived that, all further pretenses being laid aside, she was impelled to immediate destruction, since she was forced to direct her steps to Tartarus and the shades below. Hence, without any farther delay, she ascended a lofty tower, that she might from thence hurl herself headlong, for she considered that she should thus descend by a straight road, and in a beautiful manner, to the infernal regions. But she was no sooner arrived there, than the tower suddenly addressed her in the following words, Why, O miserable creature, dost thou seek to destroy thyself by falling headlong from hence? And why dost thou rashly sink under this thy last danger and endurance? For as soon as thy breath shall be thus separated from thy body, thou wilt indeed descend to profound Tartarus, but canst not by any means return from thence. Listen, therefore, to me. Lacedaemon, a noble city of Achaia, is not far from hence. Near this city, concealed in devious places, seek Tenerus. From there you will find the cavity through which Pluto breathes, and the impassable road presents itself to the view through the yawning gates. As soon as you have passed the threshold of this cavity, you will proceed in a direct path to the palace of Pluto. You ought not, however, to pass through those sh shades with empty hands, but you should take a sop of barley bread, soaked in hydromel, in both your hands, and in your mouth two pieces of money. And now, when you have accomplished a good part of your deadly journey, 
you will meet a lame ass, laden with wood, with a driver as lame as himself, who will ask you to reach him certain cords to fasten the burden which has fallen from the ass. But be careful that you pass by him in silence. Then, without any delay, proceed to your arrive at the dead river, in which Charon, immediately demanding his fee, in his patched boat, ferries over the passengers to the farthest shore. Avarice, therefore, lives among the dead. Nor does Charon himself, nor the father Pluto, though so great a god, do anything gratuitously. The poor man, dying, ought to prepare his viaticum, and no one suffers him to expire without having any money at hand. To this squalid old man give one of the pieces of money which you carry with you, yet in such a manner that he may take it with his own hand from your mouth. While you are passing over the sluggish river, a certain dead old man, floating on its surface, and raising his putrid hand, will entreat you to take him into the boat. However, be careful that you are not influenced by an unlawful piety. Having passed over the river, and proceeded to a little distance from thence, certain old women, weaving a web, will request you to lend them a helping hand. But it is not lawful for you to touch the web. For all these, and many other particulars, are snares prepared for you by Venus, that you might drop one of the sops out of your hands. But do not suppose that this would be a trifling loss, since the want of only one of those sops would prevent your return to light. For a huge dog with three necks, and head sufficiently large and fierce and formidable, barking with his thunderous jaws, terrifies in vain the dead whom he cannot injure, and is always watching before the threshold and black palace of Persephone, guards the empty house of Pluto. Having appeased this dog with one of your sops, you may easily pass by him, and then you will immediately enter into the presence of Persephone herself, who will receive you in a very courteous and benignant manner, desire you to repose yourself on a soft seat, and persuade you to partake of a sumptuous banquet but seat yourself on the ground, and having asked for a piece of common bread, eat it. Then, telling your message, and receiving what you came for, bribe the cruelty of the dog by the remaining sop. Afterwards, having given to the avaricious ferryman the piece of money which you have reserved, and passed his river, you will return to the choir of the celestial stars. But above all things, I think you should be particularly cautious not to open or even look on the box which you carry, or explore that concealed treasury of divine beauty. In this manner, the propitious tower delivered its prophetic admonitions. Psyche, therefore, without delay, proceeded to Tenerus, and taking in a proper manner her pieces of money and her sops, ran down the infernal avenue. Here, having passed by the lame ass in silence, given the ferryman his fee, neglected the entreaties of the floating corpse, despised the fraudulent prayers of the spinsters, and lulled the rage of the horrid dog with a sop, she penetrated the palace of Persephone. Nor did she accept the delicate seat, or delicious banquet, but humbly sat at the feet of Persephone, and being contented with a piece of common bread, delivered her embassy from Venus. Immediately after this, she received the box, secretly filled and shut, and having barred the barking of the dog by the fraud of the remaining sop, and given the ferryman the other piece of money, she returned from the infernal regions much more vigorous than before. Then, enjoying and adoring the fair light of day, though she was in haste to finish her errand, she was seized with a rash curiosity. Behold, said she, what a foolish bearer am I of divine beauty, who do not even take the least portion of it, that I may by this means appear pleasing in the eyes of my beautiful lover. As she ended this soliloquy, she opened the box, but it contained no beauty, nor indeed anything, but an infernal and truly Stygian sleep, which, being freed from its confinement, immediately invades her, and oppresses all her members with a cloud of profound sleep, and detains her, fallen down in the very place where she opened the box, 
so that she lay motionless in nothing else than a sleeping corpse. But Cupid, being now recovered of his wound, and not enduring the long absence of his psyche, glided through the narrow window of the bedchamber in which he was confined, and having his wings invigorated by repose, flew far more swiftly than before, and dispelling the sleep from the prying fair, and again concealing it in its ancient seat, the box, roused Psyche with an innoxious touch of one of his arrows. And behold, said he, miserable creature, thou wouldest again have perished by a similar curiosity. Now, however, strenuously perform the task imposed on thee by my mother, and I myself will take care of the rest. Having thus spoke, the lover raised himself on high with the rowing of his wings, and Psyche immediately carried the present of Persephone to Venus. In the meantime, Cupid, wasting away through excess of love, and dreading the sudden severity of his mother, returns to his armory, and having, with rapid wings, penetrated the summit of heaven, supplicates the mighty Jupiter, and defends his cause. Then Jupiter, stroking the little cheeks of Cupid, and kissing his hand, thus addressed him. Though you, my son, endued with the authority of a master, never pay me that reverence which has been decreed me by the senate of the gods, but perpetually wound this breast of mine, by which the laws of the elements, and the revolution of the stars are governed, and frequently defile it with the earthly intrigues, contrary to the laws, the Julian edict, and the public discipline, injuring my reputation and fame by base adulteries, and sordidly changing my serene countenance into serpent's fire, wild beasts, birds, and cattle. Yet, remembering my own moderation, and that you have been nursed in these hands of mine, I will accomplish all that you desire and at the same time you must be sensible that you ought to guard yourself against your rivals, and to recompense me for this service by presenting me with any girl of transcendent beauty that may now happen to be upon the earth. Having thus spoke, he ordered Mercury immediately to summon all the gods to attend, and at the same time to proclaim that if any of the celestials was absent, he should be fined ten thousand pieces of money. Through fear of this, therefore, the celestial theatre being immediately filled, lofty Jupiter, sitting on his sublime throne, thus addressed the assembly of gods. Ye conscript gods, whose names are registered in the white roll of the muses, you are all well acquainted with that youth whom I have reared with my own hands, and the fiery impetus of whose first years I thought would have been restrained by some bridle or other. It is sufficient that he is every day defamed in conversation, for the adulteries, and all manner of corruption of which he is the cause. Every occasion of this is to be taken away, and his puerile luxury ought to be bound in nuptial fetters. He has made the choice of a girl, and deprived her of her virginity. Let him, therefore, hold her, let him possess her, and, embracing Psyche, always enjoy the object of his love. Then, turning his face to Venus, nor do you, my daughter, said he, be sorrowful on this occasion, nor fearful that your pedigree and rank will be disgraced by a mortal marriage, for I will now cause the nuptials not to be unequal, but legitimate, and agreeable to the civil law. Immediately after this, he ordered Mercury to bring Psyche to heaven, and as soon as she was arrived, extended to her a cup of ambrosia. Take this, said he, Psyche, and be a mortal nor shall Cupid ever depart from thy embrace, but these nuptials of yours shall be perpetual. Then, without the delay, the wedding supper was served in great abundance. The husband, reclining at the upper end of the table, embraced Psyche in his bosom, and in this manner Jupiter was seated with Juno, and after them the other gods and goddesses in their proper order. Then Jupiter was presented with a bowl of nectar, which is the wine of the gods by that rustic youth, Ganymedes, his cup-bearer. But Bacchus supplied the rest. Vulcan dressed the supper. The hours purpled over everything with roses, and other fragrant flowers. The graces scattered balsam. The muses sang melodiously, and Apollo accompanied the lyre with his voice. 
and Venus beautifully danced with steps in unison with the delightful music. The order, too, of the entertainment was that the muses should sing the chorus, and Satyrus play on the flute, and Paniscus speak to the pipe. Thus Psyche came lawfully into the hands of Cupid, and at length, from a mature pregnancy, a daughter was born to them, whom we denominate Pleasure. After this manner, that delirious and intoxicated old woman related these particulars to the captive virgin. I, however, who stood not far from her, lamented, by Hercules, that I had not the means of committing to writing such a beautiful fable. But behold, the robbers returned laden, having finished I know not what severe battle. Nevertheless, some of them, who were more prompt in mine, having left those that were wounded at home, that they might be cured of their wounds, were desirous of going, in order to bring away the other bundles of plunder, which, as they said, they had concealed in a certain cave. And having hastily devoured their dinner, they turned me and my horse into the road, intending to load us with those bundles, and striking us with staves, they led us, wearied, with many acclivities and windings of the road, towards evening, to a certain cavern, from whence they quickly brought us back, not suffering us to refresh ourselves for the smallest portion of time. They also hastened away with such great trepidation, that, frequently striking me, and impelling me against a stone which lay in the road, they caused me to fall down. In consequence of this, they scarcely suffered me to rise, being again struck with many blows, and severely hurt in my right leg and left hoof. On this occasion, one of them said, How long shall we feed in vain this ruptured ass, who now also is lame? And another said, He came into our house with an ill omen, and from that time we have not obtained any considerable gain, but we have only suffered blows, and the loss of our bravest associates. Another again observed, Certainly, as soon as he is brought home, though unwillingly these burdens, I will immediately hurl him headlong, that he may become most delectable food for vultures. While those mildest of men debate with each other about my death, we had now reached our home, for fear had made wings of my hoofs. Then, having hastily removed our burdens, and paying no attention to our safety, not even thinking of my death, but taking with them the associates whom they had before left at home wounded, they immediately entered into their place of abode, in order to relate, as they said, the tediousness produced by our tardity. Nevertheless, I was not a little tormented by the contemplation of the death with which I was threatened, and I said to myself, Why dost thou stand still, O Lucius? Or why do you now wait for the last calamity that can befall you? Death, and that of the most cruel kind, is decreed for you by the robbers, nor is the accomplishment of the thing attended with any great difficulty. Do you not perceive those neighboring precipices, and in these sharp and prominent rugged rocks, which, penetrating into you, wherever you may fall, will cause a disruption of your members? For that illustrious magic of yours has alone given to you the face and labors of an ass, but has surrounded you not with the thick hide of that animal, but with the delicate skin of a horse-leech. Why do you not, therefore, assume a masculine mind, and consult your safety why you are permitted so to do. An excellent opportunity of flight will be afforded you during the absence of the robbers. Are you afraid of the vigilance of a half-dead old woman, whom you may bring to an end with one blow of your lame foot? But whither shall I fly, or who will receive me under his roof? This cogitation, indeed, of mine is stupid and perfectly asinine. For what traveller would not gladly take away with him a beast on whom he might ride? Notwithstanding, however, this conference with myself, I immediately, with a strong effort, broke the thong by which I was tied, and hurried away with the swiftness of a quadruped. Yet I could not escape the sharp eyes of the crafty old woman, for, as soon as she saw me free, assuming a boldness above her sex and age, she laid hold of the thong and endeavored to lead me back again. I, however, being mindful of the deadly purpose of the robbers, was not influenced by any pity, but immediately threw her on the ground, 
by striking her with the hooves of my hind feet. But she, though prostrate on the earth, nevertheless tenaciously held by the thong, so that for a short time she followed, in consequence of being drawn by me. She also immediately began, with clamorous howlings, to implore the assistance of a stronger hand. But she in vain endeavoured to procure help by her lamentations, for there was none but the captive virgin alone that could afford her aid, who, being excited by the clamour, ran out of the cave, and saw by Hercules a most remarkable spectacle, the old woman, Dursi, hanging not from a bull, but from an ass. But the virgin, assuming a virile fortitude, dared to engage in a beautiful enterprise. For, resting the thong from the hands of the old woman, she restrained my impetus with bland words, and strenuously got on my back, and again incited me to hasten away. And I, impelled by the desire of a voluntary flight, and at the same time by a wish to liberate the virgin, and also by the incitement of the blows with which she frequently admonished me, beating the ground in my quadruped course with an equestrian celerity, I endeavoured, by braying, to answer the delicate words of the virgin. Sometimes also turning my neck and pretending to scratch my back, I kissed the beautiful feet of the virgin. Then she, profoundly sighing and looking to heaven with a solicitous countenance, O ye gods, she said, give at length assistance to me in my extreme danger, and thou, O more cruel fortune, now cease to be severe. You have been sufficiently appeased by my miserable torments, and you, addressing herself to me, who are the defence of my liberty and of my life, if you bring me home safe and restore me to my parents and my beautiful lover, what thanks shall I not give you? What honours shall I not bestow upon you? And what food shall I not afford you? For in the first place I will adorn that mane of yours, after it has been well combed with my virgin necklaces, and after having curled the hairs that hang over your forehead, I will gracefully separate them, and will, with all diligence, comb the hairs of your tail, which, through negligence, are intricate and rough, decorating also you, who are my preserver, with many golden ornaments, which will cause you to be resplendent like the celestial stars, and, leading you in triumph, while the people joyfully follow, I will daily fatten you by bringing you nuts and milder foods in my silken apron. But neither, amidst that delicate food, profound leisure, and the blessedness of the whole of your life, shall a glorious dignity be wanting to you. For I will have a perpetual monument of my present fortune and of divine providence, and I will dedicate in the vestibule of my house an image of my present flight, depicted in a tablet. This history also, though rude, shall be narrated in fables, and delivered to posterity in the writings of the learned, viz. the history of a royal virgin flying from captivity on the back of an ass you shall likewise be numbered among the miracles of antiquity. For, from the example of your true history, we shall believe that Phrixus swam, sat on a ram, that Arian piloted a dolphin, and that Europa sat on a bull. And if Jupiter truly lowed under the form of a bull, something also may be concealed in my ass, either a human countenance or the resemblance of the gods. While the virgin often repeats this, and mingles frequent sighs with her vows, we came to a certain place where three roads met, and then she, seizing me by the cord which was tied about my head, greatly desired to lead me into the road on the right hand, because that would conduct her to her parents. But I, who knew that the robbers had taken that path in order to bring away the remainder of their spoil, strenuously resisted and thus silently in my own mind expostulated with her. What are you doing, O unhappy virgin? What do you attempt? Why do you hasten to Hades? And what is it which you strive to effect with my feet? For you will not only be the cause of your own, but likewise of my destruction. Thus, while we were contending to go in different directions, and dispute concerning the lordship of the ground and the division of the path, 
as if in a legal process about the limits of land, the robbers, burdened with their plunder, perceived us, and knowing us at a considerable distance by the light of the moon, saluted us with a malignant laugh, and one of their number thus addressed us. Whither, with hasty steps, are you proceeding by moonlight, and do not fear the shades and ghosts that are seen at a more advanced period of the night? Do you hasten, O oh, most excellent virgin, to visit your parents privately? But we will afford a defense to your solitude, and will point out to you a shorter way to your friends. He had no sooner said this, than, extending his hand, and seizing my reins, he turned me back again, and was not sparing in beating me cruelly with the knotted staff which he carried in his hand. Then I, unwillingly, returned to prompt destruction, recollected the pain in my hoof, and began with an inclining head to walk lame. He, however, who turned me back, said, So then do you again stumble and stagger? And are your rotten feet able to fly away, but know not how to walk? A little before this, however, you were surpassed the winged celerity of Pegasus. While this beneficent associate thus jested with me, at the same time beating me with his staff, we had now arrived at the outward enclosure of the robber's abode, and behold, we found that old woman, with a rope tied about her neck, suspended from a certain branch on a lofty cypress tree. But the robbers, taking her from thence, immediately precipitated her, bound her with her own rope, and, having put the virgin in chains, immediately precipitated her, bound with her own rope, and, having put the virgin in chains, they attacked, with savage minds, the supper which the unhappy old woman had prepared for them with posthumous diligence. And while they devour everything with greedy ferocity, they now began to deliberate with themselves about our punishment, and their own revenge, and their opinions were various, as is usually the case in a turbulent crowd. Hence the first of them that spoke thought that the virgin should be burnt alive. The second persuaded them to expose her to wild beasts, and the third was of the opinion that she should be crucified, and the fourth that she ought to be mangled by various torments. She was, however, certainly condemned to die by the suffrage of all of them. Then one of them, having appeased the tumult of all the rest, thus began to speak in mild language. It does not accord with the ordinances of our association, nor with the clemency of each of us, nor indeed with my moderation, to suffer you to inflict punishment without measure, which exceeds the magnitude of the crime, nor that you should employ for this purpose wild beasts, or the cross, or fire, or torments, or invoke the hasty darkness of a rapid death. Listening, therefore, to my counsel, grant life to the virgin, but that life which she deserves. Nor can you forget what you some time ago decreed respecting that ass, who was always sluggish, indeed, but a prodigious eater, and who now also, through the deception of a fictitious debility, was the instrument and servant of the virgin's flight. It will be well, therefore, to cut his throat to-morrow, and having taken away all his intestines, to sew up the virgin naked in the middle of the belly of the ass, whom she has preferred to us, so that, her face alone being outwardly apparent, the ass may confine, in the beastly embrace of his belly, the rest of her body. Then let the ass, in which the virgin is thus sewn up, be exposed on some stony rock, to the heat of the burning sun. Thus both of them will suffer everything which you have rightly decreed. For the ass will suffer death, which he has long ago deserved, but she will endure the bites of wild beasts, when her limbs have been gnawed by worms, the flagrancy of fire, when the sun shall have burnt the belly of the ass with his excessive heat, and the torment of the cross, when dogs and vultures draw out her most inward viscera. But enumerate also the rest of her infelicities and torments. In the first place, she will remain alive in the belly of the dead beast. In the next place, her nostrils will be replete with the most fetid vapor. And in the third place, she will waste away with the deadly hunger of protracted fasting, and will not have her hands at liberty, by which she might procure for herself death. After he had thus spoken, the robbers go into his opinion, 
not with feet, but with their whole soul. Which decree, when I heard, with my great ears, what else could I do than lament that I should be a corpse upon the next day? End of chapter 6, part 2《and everything was illuminated by the splendid chariot of the sun, a certain person, who was one of the number of the robbers, approached, for it might be conjectured that he was one of them by their mutual salutations. This man, sitting at the entrance of the cavern, after he had recovered his breath and was able to speak, made the following narration to his companions. With respect to what pertains to the house of Milo of Hypata, which we lately plundered, we may now, having dissipated our solicitude, be secure for after you o most brave men had returned to our cave all the property of milo having been taken away by you i being mingled with the crowd of the citizens and resembling one who was grieved and indignant at what had happened observed what counsel would be taken for an investigation of the robbery and whether and to what extent they would inquire after the robbers in order that i might relate to you every particular conformably to your mandates and one lucius whom i know not was accused by the according consent of all the multitude as the evident author of the robbery and this not with dubious arguments but with probable reasons this lucius not long before by false commendatory letters feigning himself to be a worthy man firmly conciliated himself with milo as that being hospitably received by him he was ranked among the number of his intimate friends and when he had remained there not a few days having ensnared the mind of a maid servant of milo with false love he diligently explored the bolts and bars of the house and curiously surveyed those parts of it in which all the patrimony was usually deposited this also was considered as no small indication of the crime which he had committed that he fled on the very same night at the time of the robbery and has not been heard of since for an aid to his flight was easily supplied him by which, having more rapidly eluded his pursuers, he might still farther and farther conceal himself from their search, as he had taken with him his own white horse, on which he fled. Moreover, his servant was found in the same house, who, being accused as accessory to the felony and escape of his master, was, by order of the magistrates, committed to the common jail, and on the following day, having suffered many torments, and being tortured till he was almost dead, confessed, after all, nothing of this kind nevertheless many persons were sent to the country of that lucius in search of him in order that he might undergo the punishment of his crime as he was narrating these things i deeply lamented making a comparison between my ancient fortune and my present calamity and that once happy lucius and an unhappy ass it also occurred to me that men of ancient wisdom did not without reason feign and pronounce fortune to be blind and entirely deprived of eyes since she always bestows her riches on the unworthy and worthless nor ever judiciously makes any mortal the object of her regard but indeed is principally conversant with men from whom if she could see she ought to fly far away and what is the most extreme of all ills she causes opinions that are different from or rather contrary to our life to be circulated about us so as to enable the bad man to boast with the renown of the good man and on the contrary to cause the most innocent man to be punished after the manner of noxious characters 
lastly i whom she has most cruelly attacked by changing me into a beast and a quadruped of the vilest condition and whose misfortune may deservedly seem worthy to be lamented and commiserated even by the most iniquitous person am accused of the crime of having robbed my most dear host a crime which may not only be called a robbery but which every one may more rightly denominate a parricide yet i was not permitted to defend my cause or at least by uttering one word to deny it however lest i being present should seem through an evil conscience to consent to so wicked a crime i only wished being impelled by impatience to say non feci i did not do that deed and the former word indeed non i once and frequently roared out but the other word feci i could by no means pronounce but i remained uttering the former word and repeatedly vociferated non non though i vibrated my pendulous lips with excessive rotundity why however do i prolixly complain of the unpropitiousness of fortune since she was not ashamed to make me a fellow-servant and yoke mate with my horse who carried me and was my servant while i was fluctuating with these thoughts a concern of a more important nature engaged my attention viz the recollection that i was destined by the decree of the robbers to be a victim to the manes of the virgin and frequently looking down to my belly i seemed to myself to have the unhappy virgin enclosed in it but he who just before having narrated that false accusation concerning me having drawn out a thousand pieces of golden coin which he had concealed sewn up in his garment and which he had taken as he said from different travellers and had conscientiously brought to the common treasury began also anxiously to inquire concerning the welfare of his associates finding also that some and indeed all of the bravest of them had perished by various but strenuous deaths he persuaded them to relinquish the exercise of their, their profession for some time and rather apply themselves to searching after other associates and to supplying the deficiency of their former warlike band by the election of tyros from young men for he said those that were unwilling might be compelled by fear and the willing be incited by reward and that not a few abandoning an abject and servile life would rather wish to unite themselves to an association which possessed an authority similar to that of regal power that for his part he had some time since met with a certain man of a lofty stature young of vast bodily dimensions and of great strength and that he had at length persuaded him to apply to better purposes his hands which had become torpid through long idleness and to enjoy while he might the advantages of a prosperous condition of body nor extend his powerful hand in asking relief but rather exercise it in procuring gold all the robbers that were present consented to what he said and decreed to receive him into their society who now appeared to be a tried man and also to search after others who might supply the place of those they had lost then he going out and shortly after returning brought with him as he had promised a certain tall young man with whom i do not know that any who were present could be compared for besides the great bulk of his body he surpassed all the rest in height by the whole of his head and the down had just begun to creep on his cheeks and he was only half clothed with dissimilar pieces of cloth badly sewed together through the joinings of which his breast and belly with callous thickness endeavoured to burst forth thus entering all hail said he ye who are under the protection of the most powerful god mars and who are now become my faithful associates and willingly receive a man of magnanimous vigour who voluntarily joins himself to you and who more cheerfully receives wounds in his body than gold in his hand and who despises death which others dread nor think that i am a needy or abject man nor judge of my virtues from these rags for i have been the leader of a most powerful band and have in fact plundered all macedonia i am that famous robber hamus the thracian whose name whole provinces dread and am the offspring of thero who was an equally illustrious robber nourished in human blood educated among bands of men of this description and the heir and imitator of paternal virtue but i lost in a short space of time all the pristine multitude of my brave associates and all that great wealth for i attacked a factor of caesar as he was passing by oratum who had been the leader of two hundred men but was afterwards deprived of his employment through the malignity of fortune i will however relate in order the whole affair that you may clearly know it 
there was a certain person illustrious and conspicuous by the many offices which he held in the palace of caesar and who was also well esteemed by caesar himself cruel envy through the crafty accusation of certain persons hurled him into exile but a certain woman named platina who was his wife and who was a female of rare fidelity and singular chastity having given stability to the family of her husband by the birth of ten children spurned and despised the pleasures of city luxury became the companion of her husband in his flight and a partaker of his misfortune for this purpose she cut off her hair changed her dress so that she might appear like a man and being begirt with zones full of necklaces of the greatest value and of golden coin she intrepidly passed through the bands and drawn swords of the soldiers that guarded her husband a partaker of all his dangers sustaining an ever wakeful care for his safety and enduring continual labors with a masculine mind and now having vanquished the greater part of the difficulties of the journey and the dangers of the sea she went with her husband to zacynthus which their fatal destiny had decreed to be their temporary habitation as soon however as they had arrived on the shore of actium at which place we were then rowing about in our return from macedonia they went late at night to a certain cottage which was near the shore in their ship and there they slept in order to avoid the tossing of the sea in this cottage we attacked and plundered them of everything yet we did not depart without great danger for as soon as the mistress of the house heard the first noise of the gate she ran into the bedchamber and disturbed all that were in the house by her tumultuous clamours she likewise called on her servants by name and all her neighbours but it so happened through the general fear that we escaped with impunity each concealing himself through the terror produced on this occasion this most holy woman however for the truth must be spoken who possessed a singular probity and was beloved for her virtues immediately pouring forth her prayers to the majesty of caesar obtained both a speedy return for her husband and a complete revenge of the assault lastly caesar was unwilling that the band of the robber hamus should any longer exist and it was immediately destroyed so much can even the wish do of a great prince at length when by a diligent search of the emperor's army all our band was destroyed i scarcely saved myself and escaped from the midst of the jaws of hell after the following manner having clothed myself in the florid vestment of a woman which abounded in flowing folds and covering my head with a small woven mitre being likewise shod with those white and thin shoes which are worn by women and as it were grafted and concealed in the other sex i passed through the midst of the troops of hostile soldiers riding on an ass laden with sheaves of barley for they believing me to be a woman the driver of an ass granted me a free passage because at that time my cheeks being without a beard were graceful with puerile smoothness yet i have not degenerated from that paternal glory or for my fortitude though i was somewhat fearful in consequence of being placed in the midst of military swords being concealed however by the fallacy of a dress foreign to my sex and attacking by myself alone villas or castles i have procured for myself by plunder this small viaticum and immediately ripping open his rags he poured forth into the midst of them two thousand pieces of golden coin and behold said he i willingly offer to your band this largesse or rather gift and also myself to you if you do not reject my offer as a most faithful leader who in a short space of time will make this your house to be golden which is now stony the robbers without delay and without hesitation but with the suffrages of all of them unanimously elect him their leader they also brought forth a more costly garment which he put on throwing away his rich rags and having thus changed his attire and embraced each of them and being also placed in the highest part of the bed he was inaugurated by a supper and large bowls then by mutual conversation the robber knew of the flight of the virgin of my carrying her and of the monstrous death to which each of us was destined when also he had asked where the virgin was and being brought to her saw her laden with chains he departed in derision bending his brows and snuffing up his nose and said i am not indeed so stupid or at least so rash as to oppose your decree but i should sustain within myself the guilt of an evil conscience if i should dissemble what appears to me to be for your benefit but in the first place suffer me who am solicitous for your sake to speak boldly especially since if this my decision displeases you you may again return to what you have decreed concerning the virgin and the ass 
for i think that those robbers who are truly wise ought to prefer nothing to their own gain nor even vengeance itself which is often detrimental both to themselves and others if therefore you destroy the virgin and the body of the ass you will exercise nothing else than your own indignation without any profit to yourselves but i think that she should rather be brought to some city and there be sold for a virgin of her age may be sold for no small price for i myself some time ago knew certain bods one of whom might as i think give a great sum of money for this virgin and place her in a brothel suitable to her birth so that she may not be exposed to a similar flight she will also have afforded you some revenge when she becomes in bondage at a brothel i have sincerely offered this counsel to you as conducted to your advantage but you are the masters of your own counsels thus this advocate of the exchequer of the robbers and the excellent savour of the virgin and the ass pleaded our cause the rest of the robbers however tormenting my bowels or rather my miserable spirit by protracting their decision in long deliberation at length willingly acceded to the opinion of the new robber and immediately freed the virgin from her bonds and she indeed as soon as she beheld that young man and heard him mention a brothel and a bod began to be elated and to laugh most joyfully so that the vituperation of all the sex with good reason occurred to me when i saw a virgin who pretended that she was enamoured of a young lover and was desirous of a chaste marriage was suddenly delighted with the name of a vile and filthy brothel and then indeed the whole female sex and the manners of women depended on the judgment of an ass the young man however resuming his discourse said why do we not go and supplicate mars to be propitious to us in selling the virgin and searching for other associates but as far as i see we have not any beasts for sacrifice nor sufficient wine for drinking largely send with me therefore ten of our associates with whom i may go to the next castle and bring from thence for you sumptuous food so he having departed attended by ten of the robbers the rest prepared a great fire and raised an altar to the god mars from green turf not long after they returned bringing with them bladders full of wine and driving before them a great number of cattle from among which they sacrificed a large he-goat old and hairy to mars the secutor and associate and immediately a sumptuous supper was prepared then that stranger said you ought not only to consider me as the strenuous leader of your expeditions and rapine but also of your pleasures and accompanying his words by deeds he diligently performed everything that was requisite with wonderful facility he swept the floor made the bed smooth dressed the meat seasoned the collops and waited on them elegantly but he especially plied each of them and that frequently with large bowls of wine nevertheless sometimes pretending to fetch what he wanted he frequently went to the virgin and joyfully presented her with fragments which he had secretly taken away and cups of wine of which he had previously tasted but she most willingly received what he brought her and sometimes when he wished to kiss her recompensed his wish with prompt and sweet kisses which thing greatly displeased me and i said to myself alas o girl o virgin are you forgetful of your nuptials and of your reciprocal love do you also prefer this foreign and cruel homicide to the young man your husband who is unknown to me and to whom your parents have betrothed you nor does conscience stimulate you but trampling on affection does it please you to act libidinously among spears and swords what if the other robbers likewise should by some means or other perceive what you are doing would you not again return to the ass and again procure my destruction you in reality sport and are delighted with the danger of another person while i discussed these things with myself with the greatest indignation falsely accusing the virgin i knew by certain words used by them in their conversation which were dubious but not obscured to an intelligent ass that the young man was not the famous robber hamus but Tleptolemus, the bridegroom of the virgin for in the course of their conference fearing nothing from my being present he said be of good courage my dear charities for you shall immediately have all these your enemies in captivity and he refraining from drinking immoderately did not cease to supply the robbers in a still greater degree with wine now unmingled with water but made tepid by a moderate heat as they now began to be overwhelmed with inebriation and by hercules i suspected that he had mingled in their cups a certain soporiferous drug at length all of them without the exception of even one lay on the floor buried in wine 
and all of them were everywhere in a fit condition to be easily slain. End of chapter 7, part 1. Chapter 7, Part 2 of The Metamorphosis or Golden Ass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ted Garvin. The Metamorphosis or Golden Ass by Apuleius. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter 7, Part 2. Then, without any difficulty, Tleptolemus, having strongly bound them with ropes, and tied them together in such a way as he thought proper, placed the virgin on my back, and directed his steps to his own country, to which as soon as we arrived, the whole city was poured forth at the wished-for sight. Parents, kindred, retainers, bondmen, and servants joyfully ran out to meet us. You might see a procession of every sex and of every age, and, by Hercules, a new and memorable spectacle, a virgin triumphantly riding on an ass. In the last place, I also, being as joyful as I possibly could, in order that I might not be at variance with the present circumstance, as if I was not concerned in it, strenuously brayed, with erect ears and blowing nostrils, or rather I vociferated with a thundering clamor. With respect to the virgin, her parents received her into their bedchamber, and in the handsomest manner administered to her comfort, but Tleptolemus immediately brought me back from whence we came, accompanied by a great number of laboring beasts and of men. Nor did I return unwillingly, for being in other respects curious, I then also wished to be a spectator of the captivity of the robbers, whom we found, indeed, still more forcibly detained by wine than by fetters. Having taken, therefore, and brought out of the cave everything that was in it, and we, and all the rest, being burthened with gold and silver, Tlatelemus and his attendants rolled some of the robbers, bound as they were, into the neighboring precipitous craggy places, but they left others beheaded with their own swords. Triumphantly rejoicing in such a revenge, we returned to the city. And those riches, indeed, were deposited in the public treasury. But the virgin, who had been recovered by Tleptolemus, was given to him according to law. After this had taken place, that noble woman paid the greatest attention to me, whom she called her savior, and on the very day of her nuptials, ordered my manger to be completely filled with barley, and as much hay to be given to me as would be sufficient for a Bactrian camel. But what sufficiently dire excoriations could I imprecate on Photis, who had transferred me not into a dog, but an ass, when I saw all the dogs saturated and distended with the relics of the most abundant supper, and with the food which they had pillaged. After the first night, and the rudiments of Venus, the bride did not cease to mention to her parents and to her husband that she owed me the greatest thanks, till they promised that they would confer on me the highest honors. At length, therefore, their most intimate friends being convoked, they consulted after what manner I might most worthily be rewarded. One was of the opinion that I should be shut up in the house, and there, leading an idle life, be fattened with select barley, beans, and vetches. But the opinion of another prevailed, who regarded my liberty, and persuaded them rather to permit me to run in the plains and meadows, wantonly sporting among a gregarious multitude of horses, in order that I might procreate many mules, for the masters of the mares, by my gallant congress. The keeper of the horses, therefore, being immediately called, I was delivered to him, to be taken away, much having been previously said in my favor. And, indeed, I ran, triumphantly rejoicing, as I was now to have nothing more to do with baggages and other burdens, and having obtained my liberty, might find, at the beginning of the spring, some roses in the grassy meadows. It likewise frequently occurred to me, that, since such great thanks were given to, and so many honors conferred on me, though an ass, I should receive far greater benefits when I had recovered the human form. As soon, however, as that keeper of the horses had led me a considerable distance from the city, I obtained there no pleasure, nor indeed any liberty, for his wife, who was an avaricious and iniquitous woman, immediately tied me to the mill of a bakehouse, and frequently striking me with a leafy staff, prepared bread for herself and her family at the expense of my hide. Nor was she content to weary me for the sake of her own food only, but she also ground corn for her neighbors, by my circuitous labors, and made them pay for what was ground. 
nor did she even afford unhappy me the food for such great labours which had been appointed for me for she sold to the neighbouring husbandmen the barley which had been bruised and ground in the same mill by my circuitous perambulations but to me who had worked during the whole of the day at that laborious machine she only gave toward evening bran not purified and sifted and rough through a multitude of stones cruel fortune exposed me tamed by such miseries to new torments these that i should boast as it is said both at home and abroad of deeds bravely accomplished and full of glory for that excellent equerry complying though late with the mandate of his master for a short time permitted me to associate with the herds of horses but i being at length a free ass leaping with joy and wantonly walking with gentle steps chose out of the mares those which i thought would be the fittest for my concubines here however also more joyful hope gave place to extreme danger for the horses being satiated with food for the sake of copulating with the mares having been for a long time fattened and independently of this being formidable and more powerful than any ass fearing through me for themselves taking care to prevent a degenerate adultery and not regarding the laws of hospitable jupiter furiously pursued me as their rival with the greatest hatred this struck me with his anterior hoofs his ample breast being raised and his head and neck sublimely elevated but that turning his brawny back hurled against me his hind feet and another threatening me with malignant neighing letting his ears fall and showing his teeth which were white and sharp as spears bit me everywhere similar to this is that which i have read in the history of the king of thrace who exposed his unhappy guests to be lacerated and devoured by his wild horses for so sparing was that very powerful tyrant of his barley that he appeased the hunger of his voracious horses by the consumption of human bodies after the same manner also i being dilacerated by the various incursions of the horses wished again for those circuitous perambulations of the mill fortune however who would not be satisfied with my torments soon after procured for me another calamity for i was destined to bring home wood from a mountain and a boy who was perfectly depraved was appointed to drive and govern me nor did the arduous acclivity of the lofty mountain alone fatigue me nor did i alone wear away my hoofs by running on sharp stones but i was also frequently and severely beaten with his staff so that the pain produced by his blows remained fixed in my most inward parts and by continually striking me on the right thigh and always in the same place he occasioned the skin being burst a great ulcerous cavity or rather a trench or even a window yet he did not cease to strike the wound which was defiled with gore he likewise oppressed me with so great a weight of wood that you might have thought it was a burden prepared for an elephant and not for an ass but he as often as the load preponderating inclined to the other side instead of taking away some of the bundles of wood from the heavier and preponderating side and thus easing me by somewhat lightening the pressure or at least equalizing the weight on the contrary by the addition of stones remedied the inequality of the weight nor yet after so many miseries which i had endured was he contented with the immoderate weight of my burden but when we passed over a river which happened to flow by the way he being intent on keeping his feet dry would leap on my back which occasioned a little overweight to so great a mass and if by any accident i happened to fall through the pressure of the burden and the slipperiness of the summit of the bank from the clay mud this most excellent ass driver instead of extending his hand as he ought to have done and pulling me up by the headstall or lifting me by my tail and removing a part of the weight till at least i had got up again instead of this he gave me though i was weary no assistance but striking me with a very thick stick he left me entirely to pillus beginning from my head or rather my ears till the blows had excited me in the place of a remedy the same boy also adopted the following pernicious conduct towards me he tied to my tail the sharpest thorns which possess a venomous pungency and were compacted into a bundle by a flexible knot in order that they might be to me an pendulous torment so that being agitated and impelled by my walking they might cruelly wound me by their deadly pricking hence i labored under a twofold evil for when i withdrew myself from him and by running avoided his most cruel attacks i was hurt by the more vehement incursion of the thorns and if i stood still for a short time in order to spare the pain i was compelled by blows to go on 
nor did that most iniquitous boy seem to think of anything else than that he might by some means or other destroy me and that he sometimes threatened to accomplish accompanying his threatening with an oath and indeed it was evident that his detestable malice was stimulated to more baneful efforts for on a certain day when his excessive insolence had vanquished my patience i lifted up my powerful heels against him but then with a view to my destruction he devised the following wicked stratagem he brought me into the road heavily laden with a bundle of coarse flax hastily bound together with cords and placed in the middle of the burden a burning coal which he had stolen from the neighboring village and now the fire being nourished and becoming very hot through the slender excitation of the flax burst into flames and the deadly burning heat invaded me on all sides nor did it appear that there was any refuge from this extreme destruction or that any hopes of safety remained a burning also of this kind did not admit of delay nor afford time for better counsels a more joyous knot of fortune however shone upon me in my cruel circumstances but whether for the purpose of reserving me for future dangers or of liberating me from present and decreed death i know not for by chance perceiving a neighboring receptacle of muddy water produced by the rain of the preceding day i threw myself wholly into it with a precipitous impetus and the flame being immediately extinguished i departed from thence lightened of my burden and liberated from destruction but that most iniquitous and audacious boy ascribed also to me this his most wicked deed and affirmed to all the shepherds that i as i was passing near the hearths of the neighboring houses fell down with a staggering step and voluntarily drew the fire along with me he likewise added laughing at me how long shall we feed in vain this fire begotten ass a few days after this however he attacked me with fraudulent machinations of a most worse description for having sold at the next cottage the wood which i carried leading me along unladen proclaiming that he was unequal to the task of resisting my iniquity and refusing any longer the most miserable office of driving me to the mountain for wood he fabricated against me such complaints as the following do you see that sluggish most slow and immoderately asinine beast besides other mischief which he has already done he now also torments me by exposing me to new dangers for whatever traveller he happens to see whether it be an old woman or a female that is now marriageable or a tender youth he immediately attacks them his burden through the incursion being deranged and sometimes thrown from his back this lover also longs after men and greatly desiring them when prostrate on the ground attempts illicit and unknown lusts and beastly pleasures and invites a backward venus to his nuptials pretending likewise to kiss he strikes and bites which conduct occasions us no small strife and quarrels and may also be imputed to us as a crime now too having espied a certain modest maiden the wood which he carried being thrown down and scattered he directed his furious impetus against her and this festive lover in the sight of all men longed to get on the woman who was prostrate in that very place on the sordid ground and had it not been for the assistance afforded by passengers in consequence of her lamentations and feminine demeanour who snatched and liberated her from the midst of his hoofs the miserable woman trembling and torn would have sustained a most painful death and would have left for us penal destruction by mingling other words with such like lies which were calculated to overpower more vehemently my modest silence he atrociously excited the minds of the shepherds to my utter ruin at length one of them said why therefore do we not sacrifice this public husband or rather this common adulterer by making him a victim in a way worthy of these his monstrous nuptials and do you o oh boy said he immediately cut off his head and throw his entrails to our dogs but reserve all the rest of his flesh for the supper of the laborers for having indurated his skin by sprinkling ashes on it we may return it to our masters and easily feign that he was slain by a wolf without delay the boy who was my noxious accuser and who was also the joyful executor of the decree of the shepherds triumphing over my evils and admonished by the kick which i gave him and which by hercules it grieves me to think was inefficacious immediately sharpened his knife on a whetstone in order to slay me a certain person however from among the crowd of those rustics said it would be wicked to kill so fine an ass and because he had been accused of luxury and amatory lasciviousness to be deprived of labor and service so necessary when otherwise by cutting off his testicles he would not by any means be able to indulge in venery and would liberate us from all fear of danger and would besides this 
become far more fat and corpulent for i have known many not only sluggish asses but likewise the most ferocious horses who being oppressed by the excessive heat of lust and who on that account were fierce and raging have afterwards by such an amputation of the testicles been rendered mild and not unadapted to carry burdens and have been capable of performing other ministrant offices lastly unless i give you my opinion in vain after a short interval of time has elapsed sufficient for me to go as i had determined to the next market i can bring from my home iron instruments adapted to this operation and immediately return to you and emasculate this ferocious and unamiable lover and by cutting off his testicles render him milder than any lamb by such a decision being snatched from the midst of the hands of pluto but reserved for extreme punishment i lamented and wept as one who was about to perish wholly in the extreme part of my body lastly i sought to destroy myself by continual fasting or by throwing myself down a precipice by doing which i should die indeed but should die entire and not mutilated and while i delay in choosing the kind of death i was to die that boy my destroyer brought me again in the morning to the accustomed road to the mountain and having tied me to the pendulous branch of a vast oak he went a little way out of the road in order to cut down with an axe wood which he might take away when behold a deadly bear crept out of a neighboring cave raising his surpassingly great head which as soon as i beheld trembling and terrified at its sudden appearance i drew back the whole bulk of my body on my hips and with my head elevated i burst the thong by which i was held and immediately betake myself to rapid flight precipitously likewise scampering down declivities not only with my feet but with my whole projected body i ran into the plains extended under the mountain flying with all my might from that savage bear and from the boy still more cruel than the bear then a certain traveller beholding me alone and wondering seized me and hastily getting on my back and striking me with a staff which he carried in his hand led me through a winding and unknown path nor did i unwillingly betake myself to flight escaping from the most atrocious dismembering of my virility indeed i was not very much affected by the blows because i was accustomed by my destiny to be beaten with sticks but fortune spitefully obstinate and tormenting me outstripping with a miserable celerity my opportune retreat prepared for me new snares for the shepherds to whom i belonged searching for a cow which they had lost and wandering for this purpose through different places happened to meet with us and immediately seizing my bridle which they knew endeavoured to lead me away the traveller however that rode on me resisting with strenuous boldness invoked as a witness to the faith of men and gods and why said he do you violently drag me along why do you invade me to which they replied do we unjustly apprehend you who surreptitiously led away our ass why do you not rather tell us where you have concealed the boy who was the driver of the ass and whom you have doubtless slain and immediately throwing him on the ground striking him with their fists and bruising him with their heels he began to swear that he had seen no driver of the ass but merely made use of the ass as it was running sat at liberty and alone for the purpose of obtaining a reward for finding it but with the intention of restoring it to its master and oh that the ass said he which i wish i had never seen could utter a human voice and give testimony to my innocence certainly you will repent of the whole of this injury which you have done me from this asseveration however he derived no advantage for those turbulent shepherds brought him back bound by the neck toward the forest of that mountain whence the boy was accustomed to fetch his wood nor was he to be found in any part of the country but his body only was seen dilacerated in fragments and dispersed in many places which i very well knew was done by the teeth of that large bear and by hercules i should have said what i knew if the faculty of speaking had been afforded me but i did that which i could alone do viz i rejoiced silently in the vengeance though late which had been inflicted having also at length found the whole of the dead boy the members of which were dispersed and having with great difficulty adapted them to each other they buried the body in the same place but accusing my belliferon as one who had undoubtedly led me away and as a cruel homicide they brought him in the meantime bound into their cottages in order as they said that he might on the following day be taken before a magistrate and be delivered to punishment in the meantime while the parents of the boy searched for him with great lamentation and weeping behold a rustic approached 
abiding by his promise and requiring the accomplishment of my destined castration and one of the rustics said our present loss is not from the lasciviousness of this ass but indeed it is our pleasure not only to deprive this most iniquitous ass to-morrow of his virility but also of his head nor will the assistance of those who were lately engaged in searching for the members of the boy be wanting to you in this business and thus it came to pass that my destruction was deferred to another day but i gave thanks to that worthy boy that at least by his death he had occasioned the delay of one day to my disruption nevertheless not even the smallest portion of time was granted to my gratulation or to my quiet for the mother of the boy deploring the bitter death of her son burst into my stable lamenting and weeping attired in a morning vesture and tearing with both her hands her hair sprinkled with ashes loudly bewailing also vociferating from the gate of her house and vehemently beating her breast she began to speak as follows and now that careless ass intent on the manger is subservient to his veracity and by perpetually eating distends his insatiable and profound belly nor does he pity my sorrow or call to his remembrance the detestable end of his dead master but indeed he despises and scorns my old age and my infirmities and believes that he shall not be punished for so great a wickedness perhaps however he presumes that he is innocent for to hope for security contrary to the dictates of even a noxious conscience is in unison with the most iniquitous endeavours for o faith of the gods though the use of speech should be granted for a time to thee most wicked of quadrupeds yet how is it possible that you could persuade even the most foolish person that such an atrocious deed was committed without your concurrence since you might have fought with your feet and prevented by biting the slaughter of the unhappy boy or is it to be admitted that you could frequently attack him with your heels and that you could not defend him with a similar alacrity when he was about to die certainly you ought to have immediately received him on your back and snatched him from the bloody hands of a deadly robber lastly you ought not to have fled alone deserting and shaking off your back him who was your fellow-servant your leader your companion and your shepherd are you ignorant that it is usual to punish those also who have refused to give salutary aid to such as were perishing because this their refusal is contrary to good manners but o oh, homicide you shall no longer rejoice at my calamities for i will make you to know that natural strength is present with miserable grief and having thus said she untied her girdle and having bound my feet with it apart from each other she fastened them very firmly with it in order that nothing might prevent the execution of my punishment then taking a long pole which served as a bar to the doors of the sable she did not cease to beat me with it till becoming weary and her strength being vanquished the staff fell from her hands which were overpowered by its weight then complaining of the too rapid weariness of her arms she ran to the fire and taking from it a burning coal she thrust it between my thighs till employing the only defence which remained for me i defiled her face and eyes with liquid dung emitted by a compression of my fundament thus by the blindness and fetid smell which this produced i escaped destruction for otherwise an ass had perished like another meleager by the burning firebrand of the delirious althea End of chapter 7、chapter、eight, part one of the metamorphosis or golden ass this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by anna simon the metamorphosis or golden ass by apuleius translated by thomas taylor chapter 8 part 1 at that time of the night in which the cocks crow a certain young man came from the next city who appeared to me to be one of the servants of that virgin charity who had endured equal sorrows with myself among the robbers he sitting near the fire in the company of his fellow-servants related as follows the wonderful and execrable particulars of her death and the destruction of the whole of her house ye equerries shepherds and cowards we have lost the miserable charity and by a most grievous casualty yet she did not depart to the shades alone but that all of you may know the particulars i will narrate to you from the beginning what happened and which deserves to be committed to writing in the form of a history by a more learned man on whom fortune has conferred the ability of writing with facility and elegance there was a young man in the next city whose name was thrasyllus of noble birth 
an illustrious knight, and at the same time very rich, but he was a man addicted to the luxury of taverns, and to harlots, and potations by day. On this account he iniquitously associated with the factious bands of robbers, and his hands also had been occasionally dyed with human blood. Such was the man, and such was the report concerning him. But he, as soon as charity was marriageable, was among the number of her principal suitors, and most ardently endeavoured to obtain her in wedlock. And, though he surpassed in nobility all the rest of her lovers, and solicited her parents with splendid gifts, yet he was rejected by them, on account of his morals, and suffered the disgrace of a repulse. When, therefore, Charity, the daughter of my master, came into the hands of the worthy Tlepolemus, Thrasyllus, though disappointed in his hopes, yet firmly cherishing his love, and mingling indignation with it, on account of his rejected suit, sought for an opportunity of perpetrating a bloody deed. At length, a seasonable occasion presenting itself, he attempted the wickedness which had for a long time been the subject of his thoughts, and, on the day in which the virgin had been liberated, by the cunning and fortitude of her spouse, from the deadly swords of the robbers, he mingled himself with the crowd of those that congratulated her, exulting in a remarkable manner, and rejoicing in the present safety and future offspring of the new married pair. Hence, being received into our house among the principal guests, as the nobility of his race demanded, he falsely assumed the person of a most faithful friend, concealing his wicked design. And now, becoming more and more dear, by assiduous narrations and frequent conversation, and sometimes also by eating and drinking with them, he unconsciously precipitated himself, by degrees, into a profound gulf of love nor is this wonderful, since the flame of love, at first be indeed being small, delights with a tepid heat, but afterwards becoming very fierce through the excitation of familiar conversation, at length wholly burns a man with immoderate heat. Hence Thrasyllus for a long time deliberated with himself how he might find an opportune place for clandestine conference, since he perceived that he was more and more excluded from the avenues to an adulterous intercourse by the multitude of observers, and that the most firm bond of a new and increasing affection could not be dissolved, and still further, that the ignorance of charity in the art of deceiving her husband would be an obstacle to her, even though she should be willing to gratify his passion. Notwithstanding Thrasyllus perceived all this, yet he was impelled by a pernicious obstinacy to effect that which he could not accomplish, as if he could. That, however, which was now considered as difficult to be done, seemed easy to be effected when love was corroborated by time. Lastly, consider, but I beseech you attentively consider, with what violence the impetus of furious lust burst forth. On a certain day, Tlepolemus went to hunting, together with Thrasyllus, for the purpose of searching after wild beasts. If, however, there is any savageness in goats, for Charity would not suffer her husband to hunt beasts that were armed with teeth or horns. And now, near a hill abounding with leaves, and umbrageous with a thick covering of branches, the passage to the plains being enclosed with nets, through the care of the husbandman, the dogs destined to the sagacious investigation of savage animals, were sent out to attack the wild beasts which happened to be there housed in their retreats. And immediately, being mindful of their crafty art, they divide among themselves, and surround all the avenues, and, first softly murmuring, on a signal being suddenly given them, they fill every place with loud and dissonant barkings. Nor did any goat or timid deer, nor a stag, which is milder than other beasts, rise from thence. But a large boar, and such as was never before seen, rushed out, having brawny and fat thighs, covered with a callous skin, a hide squalid with rough hair, bristled with thorns rising from his spine, foaming at the mouth, grinding his teeth with a crashing noise, emitting fire from his eyes with a threatening aspect, and laying waste everything like thunder, by the savage impetus of his raging mouth and in the first place, indeed, he slew the most eager of the dogs who approached the nearest to him, lacerating them with his tusks, which he extended in all directions. Afterwards, having trampled on the nets, he ran through them, to wherever his first impetus directed him. And all of us, indeed, being seized by fear, as we had been accustomed to harmless hunting, and were then also without arms, and without any means of defence, 
latently concealed ourselves under the taguments of leaves or behind trees. But Thrasyllus, having found a fit opportunity of acting fraudulently, thus insidiously addressed Tlepolemus. Why, being confused by stupor, or by vain fear, like these abject servants, or dejected by famine and terror, do we suffer so profitable a prey to escape our hands? Why do we not leap on our horses, and swiftly pursue this wild beast? Do you take a hunting spear, and I will take a lance? And, without the least delay, they immediately leapt on their horses, following with the greatest ardour the beast. But the boar, not forgetting his genuine vigour, turned back, and, burning with the fire of ferocity, and grinding his teeth, considered dubiously on whom he should first rush. Tlepolemus, however, first sent his spear into the back of the beast, but Thrasyllus, sparing indeed the boar, struck with his lance, and cut off the hind legs of the horse on which Tlepolemus rode, the horse reclining to that part from which the blood flowed, and being entirely laid on his back, unwillingly threw his master to the ground nor was it long before the furious boar attacked him as he was lying on the earth, and first lacerated his garments, but afterwards Tlepolemus himself, frequently biting him as he was rising from the ground. Nor did his good friend Thrasyllus repent of his nefarious undertaking, nor could he be satiated, though he perceived that satisfaction was made to his cruelty by so great a danger. But while he, being astounded, covered his wounded legs, and miserably implored his assistance, Thrasyllus drove his lance through his right thigh, and this he did more confidently, because he thought that the wounds which he had made with his lance would resemble the scissures of teeth. Nevertheless, he easily also transfixed the beast. The young man being thus slain, all of his servants were called from our retreats, and ran soaring, obedient to his call. But he, though his wish was accomplished, and though he rejoiced in the death of his enemy, yet in his countenance he concealed his joy, assumed a severe aspect, and pretended to be grieved. Embracing also with avidity the body which he had made a corpse, he craftily dissembled all the offices of mourners, but tears alone were unwilling to be shed. Thus conforming himself to the similitude of us who truly lamented, he fraudulently attributed to the boar the crime of his own hand. Scarcely, however, had this wicked deed been transacted when rumour divulged it, directed its first course to the house of Tlepolemus, and struck the ears of his unhappy wife. But she, indeed, as soon as she received this information, the like to which she had never heard, being deprived of reason and stimulated by madness, hurried through the populous streets and solitary fields, and ran like one of the furious Bacchae, pitifully bewailing the fate of her husband. A sorrowful multitude of the citizens assemble on the occasion, and those that meet follow her, mingling their grief with hers. The whole city likewise is deserted, through the desire of seeing the melancholy event. And behold, Charity runs to the dead body of her husband, and fainting, threw herself wholly upon it, so that she almost in that very place returned the life which she had devoted to him. But being with difficulty raised by the hands of her attendants, she unwillingly continued in existence. The remains of Tlepolemus, however, were brought to the funeral pile, and all the people attending the mournful procession. In the meantime, Thrasyllus began to vociferate excessively, and to beat his breast. And now, his joy increasing, he poured forth tears, which he could not do in the beginning of his feigned sorrow, and falsified truth itself by the many appellations of friendship which he used. For he sorrowfully called him his friend, his equal, his companion, and lastly his brother, at the same time also adding his name. Sometimes, likewise, he prevented the hands of charity from striking her breasts, endeavouring to appease her sorrow, to restrain her lamentations, to blunt the sharpness of her grief by alluring words, and to frame a web of solace from various examples of the instability of fortune. Nevertheless, he did not forget, amidst all his pretended offices of piety, his design of inveigling the woman, and nourished his own odious love by nefarious blandishments. As soon, however, as the funeral rites were finished, the woman immediately hastened to descend to her husband, and tried all possible ways of effecting her purpose. She certainly attempted that placid and tranquil method which requires no hostile weapons, but resembles gentle sleep. For at length, having concealed herself in profound darkness, she wasted away together with the light, through a miserable abstinence from food and squalid negligence, 
but Thrasyllus, through pertinacious importunity, partly by himself, and partly through the rest of her friends and necessary familiars, and also through the parents of charity, persuaded her at length to refresh her members with the bath and with food, as they were now almost in a decayed condition from paleness and filth. She, however, who in other respects revered her parents, unwillingly indeed, but yielding to a religious necessity, performed, as she was ordered, the offices of the living, not indeed with a joyful, but with a little more serene countenance, her mind, at the same time, being profoundly distracted with sorrow and grief. She likewise consumed whole days and nights in sorrowful desire, and worshipping with divine honours, and with assiduous reverence, the image of her dead husband, which she had formed so as to resemble the god Bacchus, she tormented herself by that solace of her woe. But Thrasyllus, being precipitate and rash, before tears had satiated her grief, and the fury of a disturbed mind was mitigated, and before sorrow had vanished by the long duration of its vehemence, did not hesitate to speak to her about wedlock, while she was yet lamenting her husband, while she was yet lacerating her garments, and was yet tearing her hair and thus impudently disclosed the silent secrets of his breast, and his ineffable stand. Charity, however, abhorred and detested his wicked suit, and she sunk down and lost all sense, as if she had been struck by violent thunder, and by the influence of some baneful star, or by the lightning of Jupiter. But after a certain interval of time, gradually recovering her spirits, she reiterated her wild clamours, and when she saw the scene which the most iniquitous Thrasyllus had prepared, she deferred the desire of the petitioner to the examination of counsel. Then, during the delay which this occasioned, the shade of the miserably slain Tlepolemus, lifting up his face, defiled with gore, and deformed by paleness, interrupted the chaste sleep of his wife, by thus addressing her. "'My dear wife,' by which appellation it is not lawful for you to be called by any other person, if the memory of me still remains in your breast, or if the calamity of my bitter death dissolves the compact of our love, marry more felicitously some other person. Only do not connect yourself with that sacrilegious Thrasyllus, nor speak to, nor recline at the same table, nor repose in the same bed with him. Avoid the bloody right hand of my murderer, and do not commence your nuptials from parricide. Those wounds, the blood of which these tears of yours have washed away, are not wholly the wounds inflicted by the teeth of the boar, but the lance of the wicked Thrasyllus has separated me from thee. He also added the rest, and disclosed the whole of the wicked scene. But she, as soon as, still sorrowing, she began to close her eyes in sleep, impressing her face on the bed, moistened her beautiful cheeks with flowing tears, even in her sleep, and being excited by this vision, as by some warlike machine from her unquiet rest, she renewed her sorrow, and for a long time loudly lamented, and tearing her undergarment, she beat her graceful arms with her cruel hands. Nevertheless, not communicating to any one her nocturnal visions, but entirely dissembling the indication of the wicked deed, she determined with herself to punish the most iniquitous murderer, and silently withdraw herself from a miserable life. Again, then, behold the detestable suitor of improvident pleasure was present, assailing ears that were close to nuptial petitions. But she, mildly rejecting the request of Thrasyllus, and dissembling her design with admirable cunning, replied as follows, to him urging and suppliantly requesting her consent. That beautiful face of your brother, that is, of him whom you call brother, and of my most dear husband, is yet familiarly present to my eyes, as yet the fragrant odour of his sweet body runs through my nostrils, as yet the beautiful Tlepolemus lives in my breast. You will do well, therefore, if you grant to a most miserable woman an interval of time necessary to legitimate grief." till the remaining space of the year is completed by the residual months. And this is a thing indeed which both regards my modesty and your salutary advantage, lest by acting otherwise we should happen to excite by immature nuptials the shade of my husband, rendered severe through a just indignation to the destruction of your safety. Thrasyllus, however, not being recalled to prudence and moderation by this speech, nor being at least renovated by the seasonable promise, 
did not cease frequently to urge charity with the base murmurs of his pestiferous tongue, till at length she, pretending that she was vanquished, said, However, my Thrasyllus, it is necessary that you should earnestly comply with this my request, that we may in the interim be secretly and silently connected with each other, and that no one of the domestics may perceive it till the expiration of the remaining days of the year. Thrasyllus yielded to the promise of the fallacious woman, most willingly consented to the proposal of a clandestine connection, and besides this ardently wished for the obscurity of night, making everything else a secondary consideration to the desire of enjoying charity. But charity said to him, Be careful that you come well disguised and without any attendance, and at the beginning of the night approach to my door, being satisfied with signifying by one whistle that you are there, waiting for my nurse, who shall watch for you at the bars of the gate, and, having opened it, shall receive you, and bring you to my bedchamber, without the testimony of any light. The apparatus of the deadly nuptials pleased Thrasyllus, and not suspecting anything sinister, but being disturbed by expectation, he only complained of the extent of the day and the prolongation of the night. When, however, the sun had given place to night, Thrasyllus being disguised conformably to the mandate of charity, and deceived by the fraudulent vigilance of the nurse, crept into the bedchamber with precipitate hope. Then the old woman, the nurse of charity, receiving him with blandishment by the command of her mistress, secretly bringing forth cups and a vessel filled with wine mingled with a soporiferous poison, and pretending that the delay of her mistress was owing to her attendance on her father, who was ill, she easily buried him in sleep by the frequent cups of wine which she gave him, and which he fearlessly drank. And now, he being in a condition in which he was exposed to all injuries, and lying supine, charity being called, entered, and raging, attacked him with a masculine mind and dire impetus, and stood over the homicide. Behold, said she, the faithful companion of my husband, behold the egregious hunter, behold my dear spouse, this is that right hand which shed my blood, this is the breast which contrived fraudulent stratagems to my destruction, these are the eyes which I have unfortunately pleased, which, nevertheless, now after a certain manner entering on future darkness, will antecede the impending punishment. Sleep securely, enjoy delightful dreams. I shall not attack you with a sword, nor with any other weapon. Far be it from me that I should wish to equal you with my husband by a similar kind of death. Your eyes shall die, you being alive, nor shall you seem to be anything except in sleep. I will take care to make you feel that the death of your enemy is more felicitous than your life. Certainly you shall not see the light, you shall be in want of the hand of a guide, you shall not embrace charity, you shall not enjoy your expected nuptials, nor shall you be recreated with the repose of death, nor delighted with the pleasure of life, but you shall wander between the infernal regions and the sun, like some ambiguous image, you shall for a long time explore the hand which deprived you of sight, and what is the most miserable of all things in calamity, you shall be ignorant of whom you ought to complain. I will pour out the blood of your eyes as a sacrifice at the sepulchre of my Tlepolemus, and I will send those eyes as a funeral offering to his sacred shade. But why, by my delay, do you derive any gain from the punishment which you deserve? and perhaps you now imagine to yourself that you are enjoying my embraces, which will be to you pestiferous. Leaving, therefore, the darkness of sleep, awake to another penal obscurity. Lift up your face, deprived of eyes, recognize my revenge, understand your misfortune, and compute your miseries. It is thus that your eyes are pleasing to a chaste woman, it is thus that nuptial torches have illuminated your bedchamber. You'll have the furies for your bridemaids, and blindness, and the perpetual stimulus of an accusing conscience for your companions. Charity, having thus prophesied, and taken from her head a needle by which she separated her hairs, she pierced with it wholly the eyes of Thrasyllus, and, leaving him entirely sightless, while, the cause of his pain being unknown, he shakes off ebriety together with sleep. She, seizing a drawn sword which Tlepolemus was accustomed to wear by his side, ran furiously through the middle of the city, and, longing to accomplish I know not what wicked deed, directly went to the tomb of her husband. But we and all the people, abandoning our houses, 
anxiously pursued her, mutually exhorting each other to wrest the sword from her insane hands. Charity, however, standing near to the coven of Tlepolemus, and driving every one away with her glittering sword, when she beheld the abundant tears and various lamentations of all the crowd, said, "'Seize this importunate weeping, and lay aside this grief which is foreign to my fortitude. I have taken vengeance on the cruel destroyer of my husband. I have punished the deadly robber of my nuptials, and it is now time that, with this sword, I should seek the downward path to my Tlepolemus. And having narrated in order everything which her husband had told her in a dream, and by what craft she had attacked the deceived Thrasyllus, having buried the sword under her right breast, she fell down, and rolling herself in her own blood, and in the last place, stammering words of an uncertain meaning, she breathed out her virile soul. Then immediately the friends of the miserable charity, having washed her body, restored her to her husband as a perpetual wife by burying her with him in the same sepulchre. Thrasyllus, however, becoming acquainted with all these particulars, and not being able to repay a death adapted to the present tragical event, and also knowing that his sword was not sufficient to expiate so great a wickedness, was voluntarily brought to the same sepulchre. There, too, frequently exclaiming, O oh, ye shades, hostile to me, behold your spontaneous victim is present! and, having diligently closed the doors of the sepulchre upon himself, he determined by fasting to emit his spirit, now condemned by his own decision. The servant of charity, profoundly sighing and sometimes weeping, told all these particulars to the rustics, who were very much affected by his narration. Then they, fearing the novelty occasioned by changing their master, and more deeply lamenting the calamity of the house of their lord, prepared themselves for flight but the keeper of the horses, to whose care I had been committed, with great commendation, brought out of the cottage whatever was very valuable, and which he had kept concealed in it, and having laden me, and the other labouring beasts with it, he left his pristine habitation. We carried little infants and women, we carried pullets, geese, kits, and whelps, and, in the last place, whatever retarded our flight, by its infirm step, that also walked with our feet, that is, was carried by us nor did the weight of the burden, though it was enormous, oppress me, because I had left with a joyful flight that detestable amputator of my virility. When we descended to the arduous summit of a woody mountain, and had from thence descended into the plains beneath, the evening now darkening our path, we came to a certain populous and opulent castle, the inhabitants of which dissuaded us from our nocturnal, or even a morning aggression from thence. For they told us that numerous wolves, large, burdened with a great mass of flesh, and raging with excessive ferocity, were accustomed to prowl about everywhere, and infest by the rapine the whole of that region. They added that they also now lay in wait in those very roads, and attacked, like robbers, those that passed through them, and, moreover, that, being rabid through insane hunger, they assaulted the neighbouring villages, and that, in consequence of this, the death which is alone adapted to the most inert cattle now impended over the heads of men and lastly that the half-eaten bodies of men lay in the very road through which we must pass that everything was white with bones denudated of their flesh that on this account we also ought to proceed in that road with the greatest caution and to observe especially that in order to avoid the everywhere latent snares we should pass through those dangerous places in a troop not dispersed into small parties but compacted into one wedge and this when it is perfectly light when the day is advanced, and the sun is bright, and the impetus of dire beasts is repressed by the light. But those most iniquitous fugitives, our leaders, despising the salutary admonition, through the temerity of a blind fascination, and the fear of an uncertain pursuit, without waiting for the approaching light of day, forced us laden on our journey, nearly about the third watch of the night, that is, about midnight. Then I, not being ignorant of the before-mentioned danger, was careful to defend my back from the attacks of those wild beasts, by proceeding, as much as I was able, in the middle of the troop, and concealing myself among the labouring beasts which surrounded me. And now all the rustics wondered at my surpassing in velocity the other horses. That swiftness, however, was not an indication of my alacrity, but of my fear. At length I thought myself that the celebrated Pegasus was more swift through fear, and on this account was deservedly said to be winged, while he leapt upward, 
and rebounded as far as to the heavens, in consequence of dreading the bite of the ignivomous chimera. For those shepherds who led us had armed their hands as if they were going to fight. This man bore a lance, that a hunting spear, another a dart, and another a staff and they also carried stones, with which, from the rough road, they were largely supplied. Some likewise carried, in an elevated position, very sharp hedge-stakes, but most of them terrified the wild beasts by burning torches, and nothing but a trumpet was wanting to make our troop an army prepared for battle. Though, however, we in vain sustained that sufficiently empty fear, yet we fell into far worse dangers for no wolves came against us, either, perhaps, through being terrified at the compact multitude of young men, or certainly by the excessive light of the torches, or because they went elsewhere in search of prey, and not even at a great distance from us were any wolves to be seen. But the rustics of the village, near which we happened to be then passing, thinking that our troop was a band of robbers, and being sufficiently attentive to their own concerns, and fearful in the extreme, excited against us, with their usual clamours, and every kind of vociferation. Furious and large dogs, which were more cruel than any wolves and bears, and which they had very diligently nourished, with a view to their own safety. These dogs, besides their own genuine ferocity, being exasperated by the tumult of their masters, rushed against us, and pouring round us on all sides, leapt everywhere upon us, and, without making any distinction, lacerated at once both the labouring beasts and the men, and, after having for a long time assaulted us, they threw many of us to the ground. You might have seen a spectacle, not by Hercules, so memorable as miserable, that is, a great number of dogs, some of which furiously seized on them that were flying, others attacked those that were standing still, and others leaped on those that were prostrate, and bit the whole of our troop as they passed through it. Behold, too, a greater evil followed our extreme danger, for those rustics suddenly rolled upon us stones from the tops of their houses, and from a neighbouring hill, so that we could by no means judge whether we should principally avoid the dogs who attacked us near at hand, or the stones which were thrown at us from afar, one of which, indeed, suddenly struck the head of the woman who sat on my back, but she, being moved by the pain produced by the blow, immediately weeping and vociferating, implored the assistance of the shepherd, her husband. He, however, invoking the faith of the gods, and wiping away the blood of his wife, exclaimed in a louder voice, Why do you so savagely attack and oppress us, miserable men and laborious travellers? Of what thefts are you afraid? What losses are you avenging? But you do not dwell in the caves of wild beasts, or in the rocks of barbarians, that you should rejoice in shedding human blood. Scarcely had he thus said, when immediately the thick shower of stones ceased, and the storm of the ferocious dogs was appeased on their being recalled. At length one of those rustics said, from the summit of a cypress tree, We do not act in this manner as if we were robbers, through the desire of obtaining your spoils, but we repel from ourselves the slaughter which we fear from your hands. Now, therefore, you may depart secure and in tranquil peace. Thus he. We, however, proceeded on the rest of our journey, being wounded in various parts of our bodies, one with stones, another with the bites of dogs, and all of us were violently hurt. End of chapter 8, part 1「Chapter 8, Part 2 of The Metamorphosis » Or golden ass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Metamorphosis or Golden Ass by Apuleius. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter 8, Part 2. After we had travelled to some distance, we arrived at a certain grove planted with lofty trees and delightfully pleasant, with open grass-plats. Here our leaders thought fit to rest a little, and refresh themselves with food, and also diligently attend to the cure of their bodies, which were wounded in various parts. Reclining themselves, therefore, everywhere on the ground, they first began to restore their weary spirits, and afterwards they hastened to apply different remedies to their wounds. 
This man repressed his tumours with wet sponges, but another bound his gaping wounds with bandages, and after this manner each of them paid attention to his own welfare. In the meantime a certain old man was seen from the top of a hill, whom the goats that were feeding about him evidently proclaimed to be a shepherd. Him, one of our company asked, whether he had any milk to sell, either liquid or coagulated into new cheese. But he, shaking his head for a long time, said, Do you now think of meat or drink, or in short, of any refreshment? Are you perfectly ignorant of the place into which you are come? Having thus said, he turned away, and departed far from us, driving along his sheep. These words, however, and his flight, produced no small fear in our shepherds, and while they, being terrified, long to inquire into the nature of the place, and do not find any one who can give them this information, another old man, who was tall indeed, but oppressed with age, wholly leaning on a staff, and drawing along his wearied steps, approached us in our journey, weeping abundantly. On perceiving us, also, he embraced the knees of each of those young men, and thus addressed them, the tears copiously falling as he spoke. I beseech you, by your fortunes and your genii, and so, by granting my request, may you arrive at the space of my old age, strong and joyful. Assist a debile old man, and restore him to me, from the realms beneath my little one, who is snatched from me at this advanced period of my life. For my nephew, and the sweet companion of this my journey, while accidentally endeavouring to catch a sparrow that was singing in the little hedge, fell into a ditch which was near him, and which was concealed by the shrubs that covered it, and his life is now in extreme danger. For I know by his weeping, and by the voice of him, often calling on the bird, that he is still living, but I am unable to assist him, on account, as you may see, of the infirm condition of my body. To you, however, it will be easy, through the possession of youth and strength, to succour a most miserable old man, and to preserve for me that boy, my last successor, and my only offspring. All that heard him, indeed, commiserated him, thus supplicating and tearing his hoary airs. But one who is more courageous than the rest, and also younger and stronger in body, and who alone had escaped unhurt by the preceding battle, promptly arose, and, inquiring in what place the boy fell, he, without delay, followed the old man, who pointed out to him with his finger a thicket of brambles, rough with thorns. And while we quadrupeds were refreshed by food, but the men by the attention they had paid to their wounds, every one taking his bundle, we resumed our journey. And, in the first place, they frequently and loudly called to the young man by his own proper name. But afterwards, being alarmed by his long stay, they sent one of their company to call him, who might search for and admonish him that it was time to depart, and might bring this their companion back with him. But he, having stayed for a short time, returned, and, trembling and pale, like the wood of the box-tree, related marvellous things of his associate. For he said that he saw an enormous dragon lying upon and eating their companion who was prostrate, and which had now devoured the greatest part of his body and that the miserable old man was not anywhere to be seen. On hearing this, and comparing it with the words of the shepherd, whom we had seen on the top of a hill, and who, doubtless, by his threats, admonished our people of that inhabitant of this region, and of no other, they fled most rapidly from that most noxious place, and drove us along, by frequently beating us with their staves. At length, having, with great celerity, finished a long journey, we came to a certain village, and there we rested through the whole of the night. And I am desirous of narrating an atrocious deed of a very memorable nature which I there heard. A certain servant, to whom his master had committed the whole protection of his family, and who was the bailiff of that most ample village at which we stopped, though he had a wife, who was a fellow-servant with him, pertaining to the same master, yet burned with the desire of enjoying a certain woman who was free and a foreigner through which adulterous love his wife, being stimulated by jealousy, burnt all her husband's account-books, and whatever was contained concealed in his storehouse. Nor was she content with having avenged the injury of her bed by this damage, but now, raging against her own bowels, she made a halter for herself, 
and bound with the same rope the little child which she had not long before brought forth from the same husband, and precipitated herself into a very deep well, drawing along with her the appendant infant. The master, however, of this woman and of her husband, being very much concerned for her death, seized the servant who had been the cause of his wife perpetrating so dire a deed, and firmly bound him, naked and wholly bedaubed with honey, to a fig-tree, in the putrid stock of which a multitude of ants had settled, and poured themselves forth from the earth in different directions. These, as soon as they perceived the sweet and honeyed odour of his body, entirely adhered to it by small, indeed, but numerous and continued bites, and so denudated his members by long torment from their eating his flesh and viscera, and thus consuming the whole man, that at length his bones were left bare and exceedingly white, and still remained fixed to the deadly tree. Abandoning also this detestable mansion, we again proceed on our journey, leaving the rustics in the greatest sorrow. And having travelled during the whole day, through level ground, we at length arrived, weary, at a certain populous and noble city. In this place those shepherds determined to dwell, and there to fix their perpetual habitation, because the city appeared to them to be a safe retreat from those who might search for them from a remote region, and they were also invited to settle there by the blessed abundance of provisions with which it was supplied. Lastly, having refreshed the bodies of us quadrupeds for three days, in order that we might appear to be more saleable, we were brought to the market, and the crier having proclaimed the prize of each of us with a loud voice, the other horses and asses were bought by opulent merchants. But I, being the only one that remained, was passed over by most of the merchants with contempt. And now, through the weariness arising from being handled by those who computed my age from my teeth, I seized, with my teeth, and shattered the filthy hand of a certain person, who frequently rubbed my gums with his putrid fingers, which thing deterred the bystanders from buying me as being most ferocious. Then the crier, when he had in vain spent his breath, and made himself hoarse in proclaiming me, began to compose ridiculous jests on my fortune. To what end, said he, do we in vain expose to sale this vile and old ass, the bile with worn-out hoofs, deformed in colours, ferocious in a stupid sluggishness, and who is nothing else than a bolter, or sieve, to separate meal from bran, through the numerous and wide apertures of his hide? Wherefore, let us give him to some one, if there is any one who will not be grieved to lose his hay." After this manner the choir excited the laughter of those by whom I was surrounded. But that most cruel fortune of mine, which, though I had fled through so many regions, I could not avoid, nor appease, by the evils which I had already endured, again turned upon me her blind eyes, and brought a buyer of me, found in a wonderful manner, and most adapted to my severe calamities. Here, therefore, what sort of a person he was? An old catamite, bald indeed, but having long depending hair, curled and half grey, one of those vile dregs of the people who compel the Syrian goddess to beg, carrying her about through streets and towns, and playing on cymbals and crotula or rattles. This man, desiring exceedingly to buy me, asked the crier from what country I came. But he announced me to be a Cappadocian, and sufficiently strong. Again he asked what was my age. But the crier, jesting, as if he had been speaking of a man, said, that a certain mathematician, that is, astrologer, who had made a scheme of his nativity, had declared him to be in his fifth year, but that he himself knew this better from his own profession. For though I know that I should incur the penalty of the Cornelian law if I should sell to you a Roman citizen for a slave, nevertheless what should hinder you from buying a good and profitable servant who may assist you both abroad and at home? That odious buyer, however, did not cease to ask one question after another and in the last place anxiously inquired about my mildness. But the crier to this replied, "'You see, not an ass, but a castrated ram, quietly disposed to all employments, not apt to bite or kick, but such a one as would induce you to think that a modest man dwelled in the hide of an ass, and this is a thing which it is not difficult to ascertain, for you may easily make trial of it by thrusting your face between his thighs, as you will then see how very patient he will show himself to be. In this ludicrous way the crier treated that halluo. 
But he, understanding the jest, said indignantly, May the all-powerful and all-parent Syrian goddess, and may the holy Sabasius, that is, Bacchus, Bellona, and the Idean mother, Sibyl, and also the sovereign Venus with her Adonis, cause you, O delirious crier, to be blind, and to become a deaf and dumb dead body, who, for some time past, have been employing against me scurrilous jests. Do you think, O stupid man, that I can commit a goddess to a ferocious ass, which, being disturbed, may suddenly throw off his back the divine image, and compel me, miserable man, to run with dishevelled hair, and search for some one who may raise my goddess from the ground, or repair the injury she may have sustained? On hearing this, it suddenly occurred to me to leap as if I was furiously insane, in order that he, perceiving me exasperated by ferocity, might desist from buying me but the buyer, who was anxious to possess me, prevented this my intention by immediately paying the sum of seventeen denarii, which my master rejoicing readily received, though to my abhorrence, and directly delivered me, tied with a cord of bulrushes, to Philibus, for this was the name of my new master. And he, taking me as a new slave, brought me to his house, and immediately exclaimed from the very threshold of it, Hello and behold, girls, I have bought for you a beautiful servant, and have led him hither. Those girls, however, were nothing more than a company of wanton dancers, who, immediately exulting for joy, raised dissonant clamours, with a broken, hoarse, and effeminate voice, thinking that some manservant had been in reality procured to wait on them. But when they saw it was not a stag that succeeded in the place of a virgin, but that an ass was substituted for a man, they, with turned-up nose, reviled their master in different ways, and told him that he had not brought a servant for them, but a husband for himself. They added, Mind that you do not keep this little ass solely for your own enjoyment, but make us also sometimes a partaker of the object of your regard. Thus, mutually babbling, they fastened me to the next manger. There was a certain young man, very corpulent and very skilful in playing on the flute for contributions of money, which were made by those that heard him, and who, abroad, preceded those that carried about the goddess, playing at the same time on his flute, but was a common catamite at home. This young man, as soon as he saw me in the house, willingly placed before me food in great abundance, and thus joyfully addressed me. At length thou hast come as my substitute in the endurance of miserable labour, and may you live long, and please our masters, and prevent any further exertion of my debilitated powers. On hearing this, I revolved my future new miseries in my mind. But on the following day they went out, clothed with garments of various colours, each of them having a deformed appearance, their faces being bedaubed with dirty pigment, but their eyes elegantly painted, and having small mitres on their heads, and wearing saffron-coloured, linen, and silken vestments. Some of them also had white tunics, painted with purple, diffused through all the parts like small lances, and girded underneath with a zone, and their shoes were of a saffron colour. They likewise placed the goddess, covered with a silken veil, on my back, in order that I might carry her, and having their arms bare as far as to their shoulders, and holding up very large swords and axes, they proceeded leaping like those possessed with bacchic fury and exciting insane dancing by the sound of the pipe. And when they had passed by not a few small cottages, they came to a certain village, the owner of which was an opulent man, and at their first entrance, vociferating with dissonant clamours, they fanatically rush into it, having their heads likewise for a long time in an inclined position, bending their necks, wantonly tossing their pendulous hair with a circular motion, and sometimes biting their muscles, they, in the last place, cut their arms with a two-edged sword which they carried. In the meantime, one of these was more largely seized with Bacchanalian fury, and fetching frequent and profound sighs, as if he had been filled with the divine afflages of the goddess, he pretended that he was seized with insanity. Just as men are accustomed through the presence of the gods not to become better than they were before, so far as pertains to the body, but to be rendered debile or diseased, in the last place, consider what reward he received through divine providence. He began under false pretense to blame and accuse himself with a clamorous prediction, as if he had perpetrated something contrary to the laws of sacred religion, 
and besides this he also required that a just punishment for his wicked deed might be immediately inflicted on him by his own hands seizing therefore a whip which it is usual for those half men to carry with them and which consists of twisted woollen fillets hanging down in long fringes and is checkered with many pastern bones of sheep he gave himself with it many lashes which were severe on account of the numerous knots of the whip being fortified with a wonderful firmness against the pain of the blows you might perceive that the ground was moistened with the filthiness of the effeminate blood which flowed from the cuts of the swords and the lashes of the whips which circumstance produced in me no small solicitude on my perceiving the blood copiously streaming from so many wounds lest the stomach of a foreign goddess should happen to desire asinine blood just as the stomach of some men wishes to have asinine milk when however being at length wearied or at least satiated with the laceration of himself he gave a respite to his torments they received in their open bosoms brass and also silver coin which many offered them contending with each other who should give the most besides this likewise they received from some a cask of wine and milk and cheese and a quantity of wheat and barley but others gave barley to me the bearer of the goddess after this they greedily collected everything and enclosing what they had collected in sacks prepared for this species of gain they placed it on my back so that being oppressed with the weight of a twofold burden i was at one and the same time a walking barn and temple wandering after this manner they plundered all that region but being exhilarated by the abundance of more than usual gain they prepared a genial feast in a certain castle for this purpose through the fraud of a fictitious divination they earnestly requested a very fat ram of a certain husbandman in order that they might satisfy by sacrificing it the hunger of the syrian goddess and the supper being properly arranged they betake themselves to the bath and after they had washed themselves they brought with them to the supper a certain very robust rustic who was well prepared for their purpose by the strength of his sides and having tasted of a very few small herbs those most filthy catamites were excited before the table itself to the extreme wickedness of illicit lust and everywhere spreading themselves round the naked and supine young man they importune him with their execrable pruriency my eyes however not being able any longer to endure such wickedness i endeavoured to exclaim o curahides but o alone proceeded from my lips destitute of the other syllables and letters clear indeed and strong and adapted to the pronunciation of an ass but perfectly inopportune as to time for many young men from the next village who had been inquiring for an ass that had been stolen from them by night and who had explored all the stables with a vehement desire of finding it on hearing me bray within the house thinking the ass which they had lost was concealed in a secret part of that dwelling burst into it unexpectedly with hasty steps in order to seize openly their own property and clearly detected them in the perpetration of their execrable filthiness now also immediately calling the neighbours together on all sides they disclosed that most filthy scene and besides this they in the way of ridicule praised the most pure chastity of the priests they however being very much troubled on account of the infamy which easily spreading through the mouth of the people would deservedly render them odious and execrable to all men collected all their property and secretly departed from the castle about midnight having also accomplished a good part of their journey before the rising of the sun when it was now clear day they came into impervious deserts and having first conferred much with each other they prepared themselves to put me to death taking the goddess therefore from my back and placing on the ground they stripped me of all my harness bound me to a certain oak and lashing me with that whip which was furnished with the pastern bones of sheep after the manner of a chain they almost brought me to extreme death there was likewise one who threatened to cut the nerves of my hams with a cruel axe because i had triumphed over his pure modesty through revealing by my braying his execrable lust but the rest thought that my life should be spared in consequence of looking not to my safety but to that of the image which was lying on the ground again therefore driving me along laden with bundles by striking me with the flat part of their swords they came to a certain noble city 
There, a man of the first consequence, who was also religious, and in a remarkable degree revered the gods, ran to meet us, being excited by the tinkling of the cymbals, the sound of the drums, and the sweet modulations of the Phrygian harmony. Receiving likewise the goddess in his hospitable dwelling which was devoted to religious purposes, he placed all of us within the enclosure of his most ample house, and endeavoured to propitiate the goddess by the greatest veneration and fat victims. Here, too, I remember I was especially in danger of losing my life. For a certain rustic sent as a gift to this religious man, who was his master, a very fat haunch of a large stag, which was a part of his hunting. This, being carelessly suspended behind the kitchen door, at no very great height from the floor, a certain dog, which was also of the hunting kind, latently seized it, and rejoicing in his prey, rapidly fled from the view of those to whose care the haunch was committed. But the cook, when this loss was known, condemning his own negligence, and having for a long time lamented with inefficacious tears, and dreading the consequence, because his master would in a short time want his supper, closely embraced his infant son, and seizing a rope, attempted to hang himself. The extreme misfortune, however, of the husband was not concealed from his faithful wife, but violently seizing with both her hands the deadly rope, are you, said she, so terrified by the present evil as to be out of your mind? And do you not perceive the fortuitous remedy which the providence of the gods administers to you? For if you are at all capable of reflecting in this extreme tempest of fortune, listen to me attentively. Lead that foreign ass into some remote place, there slay him, and cut off his thigh in the form of the haunch which you have lost, and set it before your master in the place of the stag diligently cooked, and highly seasoned with minced meat. The most iniquitous knave was pleased with the idea of saving his own life by my death, and having very much praised the sagacity of his wife, he also sharpened his knives, in order to effect my destined slaughter. End of chapter 8、Chapter、9 Part One of the Metamorphosis or Golden Ass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The Metamorphosis or Golden Ass by Apuleius, translated by Thomas Taylor, Chapter Nine, Part One. After this manner, that most iniquitous executioner armed his impious hands against me. But I determined, in consequence of counsel being precipitated by the presence of so great a danger, without waiting the delay of long deliberation, to avoid by flight the impending slaughter of my body. And immediately bursting the cord by which I was tied, I hurried along with all the force of my feet, skirmishing by frequently employing my heels in defence of my safety. And rapidly running through the first porch, I violently entered without delay into a dining room, in which the master of the house was at supper, with the priests of the goddess feasting on the flesh of the victims which he had immolated. And by thus rushing in, I broke and overturned many of the dishes, and also the tables, and other things of the like kind. By which foul destruction, the master of the house being dismayed, he delivered me to a certain servant, and ordered him to keep me very diligently shut up. As importunate and wanton, in a place where I might not again disturb by a like petulance the tranquil banquet. There, being craftily defended by my sagacious counsel, and snatched from the midst of the hands of the executioner, I rejoiced in the custody of my salutary prison. But, indeed, it is not possible that anything prosperous can happen to one who is born a man without the concurrence of fortune. Nor can the fatal order of things, as established by divine providence, be subverted or renewed by any prudent counsel or sagacious remedy. Lastly, that crafty device itself, by which I seemed to have found a momentary safety, produced for me another great danger, or rather, present death. For a certain menial lad, as I afterwards heard the domestics tell each other in a low voice, burst into the dining room with a countenance agitated by terror. And announced to his master that a mad dog had a little before run from the next street with a wonderful celerity through the back door, and had attacked the hunting dogs with a perfectly vehement fury. And afterwards, 
had proceeded into the next stable and rushed on the greater part of the labouring beasts in a similar rage and in the last place that he had not spared even the men themselves for he said that myrtilus the muleteer hephaestion the cook hippatius the chamberlain apollonius the physician and many others of the family while they endeavoured to avoid the dog were all of them lacerated by it with various bites and that some of the labouring beasts which had been wounded by its venomous bites were now seized with a similar fury this narration immediately agitated the minds of all that heard it and thinking that i also was affected with the same disease they took up arms of every description and pursued me exhorting each other to repel the common mischief though at the same time they rather than i laboured under the same disease of raging madness and without doubt they would have torn me in pieces with those lances hunting spears and axes with which they were easily supplied by the servants if i considering the storm which was likely to burst upon me suddenly had not immediately rushed into the bedchamber into which my masters had retired then the doors being closed and locked upon me they surrounded the place till i without any danger to their entrance should be consumed in consequence of being possessed and devoured by the pervicacious fury of that deadly pestilence in this situation having at length gained my liberty and embracing the gift of solitude with which fortune had presented me i threw myself on the bed which was there laid and enjoyed human sleep which for some time before i had not been able to obtain and now it being clear day i rose in good health liberated from lassitude to the soft bed on which i had slept then i heard those who had passed a sleepless night in watching about my prison thus disputing with each other concerning my destiny shall we believe that this miserable ass will be agitated with perpetual fury but indeed it is rather probable that the poison has become extinct the rage being quiescent thus difference of opinion led them at length to explore my condition and looking through a certain fissure they saw me standing at my ease in a sane and sober state and now having of their own accord opened the doors they made trial whether i was become mild in a more ample manner but one of them who was sent from heaven to be my saviour pointed out to the rest the following method of exploring my sanity to wit that they should offer me a vessel full of water recently drawn and that if i drank of it intrepidly and after my accustomed manner they might depend upon it that i was sane and liberated from all disease but that on the contrary if i avoided the sight and contact of the water and was terrified at the view of it it would be evident that the noxious fury still pertinaciously remained for this which is asserted in ancient books is also verified by experience this counsel being approved they still doubting the event immediately offered me a large vessel full of transparent water drawn from a neighbouring fountain but i immediately proceeding to meet them as i was very thirsty drank indeed those truly salutary waters inclining myself and merging into the vessel the whole of my head and now i placidly suffered them to pat me with their hands to stroke my ears and lead me by the halter and to do whatever else they pleased in the way of making trial of my sanity till contrary to their insane presumption i clearly proved my mildness to all of them after this manner having escaped twofold danger on the following day i was again led forth to the journey a circumferaneous mendicant burdened with divine spoils accompanied by cotola and symbols and when we had passed by not a few little cottages and castles we came to a certain village built among the half-ruined vestiges of a city which was once opulent as the inhabitants relate here taking up our abode at the first inn that we found we heard a pleasant narration about a poor man being cuckolded by his wife which i also wish the reader to know this man labouring under great poverty procured the means of subsistence by the small wages which he received from working as a carpenter nevertheless he had a wife who was herself poor but famous or rather infamous for extreme lasciviousness but on a certain day while he went in the morning to the work which he had undertaken to perform an audacious adulterer immediately entered latently into his house and while they fearlessly employ themselves in the collectations of venus the husband unexpectedly returned home ignorant of what was transacting 
and at that time suspecting no such thing. And now, praising the countenance of his wife because he perceived that the doors were shut and bolted, he knocked at the gate, announcing also by whistling that he was present. Then the crafty woman, who was most sagacious in the perpetration of crimes of this kind, having freed the man from her strict embraces, dissemblingly concealed him under a tub which was half buried in the earth in a corner of the house, but was nevertheless empty, and, having opened the street door, she received her husband as he was entering with severe language. "'And do you thus,' said she, "'come home to me, empty and idle, with your hands in your bosom, nor apply yourself to your accustomed work, in order that you may provide for our subsistence,' and procure for us something to eat? But I, unhappy woman, exercise my fingers by night and by day in spinning wool, that at least a lamp may shine within our little abode. How much more happy than I am is our neighbour Daphne, who, filling herself early in the morning with wine and meat, wallows with her adulterers. The husband, being thus reproved, said, What do you mean? For though the master of our workshop, being attentive to his forensic employment, has given us a holiday, nevertheless I have provided for our supper to-night. Do you see that tub which, being superfluous, in vain occupies so much space, and in reality affords nothing further than an impediment to our habitation? This I have sold for five pence to a certain person who is here present, that, having paid the price of it, he may take it as his own property with him. Make yourself ready, therefore, and lend me a hand for a little while, that, having scraped it clean, it may be immediately delivered to the buyer. The fallacious woman, immediately bursting into an audacious laugh, said, The husband which I have married is certainly a great man, and a strenuous negotiator, who, while I, who am only a woman and confined at home, have already sold a thing for seven pence, has sold it for a less sum. The husband being joyful at the addition to the price of the tub, said, Who is he, who has bought it at so great a price? To which he replied, He has long ago, stupid man, descended into the tub, in order that he might diligently explore its solidity. Nor was the adulterer deficient in confirming what the woman said, but, promptly rising from the tub, said, Do you wish, mistress, to know the truth? This tub of yours is too old, and injured in many places by gaping fishers and turning himself dissemblingly to her husband. But do you, said he, my friend, whoever you are, bring me immediately a lamp, that, having scraped off the filth which is in the inside of the tub, I may be able to know accurately whether it is fit for use, unless you think that we obtain money in an improper manner. The sagacious and egregious husband, without any delay, and not suspecting anything, having lit a lamp, said, Depart, brother, and keep yourself quiet till I shall have brought this tub into a fit condition for you to receive. And having thus said, he stripped himself, and taking the lamp with him, began to scrape off the indurated feces which adhered to the rotten tub. She, however, putting her head into the tub, deluded her husband with meretricious craft. She pointed out with her finger this place and that and another, and again another, which required to be purified, till, both works being accomplished, the miserable carpenter was compelled, having received seven pence, to carry the tub on his back to the house of the adulterer. Those most pious priests, having remained there for a few days, and been fattened by the public munificence, and laden with many rewards of their divination, devised for themselves a new kind of gain. Having fabricated one oracle, adapted to many cases, they deluded many who consulted them about various particulars. But the oracle was as follows. Together yoked the oxen, till the ground, that stalks abundant, may from thence arise. Then, if any who wished to engage in matrimony from the admonition of the oracle consulted them, they said, it answered the very thing which they wished to know, to wit, that they should be conjoined in wedlock, in order that they might produce stocks of children. If any one who was about to buy land interrogated them, they said that the oracle very properly spoke of oxen, as also of the yoke, and of fields flourishing with crops of corn. 
If someone, being solicitous about travelling, consulted the divine oracle, they said that the mildest of all quadrupeds were to be now yoked together and prepared for the journey, and that gain was promised them through the germ of the glebe. And if someone who intended to engage in battle or to pursue a band of robbers asked them whether the event of his undertaking would be prosperous or not, they asserted that victory was promised by the predication of the oracle, which signified that the necks of the enemies should be brought under the yoke, and a most abundant and fruitful spoil be obtained by rapine. And after this manner, by the fraudulent craft of divination, they collected no inconsiderable sum of money. Being, however, at length exhausted by perpetual interrogations, and by always giving the same answer, they again began to travel through a road much worse than that which we had passed through during the night. For it was interrupted by profound ditches and whirlpools, which were partly filled with stagnant water, and in other places was slippery with miry filth. Lastly, I was scarcely able to arrive at length much fatigued at level paths, my legs being bruised by continual falls. And behold, on a sudden, a troop of armed horsemen came upon us from behind, and having with difficulty restrained the impetus of the running horses, they eagerly flew upon Philebus and the rest of his associates, and tying them by the neck and calling them sacrilegious and impure, they sometimes struck them with their fists, bound them fast with manacles, and urged them to produce quickly the golden bowl, and thus bring forth that pledge of their crime, which they had privately stolen from the bed of the mother of the gods, under the pretext of solemn rites, which they should secretly perform, and afterwards silently departed, at the dawn of day, beyond the boundaries of the city, as if they could escape the punishment of so great a crime. Nor was there wanting one who, putting his hand on my back, and searching in the very bosom of the goddess, whom I carried, found the golden bowl and drew it out in the sight of all that were present. But those most impure men could not either be convinced or terrified by the disclosure of a deed which was at least so nefarious, but jesting, accompanied with a fictitious laugh, they said, Behold the unluckiness of an unworthy circumstance. How many innocent men are in danger on account of one bowl only which the mother of the gods presented as a hospitable gift to her sister, the Syrian goddess? They having stupidly uttered these and other trifles of the same kind, the rustics led them back and immediately bound and cast them into prison. And the bowl and the image of the goddess, which I carried, being restored and consecrated in that part of the temple where gifts were deposited, on the following day they brought me forth, and again by the voice of the crier exposed me to be sold. But a certain baker, from the next little town, bought me for seven pieces of money more than Philebus had before given for me, and he, having immediately laden me with corn which he had bought, led me through a road, difficult, from the little sharp stones with which it abounded, and encumbered with roots of every kind, to the mill where he ground his corn. There many laboring beasts turned mills in their different circuits by proceeding through various gyrations. Nor was it by day alone, but also, being vigilant through the whole of the night, they made flour by the light of a lamp, and the continual rotation of the mills. But my new master afforded me the best accommodation, lest I should be terrified at the rudiments of my servitude for he gave me a holiday the first day, and abundantly furnished my manger with food. That beatitude, however, of leisure and exuberant food did not endure any longer than a day. But on the following morning I was bound to that mill which appeared to be the largest, and immediately, my eyes being covered to prevent my being giddy from the gyrations, I was impelled into the curved spaces of a circular path, excavated like a canal, so that I might wander with a sure winding in the orb of a circumfluent boundary, with a reciprocal pace, treading my footsteps over again. Nevertheless, not entirely forgetting my sagacity and prudence, I did not show myself an apt tyro of this discipline. But, though I had frequently seen machines similarly circumvolved when I lived among men, nevertheless I stood still, feigning that I was seized with a stupor, 
as one ignorant of and unskilled in that kind of work for i thought indeed that i should be employed in some other easier work as being but little adapted and sufficiently useless for labour of that kind or at least that i should be fed in idleness i exercised however in vain a pernicious sagacity for many furnished with staves immediately surrounded me and as i was even then without fear in consequence of my eyes being covered on a sudden a signal was given and with repeated clamours they heaped blows upon me and so disturbed me with the noise that laying aside all my crafty designs i immediately ran briskly and strenuously thrust forward with my breast and with great sagacity the rope by which through my circuitous course the mill was turned by this sudden change of counsel i excited the laughter of all the company and now the greatest part of the day passed over they liberated me that was otherwise much fatigued from the machine taking off the rope by which i was tied to the mill and led me to the manger but i though excessively fatigued and very much in want of renovation of strength and almost perishing with hunger nevertheless being impelled by my usual curiosity and sufficiently anxious i observed with a certain delight the discipline of that disagreeable workshop neglecting the food which was placed before me in great abundance good gods what abject fellows were the men that were there the whole of their skin was marked with livid spots and their scarred backs were rather shaded than covered with torn garments composed of shreds some had only their private parts concealed by a small covering and all of them were so clothed that their skin might be seen through the intervals of the patches their foreheads were marked with letters their hair was half shaved off and their feet were bound with fetters they were also deformed to a paleness and their eyelids were corroded with the smoky darkness of black vapour and on this account they had bad eyes they were likewise filthily white through the flour of the meal like those pugilists who fight sprinkled with fine dust but what and after what manner shall i speak of the labouring beasts my associates what of those old mules and infirm horses with their heads inclined downward about the manger they diminished the heaps of chaff their necks were putrid with wounds their nostrils which laboured in breathing were languid and wide through the continual pulsation of coughing their breasts were ulcerated through the constant friction of the ropes by which they were tied their sides were bared even to their bones by perpetual castigation their hoofs were extended to an enormous size by manifold circumduction and the whole of their hide was rough with inveterate and scabby leanness fearing that the same baneful misery with which this family was affected would happen to me recollecting also the fortune of the pristine lucius and perceiving myself thrust down to the last goal of safety i lamented my condition with a dependent head nor was any solace of a painful life anywhere present except that i was recreated through my innate curiosity while making no account of my presence all of them freely said and did before me whatever they pleased nor was it without reason that the divine author of ancient poetry among the greeks desiring to exhibit a man of consummate prudence sings of ulysses in the odyssey that he acquired the greatest virtue through wandering over many cities and through the knowledge of different nations for i confess that i owe great thanks to my asinine form because concealing me by its covering and exercising me through various fortunes it certainly rendered me if not more wise yet knowing in many things lastly i have determined to narrate to you an excellent tale which i have found to be delightful in the extreme and behold i begin as follows the baker who had made me his own for a sum of money and who was otherwise a good man and very moderate sustained the greatest punishment in the marriage bed and his family in consequence of being allotted a wife who was the worst and most wicked of women so that by hercules i also frequently lamented his condition in silence for there was no vice that was not present with that most iniquitous woman but there was entirely a conflux of all crimes in her mind as in some miry privy 
she was inauspicious, cruel, addicted to men and to wine, pervicacious and pertinacious, greedy and base rapine, profuse in filthy expenditure, inimical to fidelity, and hostile to chastity. Then, despising and trampling on the divine powers instead of the true religion, counterfeiting a nefarious opinion of God, whom she asserted to be the only deity, to the exclusion of other gods who proceed from and are rooted in the first god, devising also vain observances and deceiving all men, and likewise her miserable husband, she enslaved her body to morning draughts of pure wine, and to continual adultery. This woman, being thus ill-disposed, persecuted me with a wonderful hatred. For, while she was yet lying in bed before the break of day, she commanded with a loud voice that the ass which had been recently purchased should be tied to the mill. And as soon as she had left her bedchamber, she ordered that many blows should be given to me in her presence, she herself standing by those who beat me. When also the other laboring beasts were liberated from their toil at dinner time, I was led to the manger through her mandate much later than the rest, by which cruelty she greatly increased my native curiosity in observing her manners. For I perceived a certain young man very frequently going into her bedchamber, whose face also I very much desired to behold, if the covering of my head would have afforded that liberty to my eyes for I was not in want of sagacity sufficient to detect in some way or other the crimes of a most iniquitous woman. A certain old woman, however, who was a medium and a messenger between her and her adulterer, was daily present with her as an inseparable companion, with whom, first breakfasting and afterwards contending with her in drinking alternately pure wine, she devised insidious machinations by fraudulently circuitous means to the destruction of her miserable husband. But I, though I was very much enraged at the error of Photis, who had made me an ass, while she wished to change me into a bird, nevertheless I was gratified in having this one solace of my lamentable deformity, that being furnished with very long ears, I easily heard everything, even though at a great distance. At length, on a certain day, the following words of that timid old woman came to my ears. My mistress, consider with yourself what you mean to do with that sluggish and false-hearted friend, with whom you became familiar without my advice, and who in a cowardly manner dreads the severe countenance of your unpleasant and odious husband, and through this slothfulness of his languid love torments you by deferring your willing embraces. How much superior to him is Felicitaris! a young man beautiful, liberal, and strenuous, and most steadfast in eluding the inefficacious vigilance of husbands. By Hercules, he alone is worthy to enjoy the embraces of all mistresses of families. He alone deserves to wear a golden crown on his head, on account of this one thing which he lately devised with wonderful cunning against a certain married man who was jealous. Hear, therefore, and compare together the different disposition of both these lovers. You know a certain person of the name of Barbarus, a senator of our city, whom the vulgar call Scorpion, on account of the asperity of his manners? This man very cautiously kept close in his house a noble wife of surpassing beauty, defending her with a wonderful guard. To this, that abandoned wife of the baker replying, said, Why should I not? I know her very well. You speak of Arity, my schoolfellow. You know, therefore, said the old woman, the whole history of Felicitaris. By no means, replied the baker's wife, but I very much desire to know it, and beseech you, mother, to narrate every particular to me in order. And without delay, that old woman, who was an excessive talker, thus began. That barbarous, when he was about to undertake a necessary journey, and was desirous most carefully of preserving the chastity of his beloved wife, secretly admonished his servant Myrmex, whom he knew to be in the highest degree faithful to him, and committed to his fidelity the entire custody of his mistress, at the same time threatening him with imprisonment, perpetual bonds, and lastly a violent death and famine, 
if any man, even in passing by, did but touch her with his finger. And this he confirmed through swearing by all the divine powers. Leaving, therefore, Myrmex, who was struck with the greatest terror, as a most vigilant and inseparable attendant on his wife, he commenced his journey without any solicitude. Then Myrmex, with a mind firmly resolved and vehemently anxious, would not suffer his mistress to go anywhere, and keeping her at home occupied in spinning wool, was constantly with her, only suffering her as a thing that was necessary to go to the bath in the evening, and then adhering and, as it were, agglutinated to her, and holding with his hand the fringe of her garment, he faithfully performed the office committed to him with wonderful sagacity. But the beauty of this noble matron could not be concealed from the ardent vigilance of Velesiteris, and being captivated and flamed by this celebrated chastity and extreme vigilance of her remarkable tutelage, he prepared himself with all his might to vanquish the tenacious discipline of that house. Being also certain of the fragility of human fidelity, and that all difficulties are pervious to money, and that it is usual for even adamantine doors to be broke open by gold, having opportunely found Myrmex alone, he unfolded to him his love, and suppliantly implored him to administer a remedy to his torment, for he said that he had determined and decreed to die in a short time if he did not very soon obtain the object of his wish. He also farther observed to Myrmex that he ought not to fear anything in an affair which might be easily accomplished, since he could penetrate into the house in the evening unattended by any one, covered and concealed by the fidelity of darkness, and in a moment of time after leave it. To these and similar persuasions he added a powerful wedge for the purpose of cleaving the perfectly rigid tenacity of a servant, for opening his hand he showed him glittering pieces of solid gold, which was to Myrmex a spectacle entirely new, twenty of which, he said, he had destined to the woman, but that he willingly offered to him ten. Myrmex was horribly terrified at the mention of a wickedness which he had never heard of before, and immediately fled with closed ears. Nevertheless, the flaming splendor of the gold could not depart from his eyes, but though he was far removed from Felicitaris, and had arrived with rapid steps at home, yet he seemed to himself still to behold those beautiful splendors of the money, and already possessed in his mind an opulent spoil. The miserable man also was plucked and torn asunder into different opinions, with a wonderful fluctuation of mind. Their fidelity, he again urged him, their torment dissuaded, here pleasure invited. Nevertheless, at last, gold vanquished the fear of death nor could his desire of the beautiful money be at least mitigated by time. But pestilent avarice invaded him also with solicitude by night, so that the threats of his master retained him at home, yet gold called him abroad. Then, having devoured shame and removed delay, he immediately conveyed to the ears of his mistress the message of Felicitaris. Nor did the woman revolt from her genuine levity, but immediately sold her modesty for execrable metal. Thus Myrmex, overflowing with joy at the precipice of his fidelity, and wishing not only to receive but also to handle the money which he had seen to his destruction, gladly told Felicitaris that he had at length with great labor accomplished what he desired, and immediately demanded the promised reward. And thus the hands of Myrmex, now held golden, which had never before touched even copper money. And now, the night being advanced, he brought that strenuous lover, unattended by any one, to the house, and introduced him, with his head well covered, so as to conceal his face, into the bedchamber of his mistress. Scarcely, however, had they sacrificed to recent love with new embraces, scarcely had the new and naked soldiers received the first stipends in the warfare of Venus, when the husband, availing himself of the opportunity afforded by night, was suddenly present, contrary to the expectation of every one. And now he knocks at the gate of his own house, now he calls and strikes the door with a stone, and, becoming more and more suspicious by the delay, he threatens to inflict dire punishments on Myrmex. But he, 
being greatly agitated by the sudden evil and brought to a want of counsel through his miserable trepidation said as the only thing which he could say that the darkness of the night prevented him from finding the key which he had carefully concealed in the meantime Felicitaris, on hearing the clamour having hastily put on his garment but his feet through trepidation being uncovered ran out of the bedchamber then myrmex having at length put the key into the lock opened the gate and received his master loudly calling on the faith of the gods and while he hastily goes into the bedchamber myrmex let out Felicitaris, who hurried away with a clandestine flight but myrmex as soon as Felicitaris had left the house considering himself as now secure after he had fastened the door again composed himself to sleep barbarous however on going out of the bedchamber at break of day saw under the bed shoes unknown to him which Felicitaris had on when he entered into the chamber and suspecting from this circumstance what had been transacted but not divulging either to his wife or any of his domestics the grief which he endured he took the shoes and privately concealed them in his bosom and only ordering that myrmex should be led bound by his fellow-servants towards the forum he rapidly went thither himself silently groaning conceiving that he should certainly find who was the adulterer by the indication of the shoes but behold while barbarous proceeded through the street enraged with a turgid face and contracted eyebrows and myrmex behind him oppressed with chains not indeed detected in a manifest crime but convicted by his own most evil conscience and exciting inefficacious pity by his abundant tears and extreme lamentations while this took place Felicitaris, opportunely passing that way though he was previously engaged in business of a different kind yet being moved though not terrified by the sudden spectacle and recollecting the fault occasioned by his haste he suspected what was likely to follow immediately therefore having sagaciously assumed his usual audacity and dispersing the servants who led myrmex along in chains he rushed on myrmex with extreme clamour and gently striking him with his fist on the face may this your master said he and all the celestial gods whom you have invoked by rashly swearing destroy you as you deserve o most iniquitous and perjured man who yesterday stole my shoes from the bath you deserve by hercules you deserve to wear out those chains and besides this also to endure the darkness of a prison barbarous being deceived or rather mocked by this opportune fallacy of the vigorous young man and unsuspectingly believing in what he said again returned home and having called myrmex and showed him the shoes voluntarily pardoned him and persuaded him to restore the shoes to the master from whom he had stolen end of chapter nine part one recording by thomas copeland chapter nine part two of the metamorphosis or golden ass this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass, by Apuleius. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter 9, Part 2. Scarcely had the old woman finished her tale, when the baker's wife thus resumed her discourse. Oh, how blessed is that woman who enjoys the liberty of associating with so firm a friend. But I miserable creature have met with a lover who is even frightened at the noise of the mill and the concealed face of that scabby ass to this the old woman replied i will even now cause that lover of yours to be with you promptly at the appointed time well persuaded and resolute and having likewise promised that she should return in the evening she departed from the bedchamber but that chaste wife immediately prepared a princely banquet she defecates by percolation the precious wine tempers the new-made pottage with seasoning and furnishes the table with abundance of food in short the coming of the adulterer is expected like the advent or manifestation of some god for opportunely the husband supped abroad at the house of a neighbouring fuller 
Midday, therefore, approaching, I being at length freed from my harness and permitted to refresh myself in quiet, I did not by Hercules so much rejoice in my liberation from labor as that, my eyes being uncovered, I should now be able to behold without restraint all the arts of the wicked woman. The sun, indeed, having now descended under the ocean, had illuminated the inferior parts of the earth, when, behold, the rash adulterer came, closely following the iniquitous old woman, he himself being very young, and still conspicuous by the polished smoothness of his chin, still being himself the delight of adulterers. The woman, having received him with many kisses, desired him to recline himself for the supper she had prepared. But, no sooner had the young man touched with the extremity of his lips the cup which was drunk out of previous to eating, and just begun to taste the food, than the husband came, returning much sooner than they expected. Then the egregious wife, having earnestly prayed for dire curses upon him, and wishing that he might break his legs, hid the adulterer trembling with pale fear under the wooden bin, which then happened to lie near her, in which a confused heap of corn was usually purified and by her innate craft, dissembling a deed so wicked, and assuming an intrepid countenance, she inquired of her husband why he came home so prematurely, relinquishing the supper of his most intimate companion. But he, with a mind perfectly afflicted, and continually sighing, said, Not being able to bear the detestable and extreme wickedness of an abandoned woman, I took myself to flight. Good gods, what a wife! How faithful and how temperate and yet she defiled herself with a most filthy crime i swear by this holy series that i can even now scarcely believe the testimony of my eyes concerning such a woman the most audacious wife of the baker being incited by these words of her husband and desiring to know the affair did not cease to importune him to narrate the whole transaction from the beginning nor did she desist till her husband complied with her wish. And thus, being ignorant of the misfortune of his own house, he related that of the family of another. The wife of my associate, the Fuller, who seemed to be a woman of undefiled chastity, and who, being always renowned for her modesty, chastely ruled the house of her husband, was inflamed with a secret love for a certain adulterer, and as she continually indulged in furtive embraces with that young man, she was in the act of being connected with him at the very moment of time in which we, having bathed, went to supper. Being therefore disturbed by our sudden presence, she hid him in a wicker coop, which being plaited from willow twigs into an erect heap, and smoked with the white fume of sulphur, was used for the purpose of whitening the cloth that was placed round it. And he being now safely concealed, as it seemed to her, she fearlessly participated with us of the table. In the meantime, the young man, being oppressed and obscured by the odor of the sulphur, became faint through the interception of his breath, and that living mineral caused him to sneeze frequently, as it is natural for it to do. But as soon as the husband who sat opposite to his wife heard the sound of sneezing behind his back, because he thought it proceeded from his wife, he wished her well in the usual words, and this he did when he again heard the sneezing, and also when it was frequently repeated, till, being moved by the excessive repetition of it, he at length suspected what the thing was. Immediately, therefore, pushing away the table at which she sat, and removing the coop, he drew forth a man, who was with great pain restoring his frequent emissions of breath and being inflamed with indignation on account of the disgraceful circumstance, calling for a sword, he longed to kill a man who would have expired in a short time. Unless I, considering our common danger, had, through, though with difficulty, prevented him from his furious attack by assuring him that his enemy would shortly die through the powerful odor of the sulphur, without any blame being attached to us. And he, being rendered more mild, not by my persuasion, but by the necessity of the thing itself, brought him, who was now but half alive, into the next street. Then I secretly admonished, and at length prevailed on his wife, to withdraw herself for a short time from the shop, and betake herself to a certain woman with whom she was familiar, 
till the enraged mind of her husband should be appeased, who, I did not doubt, was so exasperated and so agitated with fury that he would certainly perpetrate something more deadly, both on himself and his wife. And thus, being wearied with the supper of my associate, I returned to my own house. While the baker narrated these particulars, that shameless and audacious woman had, long before the tale was finished, expressed by execrations how much she detested the wife of the fuller, calling her perfidious, unchaste, and lastly, the great disgrace of all her sex, who, laying aside her own modesty and trampling on the league of the marriage bed, had defiled with meretricious infamy the house of her husband, and now had procured for herself the name of a prostitute, having lost the dignity of a married woman. She added that such females ought to be burnt alive. Nevertheless, through the joint admonition of her silent wound, and her own filthy conscience, in order that she might sooner liberate her adulterer from the torment of his covering, she frequently urged her husband to go to bed as soon as possible. He, however, mildly requested that the table might be placed for him, as, his supper being intercepted at the house of the fuller, he had fled from thence perfectly hungry. Then the wife hastily set the table before him, though unwillingly, because it was designed for another person. But my bowels were perfectly lacerated when I reflected on the preceding wickedness, and the present audacity of this most abandoned woman, and I sedulously deliberated with myself whether I could by any means give assistance to my master by detecting and revealing the fraud of his wife, and by throwing off the covering, exposed to the view of every one, him who was concealed like a tortoise under the bin. At length divine providence regarded me, thus tormented with the disgrace of my master, for the lame old man, to whose care our custody was committed, led all us laboring beasts, collected into one body, to the next lake, for the sake of drinking, the time now requiring that this should be done. And this circumstance administered to me a most opportune occasion of revenge, for, in passing by, I observed the extremities of the fingers of the adulterer, which were protuberant through the narrow openings of the hollow covering, and pressing these with my inflected and sharp hoof, I bruised them so as to reduce them to the greatest tenuity, till, being excited by the intolerable pain, he sent forth a sorrowful clamour, and pushing away and throwing down the bin, he unfolded, to the sight of all that were present, the scenic apparatus of the lecherous woman. Nevertheless, the baker, not being greatly disturbed by the loss of his wife's modesty, thus began to soothe with a serene front and conciliated face the young man who was trembling with exsanguous paleness. You need not fear, my son, that anything of a sorrowful nature will be inflicted on you by me. I am not a barbarian, nor endued with a rustic deformity of manners, nor will I kill you with the deadly fume of sulphur after the example of the truculent fuller. Nor indeed will I bring such an elegant and beautiful youth in danger of losing his life through the severity of the law concerning adultery. But I will divide with my wife my pleasure with you, and she shall be common both to you and me. For I have always lived with my wife in such concord that, according to the dogma of the philosophers, the same things are pleasing to both of us. But neither does equity suffer the wife to have more authority than the husband. With such like flattering language, having derided the young man, he led him reluctant to a bed, and sending away his most chaste wife who followed him to another bed, he, lying alone with the youth, enjoyed the most grateful avengement of corrupted nuptials. But as soon as the lucid chariot of the sun had made the day, the baker, having called two of his most robust servants, and striking with a ferrule of the buttocks of the youth, who was lifted to a considerable height for the purpose, said to him, Do you, who are so soft and tender, and but a boy, defrauding lovers, wantonly desire women in the flower of your age, and commit adultery with such as are free, and connected by the conjugal compact, and vindicate to yourself the unseasonable name of an adulterer? having reproached him in these and many other words, and besides this punished him abundantly with blows, 
they turned him out of doors. He, however, being the bravest of all adulterers, having obtained unhoped for safety, though his fair posteriors had been burst by night, and for a long time, sorrowfully fled. Nevertheless, the baker divorced his wife, and immediately thrust her out of her own house. But she, besides her genuine wickedness, being profoundly excited and exasperated by the contumelious language of her husband, though it was just, returned to her treasury of fraud and the accustomed arts of females, and with great care searched for a certain crafty woman who was believed to be capable of effecting anything by incantations and sorcery, besought her with many prayers, and burdened her with many gifts, requesting of her one of two things, to wit, that she would either again cause her to be reconciled to her husband by appeasing him, or, if that could not be accomplished, that she would send some ghost or some dire demoniacal power to take away his life by violent means. Then that sorceress, and who was capable of effecting divine works, employed at first only the milder instruments of her wicked art, and endeavoured to bend the mind of the husband that had been vehemently offended, and impel it to love. But when the event of the thing was different from what she expected, being indignant with the gods, and besides the loss of the gain which she would have obtained if she had succeeded, being also stimulated by the contempt which she had sustained from the divine powers, she now began to attack the life of the most miserable husband, and to stimulate to his destruction the ghost of a certain woman who had suffered a violent death. Perhaps, however, O scrupulous reader, you reprehending my narration will argue as follows. But whence, O foolish ass, could you know what was done by women in secret, as you say you did, when, at the same time, you were confined within the boundaries of a bakehouse? Here, therefore, how a curious man, sustaining the form of an ass, knew all that was transacted with a view to the destruction of my master, the baker. Nearly about midday, a woman suddenly appeared in the bakehouse, deformed with severe sorrow, as if she was guilty of some crime, half clothed with a coarse mantle, having her feet naked and without shoes. And being thus ill-favoured through leanness, there was in her face a paleness like that of box. Her hair likewise was half grey, torn, and filthy through the interspersion of ashes, and, hanging over her forehead, concealed the greatest part of her face. This woman, thus deformed in her attire, gently with her hand taking hold of the baker, led him into his bedchamber as if she had something to say to him in secret, and having shut the door, she stayed there a long time. But when all the corn was ground which had been given to the servants of the baker, and it became necessary to ask for more, the lesser men-servants, standing near the bedchamber, called their master by name, and asked for more corn to supply the mill. And, as no master answered them, though they frequently called him, and with a loud voice, they now more forcibly knocked at the door. Because, likewise, it had been most carefully bolted, suspecting something of greater consequence, and of a worse nature than usual, with great effort, they at length either plucked off or broke the hinges, and made an entrance for themselves. That woman, however, was nowhere to be found, but they saw their master hanging from a certain beam to which he was tied and now lifeless. Freeing him, therefore, from the knot by which his neck was fastened, they took him down from the beam with the greatest lamentations and weeping, and procured for his corpse the last ablution. Having likewise performed the offices pertaining to the dead, they buried him, a great crowd attending the funeral. On the following day his daughter came running from the next little town in which she had lately been married, sorrowful, shaking her pendulous hairs, and sometimes beating her breasts with her hands, for she knew all that happened, though no one had narrated to her the misfortune of the house, because the lamentable form of her father had presented itself to her in sleep, having the neck still tied with a cord, and unfolded to her all the wickedness of her stepmother, the adultery, the enchantment, 
and how he had descended to the realms beneath, being strangled by a nocturnal ghost. And when she had tormented herself by long-continued lamentation, at length, being restrained by the concourse of her friends and acquaintance, she gave a pause to her grief. And now, the funeral solemnities being in the usual manner completed as his sepulchre, on the ninth day she brought forth the servants, the furniture, and all the laboring beasts to be sold by auction. Then the rash fortune of an uncertain sale dispersed in various ways the property of one house. Lastly, a certain poor gardener bought me for fifty pieces of money, which he said was a great price but he purchased me in order that he might procure food for himself by our common labor. And the thing itself appears to me to require that I should also explain the discipline of this my servitude. In the morning, my master was accustomed to drive me to the next city, laden with many herbs, and after he parted with them for a certain sum of money, to those who sold them to others, he thus returned to his garden, sitting on my back. But while he was digging and watering and performing other rural works in a bent position, I, in the meantime, being at leisure, refreshed myself with placid quiet. Behold, however, the year running back through the number of days and months, by orderly and established circulations of the stars, had descended to the wintry frosts of Capricorn after the pleasures of the vintages of autumn. But I was tormented by continual cold, through the daily rains and the nightly dews, being exposed to the open air and shut up in an uncovered stable. For my master, on account of his great poverty, could not purchase, even for himself, and much less for me, some straw or a small covering, but he lived contented with the leafy umbrage which his little cottage afforded. Besides this, also in the morning I endured great labor, in walking with unshod feet on excessively cold clay, and pieces of very sharp ice, and was not able to fill my belly with my accustomed food, for both my master and myself had an equal and similar supper, and it was very slender, since it consisted of old and unsavory lettuces, which having, through the great age of the seeds, grown into an irregular height like long brooms, had degenerated into the bitter putridity of muddy juice." On a certain night, the master of a family of the next village, being impeded by the darkness of a moonless night, and wet through a heavy shower of rain, and in consequence of this prevented from pursuing his journey in the direct road, turned out of the way, with his now wearied horse, to our garden, and being as courteously received as the time would permit, though not in a delicate yet in a necessary succor of rest, and desiring to remunerate his benignant host, he promised that he would give him from his farm some corn and oil, and besides this, two caddy of wine. But my master, without delay, proceeded to the village of that master of a family, which was distant from his garden sixty stadia, sitting on my naked back, and bringing with him a little sack and empty bladders. And this journey being now finished, we came to the before-mentioned farm, and there the benignant host immediately gave my master to partake of a sumptuous dinner. While two they were exciting each other alternately to drink, a perfectly stupendous prodigy happened to take place. A hen, belonging to a coop in which others were kept, running through the middle area, made a noise with her native clangor, as if she wanted to lay an egg. Her master, beholding her, said, Oh, good servant and sufficiently prolific! who for a long time hast nourished us with the eggs which thou hast daily brought forth. Now also, as I see, you think about preparing for us a breakfast. And ho, oh, boy, said he, speaking to one of his servants, let the basket appointed for the hens when they are about to lay eggs be placed in the accustomed corner. While the boy was doing what he was ordered to do, the hen kicking away the bed which had been made for her, as usual, in the basket, brought forth before the very feet of her master a premature offspring, which was portentous of something very dire. For she did not bring forth an egg, such as we know a hen is accustomed to do, but a chicken, 
perfectly furnished with feathers and claws, and eyes and voice, and which immediately began to follow its mother. In a similar manner also another prodigy arose, far greater than the former, and at which all men would be justly terrified. For, under the very table which sustained the relics of the dinner, the earth opening itself from the bottom, a most copious fountain of blood burst forth, and many drops rebounding from thence sprinkled the table with gore. At that very moment, likewise, in which all that were present were fixed in astonishment, admiring and trembling at those divine portents, one of the servants ran from the wine cellar, announcing that all the wine, which had long ago been deposited in it, boiled up in all the vessels with a fervent heat, and just as if a large fire had been put under it. In the meantime, also, weasels were seen out of the house, drawing into it a dead serpent. A small green frog leaped out of the mouth of a shepherd's dog, and a ram, rushing on the dog which stood near him, strangled him by one bite. These prodigies, so many and so great, produced an extreme stupor, with great fear, in the minds of the master of that house and all of his family, so that they knew not what should be done first or last, what would more or what would less appease the anger of the gods, or how many and what kinds of expiatory victims should be procured. And while all of them were still torpid, through the expectation of some most horrible subject of fear, a certain little servant came running, and announced to the master the great and extreme destruction of his family, for he lived full of glory through having three sons, now adult, furnished with learning and endued with modesty. Between these young men and a certain poor man, the master of a small cottage, there was an ancient familiarity. But a powerful, rich, and young neighbor, and who badly used the renown of his ancestors' race, possessed ample and fertile fields, contiguous to that small cottage. And as he was powerful in the number of his dependents, and easily accomplished in the city, whatever he pleased, he behaved in a very hostile manner to a poor man who was his neighbor, by killing his sheep, taking away his oxen, and trampling on his corn before it was ripe. When also he had now entirely deprived him of the product of his labor, he likewise desired to expel him from the possession of his farm, and, exciting a frivolous controversy about the boundaries of the fields, he vindicated the whole of the land to himself. Then that rustic, who was otherwise a simple, harmless man, seeing himself plundered through the avarice of a rich man, in order that he might at least retain enough of his paternal land for a sepulchre, collected together, with great trepidation, many friends, for the purpose of demonstrating to them what were the boundaries of his land. Among others, those three brothers were present, affording some small assistance to the great misfortune of their friend. Nevertheless, the insanely furious rich man, not being in the least terrified or even confused by the presence of many citizens, not only was unwilling to abstain from rapine, but also from intemperance of language, for when they mildly expostulated with him and endeavoured to mitigate his fierce manners by soothing words, he, immediately swearing most sacredly by his own safety and that of his friends, asserted that he considered the presence of so many mediators to be a thing of small consequence, and lastly, that he would order his servants to take that neighbour of his by the ears and expel him to a great distance from his little cottage, and that this should be done immediately. When he had thus said, the greatest indignation was excited in the minds of all that heard him. Then one of the three brothers answered without delay, and a little more freely, that he, in vain trusting to his riches threatened with tyrannic pride, since the poor also are accustomed to be avenged of the insolence of the rich, through the liberal aid afforded by the laws. Such as oil is to flame, sulphur to burning, and a whip to the furies, such was the fuel of these words to this furious man. And now, being insensate even to extreme insanity, and proclaiming that he would send all of them, and their laws too, to be hanged, he ordered the shepherd's dogs to be liberated, and also the mastiffs that were fierce and cruel, and accustomed to feed on the dead bodies that were thrown into the fields, 
and besides this were nourished by the bites with which they everywhere lacerated the passing traveller and he likewise commanded that they should be urged to the destruction of the men that were present but these as soon as by the accustomed signal of the shepherds they were excited and inflamed rushed on the men with furious rage being at the same time horrible by their dissonant barking and attacking they plucked their flesh and lacerate them with various wounds nor did they even spare them while they fled but being more irritated by their flight more eagerly pursued them then among the condensed slaughter of a trembling and flying multitude the youngest of the three brothers stumbled against a stone and having bruised his fingers was thrown on the ground and furnished a nefarious feast to those cruel and most ferocious dogs for immediately having found a prostrate prey they tore in pieces the miserable young man and as soon as the rest of his brothers knew that he was dying by his piercing cries they ran overwhelmed with sorrow to give him assistance and rolling their garments about their left hands they strived to defend their brother and to drive off the dogs by throwing at them many stones they could not however either terrify or vanquish their ferocity for the miserable young man being torn in pieces immediately died entreating with his last words that they would revenge the death of their youngest brother on that most filthy rich man then the two remaining brothers not by hercules so much despairing of as voluntarily neglecting their own safety hastily attacked the wealthy man and hurled many stones at him with great ardour and a furious impetus but the bloody murderer who prior to this had been exercised in many similar abominable deeds throwing a lance pierced one of the two brothers through the middle of the breast yet the young man did not fall on the ground though he was slain and perfectly lifeless for the lance which had penetrated through him and the greater part of which came out at his back was by the violence of the impulse fixed in the earth and kept his body suspended by its firmness and rigidity but one of the servants also who was tall and robust giving assistance to that homicide sent from afar a stone with great force at the right arm of the third brother but the stone passing through the extremities of his fingers with a vain impetus fell to the ground innoxious contrary to the opinion of all that were present nevertheless this milder event administered to the most sagacious young man some hope of revenge for pretending that his hand was debilitated by the blow he thus addressed the most cruel wealthy man enjoy the destruction of the whole of our family feed your insatiable cruelty with the blood of three brothers and triumph gloriously over your prostrate citizens only remember that you will always have some neighbour though you may give a still greater and greater extent to the boundaries of your lands for this my right hand which would have entirely cut off your head now being bruised is rendered incapable of effecting this through the iniquity of fate the furious thief being exasperated by this speech seizing a sword rushed on the most miserable young man intending to slay him with his own hand he did not however attack one who was weaker than himself for the young man unexpectedly resisting and far contrary to his opinion seized his right hand with a most strong embrace and brandishing the sword with a great effort expelled the impure soul of the rich man by many and frequent blows and that he might also liberate himself from the hands of his domestics who were running to the assistance of their master he immediately cut his throat with the sword which was yet sprinkled with the blood of his enemy these were the things which the before-mentioned astonishing prodigies had foreshown and these were the circumstances which were narrated to the most miserable master nor could the old man surrounded by so many evils utter any word or even silently weep but seizing the knife with which he had then divided among his guests the cheese and other parts of the dinner he also sorely wounded his own throat with many stabs in imitation of his most unhappy son till falling prone on the table he washed away with a river of new blood the stains of that portentous blood which suddenly burst forth from the earth the gardener commiserating the fate of that house which was after this manner destroyed in the shortest space of time and grievously deploring the cruel events which had taken place and also paying for his dinner with tears and frequently striking together his empty hands he immediately got on my back and returned through the road 
by which we came. His return, however, was not at least innoxious to him, for a certain tall man, who was a legionary soldier, as his dress and appearance indicated, meeting us on the road, asked the gardener in proud and arrogant language whither he was leading an empty ass. But my master, who was yet full of grief, and besides this was ignorant of the Latin tongue, silently passed by him. The soldier, therefore, being indignant at his silence, as a mark of contempt, thrust him from my back, at the same time striking him with the branch of a vine which he held in his hand. Then the gardener suppliantly answered that he could not know what he said through his ignorance of the Latin tongue. The soldier, therefore, subjoining, in Greek, said, Whither do you lead this ass? The gardener answered that he was going to the next city. But I, said the soldier, am in want of its assistance, for it is requisite that it should carry from the neighboring little town with other laboring beasts the baggage of our prefect. And immediately laying hold of the rope by which I was led, he began to draw me along. But the gardener, wiping away the blood which trickled from his head through the wound of the former blow, again entreated the soldier to act by him more humanely and mildly, and this he did, conjuring him by his prosperous hopes. For this ass, said he, is sluggish, and besides this frequently falls to that detestable disease epilepsy, and it is with great difficulty that he usually carries a few bundles of herbs from a neighboring garden, and in doing this he is fatigued, and his respiration is languid. So far is he from being adapted to carry larger burdens. After perceiving, however, that the soldier could not be appeased by any prayers, but was in a greater degree incited to his destruction, and that now having inverted the vine branch, he was preparing to fracture his skull with a larger knot of the branch, he fled to his last resource, and feigning that he wished to embrace his knees in order to excite his compassion, he inclined and bent himself, and taking hold of both his feet, lifted him up and violently dashed him to the ground. Immediately afterwards, likewise, he struck every part of his face, his hands, and his sides, at one time with his fists, at another with his elbows, and besides this he bit him, and beat him with a stone taken up in the road. Nor could the soldier either resist or by any means defend himself after he was laid prostrate on the ground, but could only frequently threaten that if he rose again he would cut him in pieces with his sword. The gardener, being admonished by these words, snatched the sword from him, and throwing it to a great distance again attacked him with severer blows. But the soldier, being prostrate and prevented by wounds from defending himself, as he could not find any other means of safety, feigned that he was dead, which was the only thing that remained for him to do. Then the gardener, taking with him that sword, got on my back and proceeded rapidly in a direct line to the city, and not even thinking of at least visiting his own garden, he betook himself to a certain person with whom he was familiarly acquainted, and having narrated to this friend everything which had happened to him, he implored his assistance in his present dangerous situation, and requested that he would conceal him and his ass for some time, till he had escaped a capital indictment by being latent for two or three days. But this acquaintance, not being forgetful of ancient friendship, promptly received him, and having drawn me, my legs being folded together, by means of a ladder into the highest room of the house, the gardener crept into a certain chest that was in the cellar, and covering himself over with the lid of it, there lay concealed. The soldier, however, as I afterwards learnt, being at length roused, as if from excessive intoxication, nevertheless staggering and feeble, from the pain of so many wounds, and scarcely able to support himself by a staff, came into the city, and fearing to mention to any one of the citizens any particulars of his violence and inertness, but tacitly devouring the injury he had sustained, when he met with some of his fellow soldiers, he then told them of his misfortune. But they were of opinion that he should conceal himself for some time in their military dwelling, for besides his own proper disgrace, he feared also the military genius who presides over the military oath, on account of the sword which he had lost. They, however, having observed our footsteps, diligently applied themselves to the discovery of us, and to their own revenge. Nor was a perfidious neighbor wanting who told them that we were there concealed. 
Then his fellow soldiers went to the magistrates, and pretended that they had lost on the road a very valuable silver vessel belonging to their prefect, and that a certain gardener had found it and was unwilling to restore it, but was now concealed in the house of a friend. Then the magistrates, becoming acquainted with the loss and the name of the prefect, came to the gate of our dwelling, and with a loud voice announced to our host that it would be better for him to deliver us up, who were certainly concealed in his house, than to undergo the danger of losing his life. But he, not being in the least terrified, and consulting the safety of him whom he had taken under his protection, did not confess anything concerning us, and asserted that he had not seen that gardener for some days. On the contrary, the soldiers, swearing by the genius of the emperor, affirmed that he was concealed there, and not in any other place. At length, however, the magistrates were determined, by investigation, to confute him in his obstinate denial. Having therefore sent the lictors into his house, and the other public ministers, they ordered them diligently to explore everything in all the corners of the apartments. But they, having searched, declared that no man, nor even the ass itself, were to be found in any part of the house. Then the altercation became more vehement on both sides, on the part of the soldiers, who asserted that we were certainly there, and frequently implored the assistance of Caesar, and on the part of the master of the house, who denied the accusation, and continually called the gods to testify the truth of what he said. I, therefore, who was in other respects an inquisitive ass, and endued with a restless petulance, when I heard the contention and clamorous murmur, was desirous, by looking through a certain window with my neck in an oblique position, to see what was the meaning of that tumult. And while I was so doing, one of the soldiers, having by chance turned his eyes to my shadow, called all of them to be witnesses of it publicly. Lastly, a great clamour was presently raised, and certain persons immediately coming to me by the assistance of ladders, laid their hands on me, and drew me from the place of my concealment as a captive. And now, without any delay, more carefully exploring everything, and uncovering also the chest, they found the miserable gardener, drew him out from thence, presented him to the magistrates, and led him to a public prison, in order that he might suffer capital punishment. Nor could they refrain from jesting, accompanied with the greatest laughter at my looking out of the window. Whence also the proverb originated, which is very much used, concerning the inspection and shadow of an ass. End of chapter 9, part 2 Recording by Thomas Copeland Chapter 10, Part 1 of The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tim Ferreira The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass, by Apuleius Translated by Thomas Taylor Chapter 10, Part 1 What my master the gardener did on the following day I know not. But the soldier, who was most beautifully beaten, on account of his extreme imbecility, loosened me and brought me away from that manger without the prohibition of any one. From his own tent also, as it appeared to me, he led me into the public road, laden with his own bundles, and perfectly adorned and equipped in a military manner. For he placed on my back a glittering helmet, a shield far more splendid than the rest of the armor, and also a lance, conspicuous for its very long steel head, which he diligently disposed on the top of the bundles, as it is usual to do in an army, not then, indeed, for the sake of discipline, but for the purpose of terrifying miserable travellers. Having, therefore, passed over the plains, which was attended with no difficulty, we came to a certain little town, nor did we then betake ourselves to an inn, but to the house of a decurion. And when the soldier had delivered me to the care of a certain servant, he, without delay, solicitously proceeded to his own prefect, who had the command of a thousand soldiers. I remember that a most wicked and detestable deed was perpetrated in that town a few days after our arrival, but I will insert it in my book that you also may read it. The master of that house had a son, who was a young man of great literary attainments, and, on that account, was consequently remarkable for his piety and modesty, so that you also would wish to have him, or his like, for a son. The mother of this young man having been dead for many years, the father had married again, 
and from another wife had begotten another son, who had now just passed beyond the twelfth year of his age. But the stepmother, who was powerful in the house of her husband, rather from her beauty than the worthiness of her manners, regarded her son-in-law with wanton eyes, whether she was naturally immodest or was impelled by fate to that extreme wickedness. Now, therefore, excellent reader, know that you will peruse a tragedy and not a comedy, and that you will ascend from a shoe to the buskin. As long, however, as the amatory desire which she nourished from the beginning was small, its force being yet imbecile, the woman, easily repressing the slender frame, resisted it in silence. But when love, immoderately raging, burnt the whole of her breast with an insane fire, she was then vanquished by the fierce and tyrannical god, and, feigning illness, she pretended that her disease was not mental, but occasioned by the languid state of her body. Now there is not any one who is ignorant that all the detriments which the health and the face sustain accurately accord both with those that are ill and those that are in love, such as a deformed paleness, marced eyes, weary legs, turbulent sleep, and sighs, more vehement from the slowness of the torment by which they are produced. You might believe she was only agitated by feverish vapors if she had not also wept. Alas, unskillful physicians! What to the pulsation of the artery, immoderate heat, wearied respiration, and the frequent and reciprocal changes and turnings of the sides indicate? Good gods! How easy is the comprehension of amatory desire by one who is learned, though he does not profess the medical art, when he sees someone burning with bodily heat. Being, therefore, more profoundly agitated by the impatience of venereal fury, she at length burst her long silence, and ordered her son to be called to her, which name she would have willingly obliterated in him, in order that she might not, by using it, be admonished of her shameless passion. Nor did the young man make any delay in obeying the mandate of his diseased parent, but, having his forehead wrinkled with sorrow for her pretended illness, like that of an old man, he went into the bedchamber of the wife of his father and the mother of his brother, paying that obedience to which was, in a certain respect, her due. But she, being for a long time fatigued by tormenting silence, and hesitating, as in a shallow of doubt, rejecting every word, which she at first conceived to be most adapted to the present occasion, and even now fluctuating through shame, she was dubious when she should assume the exordium of her speech. The young man, however, not then suspecting anything sinister, with a dejected countenance, spontaneously asked her what were the causes of her present disease. Then she, availing herself of the pernicious opportunity afforded by solitude, burst out into audacity, and weeping abundantly, and hiding her face with her garment, with a trembling voice thus briefly addressed him. You yourself are the whole cause and origin of this my disease, and you are also the remedy and the only health of my life. For those eyes of yours, having penetrated through my eyes into the most inward recesses of my breast, have there excited a most vehement fire. Take pity, therefore, on me, who am perishing for your sake nor should your reverential regard for your father at all deter you, since, by complying with my wishes, you will preserve for him a wife who must otherwise die. For I justly love you, in consequence of recognizing his image in your face. You will be perfectly secure on account of the solitude of the place, and you will also have leisure sufficient for the accomplishment of this necessary crime. For that which no one knows has nearly no existence." The young man, being disturbed by the sudden evil, though he immediately abhorred such an abominable deed, yet did not think it fit to exasperate her by the unseasonable severity of a denial, but to appease her by the procrastination of a crafty promise. He promised, therefore, abundantly, and earnestly persuaded her to keep up her spirits, restore her strength by nutriment, and pay attention to her health, till a free space of time should be granted to pleasure, by some journey of his father. And he immediately withdrew himself from the noxious view of his stepmother. Conceiving likewise that this great destruction with which his house was threatened required more abundant counsel, he immediately related the affair to a certain aged tutor of well-tried gravity and prudence. And, after long continued deliberation, nothing seemed to be so salutary as to escape the tempest of raging fortune by a rapid flight. But the woman, being impatient even of the smallest delay, having devised a certain occasion, immediately persuaded her husband, with wonderful art, to take a journey, with all speed, to certain little farms which were situated at a great distance. Which being done, she, precipitately, urged by the insanity of accelerated hope, demands the accomplishment of the promised gratification of her lust. The young man, however, avoids her execrable sight, adducing at one time this thing, and at another that, as the cause of his delay. Till she, manifestly perceiving from the variety of his messages that he refused to fulfill his promise to her, transferred with the lubricous mobility, her nefarious love to a far more pernicious hatred. 
and immediately calling a most iniquitous servant whom she had brought with her dowry to her husband and who was prepared for the perpetration of any wickedness she communicated to him the counsels of her perfidy nor did anything seem to them to be better than to deprive the miserable young man of life she immediately therefore sent this villainous servant to buy the most effective poison and having diligently diluted it with wine she prepared it for the destruction of her innocent son-in-law and while the wicked servant and stepmother deliberate with themselves about the fit time of giving him the poison it happened that the junior youth who was the proper son of this most abandoned woman returning home after the labor of his morning studies and being thirsty after taking his breakfast found the cup of wine in which the enclosed poison was concealed and drank it up at one draught being ignorant of the latent fraud which it contained who as soon as he had drank the death which had been prepared for his brother fell lifeless on the ground immediately the tutor of the youth being agitated by his sudden death called the mother and all the family with a howling clamor and now the case of the noxious potion being known each of those that were present ascribed to different authors the nefarious deed but that dire woman and who was a singular example of novercal malice not being at all moved by the bitter death of her son nor by the consciousness of parricide nor by the misfortune of her house nor the grief of her husband nor funereal sorrow took a shorter method of revenge by the destruction of her family she immediately therefore sent a courier to inform her husband on his journey of the calamity that had befallen his house and on his arrival he having rapidly returned she assuming excessive audacity pretended that her son was destroyed by poison administered to him by her son-in-law and in asserting this indeed she did not altogether speak falsely because the boy had preoccupied the death which was prepared for the young man but she feigned that the younger brother was destroyed through the wickedness of her son-in-law because he was unwilling to give assistance to the disgraceful lust by which her son-in-law had endeavored to commit adultery with her nor was she contented with lies so enormous but she also added that he threatened her with a sword because she had detected his wickedness then the unhappy man being greatly afflicted by the death of both his sons is agitated like the waves of the sea with mighty tempests of sorrow for he saw his younger son buried before his face and he knew that his other son would certainly be condemned to death for incest and parricide besides this also he was impelled to extreme hatred of this son by the feigned lamentations of his too dearly beloved wife scarcely therefore were the funeral rites pertaining to the interment of his son performed when immediately the miserable old man hastily proceeded from his pyre to the forum irrigating his face with tears yet recent and tearing his hoary hairs defiled with ashes and there with all his passions at work he endeavors to procure the destruction of his remaining son both by tears and supplications and for this purpose also embracing the knees of the senators being ignorant of the fraud of the most abandoned woman he exclaimed that his son was incestuous through his attempting to violate the paternal bed a parricide through the death of his brother and a matricide because he had attempted to kill his stepmother lastly thus lamenting he inflamed with so much commiseration and with such great indignation the senate and the people that laying aside the tediousness of a judicial process and the manifest proofs of accusation and also the meditated labyrinths of answer they all cried out that a public evil should be punished publicly and that the author of it should be destroyed by being overwhelmed with stones in the meantime the magistrates through the fear of peculiar danger namely lest sedition should proceed from the small elements of indignation to the destruction of discipline in the city itself began partly to beseech the senators and partly to restrain the people that sentence might be pronounced conformably to the civil law judgment being properly passed according to the custom of their ancestors and the allegations on both sides equitably examined they added that no one should be condemned without a hearing after the manner of barbaric fierceness or tyrannic violence since by doing so they would leave in this time of profound peace a dire example to posterity the salutary council pleased them and immediately the crier was ordered to proclaim that the senators should assemble together in the senate house but when these were seated in their accustomed places according to the order of their dignity the crier again calling the first accuser came forward then in the last place the defendant also being cited was introduced and the crier in conformity to the attic law and that of the areopagus announced to the advocates that they should plead without preambles and without endeavouring to excite commiseration i knew that these things were thus transacted from what was said by many in their conferences with each other but as i was not present at the trial because i was tied to the manger i could not know what words the accuser employed nor by what arguments the defendant confuted him nor in short what were the speeches and answers nor can i narrate to you things of which i am ignorant 
but I shall only commit to writing what I have found to be certainly true. For as soon as the contention of the orators was finished, the senators thought fit that the truth and credibility of the crime should be shown by certain proofs, and that a thing of such consequence should not be left to suspicions and conjecture. They likewise thought it requisite that the servant who was said to be the only one that knew these things were thus transacted, should by all means be brought forward. Nor was that disciple of the cross in the least disturbed, either by the doubtful event of so great a prosecution, or by the view of a full court, or even by his own evil conscience, but began to affirm and assert those things which he had himself devised, as if they were true. For he said, that the young man, being indignant with the fastidiousness of his mother-in-law, had called him, that in order to avenge the injury he had ordered him to destroy her son, that he had promised him a great reward if he was silent, that on his refusing to do what he wished, he had threatened him with death, that he had delivered to him the poison diluted with his own hand, to be given to his brother, and that on his suspecting he had neglected to give him the potion, and had reserved it for a proof of the crime, he at length had extended it to the boy with his own hand. When this villainous knave, with a feigned trepidation, had uttered these egregious lies, which had very much the appearance of truth, the inquiries and proofs were finished. Nor was any one of the senators so favorable to the young man as not to pronounce that he ought to be sewed up in a leathern sack, as he was evidently found to be guilty of the crime of which he was accused. The opinions of all of them being concordant, according to the custom perpetually observed, they were to have been committed to writing in tablets or shells, and put into an urn, after which the die being cast it was not lawful for anything to be changed, but the life of the accused person was in the hand of the executioner. Before this, however, could be done, a certain physician belonged to the Senate of an advanced age, of transcendent fidelity, and of great authority, covering with his hand the orifice of the urn, lest any one should rashly put into it his shell, thus addressed the court. I rejoice that I have lived long, because, even as far as to this period of my life, I have obtained your approbation. Nor will I suffer a manifest homicide to be perpetrated, since this defendant is accused of false crimes nor you who, being bound by an oath, act as judges to commit perjury, being induced to do so by the lying testimony of a servant. I myself cannot bear to decide iniquitously, deceiving my own conscience, and trampling on the reverence which is due to the gods. Learn, therefore, from me the truth of the affair. This villainous fellow, being solicitous to procure the most effective poison, which he said was necessary for a certain sick person, who, being vehemently afflicted by the long continuance of an incurable disease, was anxious to withdraw himself from the torments of life. This fellow came to me some time ago, and offered me a hundred golden solidi, which is to say a hundred shillings, for the purchase of the poison. But I, perceiving the vain blabbering of that iniquitous knave, and that he assigned unappropriate causes, and also being certain that he was about to perpetrate something iniquitous, I gave him indeed a potion, but providing for an investigation into the affair which might be made at some future time, I did not immediately accept the price which he offered me. But I said to him, Lest by chance some one of these golden solidi which you offer me should be found to be bad, or adulterated, deposit them in this bag, and impress it with your own seal, till they are to-morrow examined in the presence of a banker. Being persuaded by what I said, he sealed the money, which, immediately after he was brought here to give evidence, I ordered one of my servants to take speedily from my shop and bring it to this place. And behold, I will exhibit them to you taken out of the bag. Let him see and recognize his own seal, for how can the son-in-law of the stepmother be accused of having procured the poison which this servant bought? After this a great trepidation seized the villain, a deadly paleness succeeded to his native color, and a cold sweat ran through all his members. Then he began to move his feet with uncertain alternations, to scratch now this, now that part of his head, and to utter foolish I know not what trifles, stammering with a half-closed mouth, so that no one could justly think him to be entirely innocent of the crime. His craft, however, being again restored, he did not cease to deny the charge most firmly, and to accuse the physician of a lie. But the physician, independently of his being bound by oath to decide justly, when he saw that his honor was openly lacerated, endeavored with an increased effort to confute that nefarious knave, till the public servants, by order of the magistrates, taking hold of the hands of the most iniquitous servant, found the iron ring and compared it with the seal of the bag, which comparison corroborated the preceding suspicion nor were the wheel and the rack called Aquilius wanting, prepared for the purpose of tormenting him, after the manner of the Greeks. But he, being strengthened by a wonderful audacity, did not succumb to any blows, nor even the fire itself. Then the physician said, I will not suffer, by Hercules, I will not suffer, either that you should punish that innocent young man unjustly, 
or that this fellow should escape the punishment of his nefarious deed, our judgment being frustrated. For I will give you an evident proof of the present affair. When this most abandoned man was anxious to procure the deadly poison, but I did not think it accorded with my art to administer to any one the causes of death, having learnt that medicine was not sought after for the destruction but for the preservation of men, fearing lest if I refused to give it to him I should open for him a path to wickedness by an unseasonable repulse, and that he would accomplish the nefarious design he had begun, either by buying a deadly potion for some other person, or, lastly, by the sword or some different weapon. Fearing this, I gave him not poison, but a preparation of that somniferous plant mandrake, famous for the torpor which it occasions, and which produces a sleep most similar to death. Nor is it wonderful that this most desperate knave, being certain of suffering the extreme punishment which must befall him conformably to the custom of our ancestors, should easily endure these torments as things of a lighter nature. But if the boy has really taken the potion which was tempered by my hands, he still lives, is in a quiescent state, and sleeps, and immediately on the oppressive sleep being dissipated he will return to the lucid day. But if he has truly perished, if he is truly overtaken by death, you may from other sources investigate the causes of his destruction. The old man, having thus addressed the senators, they assented to what he said, and immediately proceeded with great haste to that sepulchre, in which the body of the boy was deposited. There was not any one of the senate, nor any one among those of the first rank, that did not run thither impelled by curiosity. And behold, the father himself, having with his own hands removed the lid of the coffin, found his son rising from death, the deadly sleep being just then dissipated. And having most closely embraced him, and not being able to express in words his present joy, he led him forth to the people, and the boy was brought into court in the condition in which he still was bound and wrapped in funeral garments. Now, likewise, the naked truth was obvious to every one, the wickedness being manifested of the most iniquitous servant, and of the still more abandoned woman. And the stepmother, indeed, was condemned to perpetual exile, but the servant was hanged, and by the consent of all, the golden solidi were given to the good physician, as the reward of the opportune sleep which he had procured. Thus the famous and fabulous fortune of that old man received a termination worthy the providence of the gods, since, in a slender moment, or rather in the smallest point of time, he suddenly became the father of two young men, after he had been in danger of losing both. But I, at that time, was rolled about by such tempestuous waves of fate as the following. That soldier who brought me without any one selling me, and who made me his own without price, paying due obedience to the mandate of his tribute, being about to carry letters to the great prince, which is to say to the emperor, towards Rome, sold me for eleven pence to two servants in the neighborhood who were brothers. The master of these was a very opulent man, but one of them was a confectioner who made bread and eatables tempered with honey, and the other was a cook, who by the assistance of heat made minced meat seasoned with the sweetest juices of bruised herbs and aromatics. These two, dwelling together, lived in common, and bought me for the purpose of carrying those numerous vessels which were necessary to their masters for various uses, when they travelled through many regions. I was taken, therefore, as a third companion with those, not having at any time of my transformation experienced a fortune so benevolent. For in the evening, after most sumptuous suppers, and the most splendid apparatus of them, my masters were accustomed to take into their own little room many fragments. One of them, the most ample remains of pigs, chickens, fishes, and mincemeat of every kind, but the other, bread, pastry, spice cakes, tarts in the shapes of hooks and lizards, and many honeyed sweetmeats. When these two, having fastened the door of their chamber, went to the baths for the sake of refreshing themselves, I abundantly feasted myself on the dainties which were offered to me through the favor of the gods. For I was not so stupid and so truly an ass as to eat very hard and rough hay, neglecting that most delicious food. And for a long time, indeed, the artifice of my theft succeeded most beautifully, because as yet I stole timidly, and in a sufficiently sparing manner, a few things out of so many, and they did not suspect any fraud in an ass. But when becoming still more confident of concealment, I devoured the most exquisite fragments, and, rejecting the more rancid, began to eat the sweeter morsels. No small suspicion stimulated the minds of the brothers. And though they did not then believe any such thing of me, nevertheless they diligently investigated the author of their daily loss. At length, also, they accused each other of that most disgraceful rapin, and now they bestowed greater care and a more vigilant observation, and counted the fragments. At length, being no longer restrained by bashfulness, one of them thus addressed the other. 
it is neither equitable nor courteous that you should daily purloin the choicest parts and by selling them latently increase your wealth and yet contend for an equal division of what remains for in short if our partnership is displeasing to you we may indeed remain brothers so far as pertains to everything else and yet depart from this bond of communion for i see that complaint of the loss proceeding to infinity nourishes very great discord between us to this the other replied i also by hercules applaud your perseverance that after you have daily and secretly stolen fragments you have prevented the complaint which i have for a long time silently and sorrowfully retained lest i should seem to accuse my brother of sordid rapine but it is well that by speaking to each other we seek a remedy for our loss lest our dissembled hatred increasing by silence should excite in us Eteoclean contentions. After these and other similar reproaches arising from their mutual altercation, they both of them swore that they had not committed any fraud nor any theft, but agreed that they ought by all possible means to search after the thief who was the cause of their common loss. For they said, it was not possible that the ass, which alone was present, could be delighted with such kind of food, and yet the choicest portions of it were daily not to be found. They added that neither did flies so large as were the harpies of old, who took away by violence the foods of Phineas, wing their way into their apartment. In the meantime, I, being largely fed with dainty morsels, and abundantly satisfied with human food, filled my body with gross fat, rendered my hide soft with succulent suet, and nourished my hairs with a liberal neatness. But that gracefulness of my body produced a great disgrace to my modesty, for they being excited to suspicion by the unusual distension of my hide, and perceiving that my hay remained daily untouched, they now directed all their attention to me, and having as usual shut the doors at the accustomed hour, as if they were going to the baths, they beheld me through a certain small chink, intently eating the fragments which were everywhere exposed. Now, therefore, laying aside all concern for their loss, they burst into a loud laugh, admiring the monstrous delicacies of an ass, and having called many of their fellow-servants, they pointed out to them the veracity of a sluggish ass, a thing horrible to relate. At length laughter so great and so unrestrained seized on all of them, that it also reached the ears of the master who was passing that way. He, therefore, inquiring what good had occurred to make his servants laugh so excessively, and having learnt what the affair was, he, likewise, looking through the same chink, was extremely delighted. And afterwards, he also breaking out into laughter so unrestrained as to cause pain in his intestines, and having opened the door of the chamber, came nearer to me, and considered me more attentively. For I, beholding the countenance of fortune, in a certain respect, smiling more propitiously upon me, continued eating tranquilly, not in the least disturbed. The joy of those that were present afforded me confidence, till the master of the house, being exhilarated by the novelty of this spectacle, ordered me to be led to the supper-room, or rather he brought me to it with his own hands, and the table being furnished, he directed every kind of solid food to be placed before me, and such delicacies as had not been touched. But I, though I was well crammed, yet desiring to render myself more acceptable and more commendable to him, ate as if I had been hungry of the food that was placed before me. For they, prompted by curiosity, thinking of everything which an ass mostly abhors, offered it to me, for the purpose of exploring my mildness, such as flesh seasoned with the juice of the herb masterwort, birds sprinkled over with pepper, and fish that had been pickled. In the meantime the banquet resounded with excessive laughter. End of chapter 10, part 1。chapter 10, part 2 of the Metamorphosis or Golden Ass。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tim Ferreira. The Metamorphosis or Golden Ass by Apuleius. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter 10. Part 2. At length a certain buffoon who was present said, Give some wine to this guest. To which the master assenting answered, Knave, you have not spoken absurdly, for it is very possible that our comrade will also willingly drink a cup of mead. And he said, Come hither, boy. Wash well that golden cup. Fill it with mead and offer it to my parasite, and at the same time admonish him that I have previously drank to him. After this, the great expectation was exciting among the guests. Nevertheless, I, not being at all disturbed, drank at one draught all that was contained in that most capacious cup, leisurely and in a sufficiently pleasant manner, incurvating the extremity of my lip in the shape of a tongue. A clamor was raised, through all of them, with one according voice, drinking my health. Lastly, the master, being excessively joyful, and having called the servants that bought me, ordered that four times the sum which they paid for me should be given to them, 
and he delivered me to a certain person who had been his slave, but was now manumitted, to whom he was very much attached, and who was very rich, and desired him to pay me every requisite attention. This man nourished me in a sufficiently humane and kind manner, and, that he might render himself more acceptable to his patron, most studiously furnished him with delight through my pleasantry. And, in the first place, indeed, he taught me to sit down at table, leaning on my elbow, afterwards to wrestle and to dance, my forefeet being elevated, and, which was especially admirable, to use signs instead of words, so that I could indicate what I wished by raising, and what I did not wish by declining my head. He also taught me, when I was thirsty, to look at the cup-bearer, and to ask for drink by alternately closing my eyes. And to all these things I was very readily obedient, which, indeed, I should have done, though no one had shown me how to do them. But I was fearful, lest, if I should happen to perform them, after the manner of men, without a master, most would think it portended sinister events, and that I, as a monster and prodigy, should lose my head and be given for fat provender to vultures. And now my fame was spread abroad publicly, by which I rendered my master illustrious and famous, through my wonderful arts. This, said the people, is the man who has an ass for his guest and associate, an ass that wrestles and dances, that jests and understands the language of men, and indicates what it means by nods. It is now, however, requisite that I should inform you, though I ought to have done it in the beginning, who that Tiasus was, or whence he originated, for this was the name of my master. The country in which he was born was Corinth, which city ranks as the chief of all the province of Achaea, and, as he had gradually obtained all the honors which his pedigree and dignity demanded, he had been appointed to the office of quinquennial magistrate. In order, therefore, that he might act conformably to the splendor of that office, he had promised that he would exhibit, during the space of three days, the spectacle of prize-fighting, but he had still more amply extended his munificence. Lastly, he had then also come to Thessaly, through the desire of public glory, in order to procure from thence the most noble wild beasts and famous gladiators. And now, having bought and disposed of everything according to his wish, he was preparing to return home. Despising, however, his own most splendid chariots, and undervaluing his beautiful coaches and wagons, which were drawn along empty at the extremity of his train, some of them being covered and others open, neglecting also the Thessalonian horses and his other Gallic laboring beasts, by which a generous offspring bears testimony to the precious dignity of its origin. Despising and neglecting all these, he rode most lovingly on me, who was decorated with golden trappings, dyed saddles, purpled coverings, silver bridles, painted girths, and very sonorous little bells, and sometimes he spoke to me in the most courteous language. Among many other things also which he said, he professed to be in the highest degree delighted that he possessed in me at one and the same time a companion and a carrier. But when, having finished our journey, partly by land and partly by sea, we came to Corinth, a great crowd of citizens ran to meet us, not so much for the purpose of doing honor to Tiasus, as from a desire of seeing me. For so great a rumor had pervaded that city about me, that I was the source of no small gain to my governor, who, when he perceived many longings with great desire to see my sports, he shut the door and introduced each of them separately, having first received money from them, by which means he was accustomed daily to collect no small sums. In that assembly there was a certain matron, powerful and opulent, who, after the manner of the rest, having purchased a sight of me, and from thenceforth was delighted with my multiform pastimes, fell, at length, gradually, through her continual admiration, into a wonderful desire of enjoying me, and, not applying any remedy to her insane lust, ardently waited for my embraces, like an asinine pacifae. At length she prevailed on my keeper, for a great sum of money, to let me lie with her for one night. But that knave, in order that he might drive advantage from me, being only satisfied with his own gain, assented. And now, the laborious and wakeful night being finished, the woman withdrew from my embraces, avoiding the conscious testimony of the light, and making a contract with my keeper for some future night, at the same price. Nor did he unwillingly accede to her voluptuous desires, partly induced by the very ample reward which he received from her, and partly through the opportunity afforded him of preparing a new spectacle for his lord to whom, without delay, he unfolded the whole scene of our lust. But he, having magnificently rewarded his manumitted servant, destined me to be shown in public, and, because that egregious wife of mine could not be publicly connected with me, on account of her dignity, nor any other could be found for the same purpose, a certain vile woman, who had been sentenced by the prefect to be devoured by wild beasts, was procured, for a great sum of money, to have connection with me in the enclosure of the theatre, in the sight of all the spectators. Of this woman I have heard the following history. She had a husband, a young man, whose father, undertaking a journey, ordered his wife, who was the mother of that same young man, in whom he left oppressed with the burden of pregnancy, that if she brought forth an infant of the inferior sex, she should immediately cause that of which was delivered to be slain. 
but she during the absence of her husband having brought forth a girl and being moved by the pious affection naturally inherent in a mother revolted from the mandate of her husband and delivered it to be nourished by one of her neighbors her husband also now having returned she told him that she had been delivered of a daughter and that she was destroyed but as soon as the flower of age required a nuptial day should be appointed for the virgin and as she could not give a dowry suitable to the parentage of her daughter unknown to her husband she did that which she could alone do namely she unfolded the secret to her son which had hitherto been concealed in silence for she was very much afraid lest he by some accident erring through the impulse of juvenile ardour should ignorantly have connection with his sister who also was ignorant that he was her brother but this young man who was remarkably pious and who religiously obeyed the mandates of his mother and performed the duties due to his sister delivered the arcana of his house to the custody of venerable silence exhibiting only by his countenance a vulgar benevolence toward his sister and he undertook in such a way to perform the necessary duty of consanguinity that he received her into the protection of her own house as if she had been some desolate neighboring virgin and deprived of the guardian care of her parents and soon after he placed her with a certain most dear associate of his and most liberally bestowed on her a dowry from his own property but these things being well disposed and in the best manner and with all sanctity could not escape the deadly knot of fortune by whose impulse a cruel rivalship immediately directed its course to the house of the young man and the same wife of his who now was condemned to wild beasts for these very crimes began first to entertain a suspicion of the girl as the rival of her bed and a harlot in the next place to defeat her and in the third place to contrive the most cruel snares for her destruction in the last place she devised the following wicked stratagem having stolen the ring of her husband she went into the country and from thence sent a servant who was faithful indeed to her but perfectly hostile to fidelity herself and told him to inform the girl that the young man was gone to her village and desired her to come to him and added that she was to go alone with all possible celerity and without any attendant and lest any doubt should happen to arise in her mind about the propriety of going she delivered to him the ring which she had taken from her husband which being shown would give credibility to his words but she complying with the mandate of her brother for she alone knew that he was her brother and having also inspected his seal which was shown to her strenuously hastened to go unattended as she was desired to do as soon however as through the deception of extreme fraud she fell into the snares which were prepared for her then that egregious wife being insanely excited by the stimulus of libidinous fury in the first place indeed having stripped her naked whipped her even to the extremity of torment and afterwards though she explained the things it really was and also exclaimed that she in vain boiled over with indignation through conceiving her to be a harlot and frequently repeated the name of her brother she slew her by thrusting a burning torch into her private parts as if she had lied and invented all that she had told her then the brother and her husband being excited by the news of her cruel death flew to her and having mourned the fate of the girl with various lamentations committed her to the grave nor could the young man endure with equanimity such a miserable death of his sister by her by whom it was by no means equitable it should have been occasioned but being most profoundly grieved and wholly possessed by the noxious fury of the most vehement bile he began from that time to burn with a raging fever so that for him also a remedy seemed to be necessary but his wife who some time ago had lost the name together with the fidelity of a wife went to a certain physician well known for his perfidy who being famous for his victories in many contests could enumerate great trophies which his right hand had obtained and immediately promised him fifty sestertia in order that he indeed might sell poison so efficacious as to destroy in a moment but that she might buy the death of her husband this being done she and the physician pretended that the most excellent potion which they had brought and which the more learned call sacred was necessary for mitigating pains of the viscera and carrying off the bile but in its stead they substituted a potion sacred to the health of proserpine and now the physician extended to the sick man with his own hand the well-tempered cup his own family and some of his friends and kindred being present but that audacious woman in order that she might destroy the physician the partner of her guilt and at the same time be enriched by the money which she had promised retaining the cup in the sight of all of them said o best of physicians you shall not give this potion to my most dear husband till you have drank a good part of it yourself for how do i know whether a noxious poison may not be concealed in it and this is a thing which should by no means offend you who are a man so prudent and learned that i as a religious wife being solicitous for the safety of my husband perform a necessary duty of piety the physician being suddenly agitated by the desperate audacity of the cruel woman and totally deprived of all counsel and of every opportunity of thinking through the shortness of the time 
drank largely of the potion, before he had raised any suspicion of his evil conscience by any trepidation or delay. And the young man, following his example, took the cup and drank what was offered to him. The present business being thus transacted, the physician prepared to return home with the greatest celerity, in order that he might extinguish the deadly power of the poison which he had taken by a salutiferous potion. But the barbarous woman, persisting in the same sacrilegious obstinacy as that which she had adopted from the first, would not suffer him to depart from her the breadth of a nail, till, as she said, the effect of the medicine was evidently proved, in consequence of the potion being distributed through the whole body. But being much, and for a long time, wearied by his prayers and earnest entreaties, she at length scarcely permitted him to depart. In the meantime his most inward parts attracted the occult destruction, which raged through all his viscera, and, at last, he with great difficulty came to his own house very ill, and now oppressed with a somnolent heaviness. Scarcely also being able to narrate every particular, he ordered his wife to demand, at least, the promised reward of a double death. And thus that most illustrious physician, being destroyed by violence, gave up the ghost. Nor did that young man live any longer than the physician, but perished by a similar kind of death, amidst the fictitious and false tears of his wife. And he, being now buried after a few days, had intervened, during which funeral rites are performed to the dead, the wife of the physician came and demanded the money which was due for the double death. But the woman, always like herself, overpowering the real form of fidelity and exhibiting only its image, mildly answered her and promised everything liberally and abundantly, and agreed to pay the stipulated sum without delay, only adding that she wished she could give her a little of that potion for the purpose of accomplishing the business she had begun. This the wife of the physician, inveigled by the many snares of the most wicked frauds, readily consented to do and, that she might render herself more acceptable to the opulent woman, hastily returned home, and immediately afterwards delivered her the whole box of poison. Having therefore now obtained the grand instrument of wickedness, she extended far and wide her sanguinary hands. She had a little daughter by the husband whom she had lately killed, and she was very indignant that the laws would necessarily give to this little one the inheritance of her father. Greedily desiring also the whole patrimony of her daughter, she waited only for an opportunity of destroying her. Being certain, therefore, that mothers received the immature inheritances of their deceased children, she showed herself to be such a parent as she had proved herself to be a wife, and pretending to prepare a dinner, in consequence of a circumstance that had occurred, she attacked with the same poison both the wife of the physician and her own daughter. But that deadly venom immediately consumed the slender life and delicate and tender viscera of the little girl. The wife of the physician, however, while the tempest of the detestable potion wandered through her lungs with its noxious windings, first suspecting what the thing was, and afterwards, through the oppression of her breath, being now more certain that her suspicion was right, went to the house of the prefect of the province, and, with a great clamor, imploring his assistance, a tumult of the people also being excited, in consequence of the disclosure she was about to make of such barbarous wickedness, she occasioned both the house and the ears of the prefect to be immediately opened. And now, having accurately narrated all the atrocities of this most cruel woman, from the beginning, being suddenly seized with a dark vertigo of the mind, she compressed her lips, which were still half open, and having for a long time produced a crashing noise by the gnashing of her teeth, she fell lifeless before the feet of the prefect. But he, though he was a man accustomed to things of this kind, would not suffer the multiform wickedness of this execrable sorceress to flag by a languid delay, but immediately ordered the chambermaids of the woman to be brought before him, and by the force of torments exhorted from them the truth. He also sentenced her to a punishment, which was indeed less than she deserved, namely, that she should be cast to wild beasts, because he could not find any other torment so adapted to the enormity of her guilt. With such a woman as this it was determined that I should be publicly connected, as if I had been lawfully married to her. And, being very much vexed, I waited with great anxiety for the day of the spectacle, being frequently willing to destroy myself with my own hand, rather than be defiled by coming into contact with such an abandoned woman, or be defamed by the disgrace of a public spectacle. But, as I was deprived of human hands, and was also destitute of fingers, I could by no means draw a sword with my round and imperfect hoof. However, I consoled myself, in my extreme misery, with a slender hope, because the spring now beginning to appear would paint everything with florid buds, and would now clothe the meadows with a purple splendor, and roses would then burst forth, exhaling the sweetest odors, which would restore me to my former Lucius, which is to say, my pristine form. Behold, the day destined to the spectacle was present, and I was led into the arena, the people following me with triumphant applause. And while the beginning of the spectacle was dedicated to the sportive dances of the players, I, in the meantime, being placed before the gate, gladly fed on the very flourishing grass which germinated at the entrance, 
now and then also refreshing my inquisitive eyes with the most agreeable prospect of the spectacle because the gate was open for boys and virgins flourishing in florid youth conspicuous for their beauty in splendid garments acting as they walked dancing the greek pyrrhic dance and disposed in rank performed graceful circuits now turning round in an orb like a wheel now connected by their hands in an oblique order and afterwards being disposed into the form of a wedge with a square aperture and then becoming separated into two troops but after the clangor of the terminating trumpet had dissolved the manifold circuits of the reciprocal movements the hangings being removed and the curtains folded a representation of the fable of paris was prepared as follows there was a wooden mountain made in imitation of that celebrated mountain which homer calls ida this was of a lofty structure was planted with grass plats and living trees and from its highest top emitted river water from a fountain flowing through the contrivance of the artist a few goats cropped the grass and a certain young man excellently clothed with barbaric vestments dependent from his shoulders and having his head covered with golden tiara after the manner of the phrygian shepherd paris pretended to be skilled in the pastoral discipline a beautiful boy also was present naked except that a robe adapted to a child covered his left shoulder this boy was every way conspicuous for his yellow hair among which little golden wings associated by a similar alliance were prominent and the caduceus and the wand indicated that the boy was mercury he running with a dancing motion and carrying in his right hand an apple gilt with spangles extended it to him who represented paris and announced to him by signs the mandate of jupiter immediately after elegantly receding he departed from the view a girl succeeded of a beautiful face and resembling the goddess juno for her head was begirt with a white diadem and she also carried a sceptre another virgin entered whom you might believe to be minerva having her head covered with a fulgid helmet and the helmet itself was covered with an olive-coloured crown she also lifted up a shield which is to say the aegis and shook a spear and appeared to be such as she is when she fights after these another female entered of surpassing beauty representing venus by the decoration of her divine colour and such as venus was when she was a virgin exhibiting perfect beauty in a body naked and uncovered except that her private parts were inumbrated by a thin silken garment the fringe of which the busy wind in a sufficiently amorous manner now wantonly blew back that being removed the flower of her age might be manifest and now luxuriantly blew upon that by close adherence the pleasure which the members the private parts were formed to give might be delineated but the colour itself of the goddess was various to the view for her body was white because she descended from heaven and her silken garment was azure because she emerged from the sea and now the several virgins who represented goddesses were surrounded by their attendants juno indeed by castor and pollux whose heads were covered with round helmets conspicuous by the stars which glittered on their summits but these representatives of the twin brothers were young actors this virgin juno proceeding with a tranquil and unaffected gesticulation conformably to the various modulations of the wantonly sounding flute promised the shepherd by modest signs that she would bestow on him the empire of all asia if he had judged to her the palm of beauty but two boys who represented terror and fear the armor-bearing attendants of the warlike goddess dancing with drawn swords surrounded that virgin who by the arms with which she was adorned represented minerva and a piper who was behind her played a dorian which is to say a warlike tune and mingling sharp tinkling with flat sounds excited the vigor of brisk dancing after the manner of a trumpet this girl by tossing her head looking with threatening eyes and walking with a quick and intorted step signified to paris by her cheerful gesticulation that if he gave to her the victory of beauty he should become through her assistance brave and illustrious by the trophies of war then venus stood gracefully in the very middle of the scene sweetly smiling accompanied by the great applause of the spectators and surrounded by a crowd of rejoicing boys you would say that those smooth and fair boys were cupids and real cupids who had just then descended from heaven or emerged from the sea for they admirably resembled them by their small wings their little arrows and the rest of their external habiliments they also bore splendid torches before their mistress as if she had been going to some nuptial banquet unmarried girls likewise a graceful progeny were there assembled here the most pleasing graces there the most beautiful hours who rendering their goddess propitious by throwing flowers made into garlands or loose formed the most elegant choir and soothed the goddess of pleasure with the hair of the spring now pipes with many perforations sweetly send forth lydian modulations and while they delightfully allure the minds of the spectators venus in a far more delectable manner began placidly to move herself and to proceed with a gentle and slow step the spine of her back at the same time lightly undulating 
in her head gradually moving, and thus she conformed her delicate gestures to the soft sound of the pipes. At one time also she gently winked, and at another sharply threatened with her eyes, and sometimes danced with them alone. This girl, as soon as she came into the presence of the judge, which is to say of the scenic Paris, seemed to promise by the motion of her arms that she would give to Paris a wife of surpassing beauty, Helen, and like herself if he would prefer her to the other goddesses. Then the Phrygian young man delivered with a willing mind to the girl the golden apple which he held in his hands as an indication that she had conquered. Why, therefore, do you wonder, O most vile heads, or rather forensic cattle, or still more properly gowned vultures, if all judges now sell their decisions for money? For even in the most remote periods of antiquity, favor could corrupt the judgment which was agitated between gods and men, and a young man who was a rustic and a shepherd, being elected a judge by the decision of the great Jupiter, sold the first judicial decision for the lucre of lust, accompanied likewise by the destruction of all his race. Thus also by Hercules another judgment posterior to this was given between the illustrious leaders of the Greeks, either when Palamedes, who excelled in erudition and science, was condemned by false accusations as a traitor, or when the mendicant Ulysses was preferred to the mighty Ajax, who was preeminent in military prowess. And of what kind was that judgment which was the decision of the law-giving Athenians, who were a wise people and the master of all science? Was not that divinely prudent old man Socrates, whom the Delphic god preferred for his wisdom to all mortals, circumvented by the fraud and envy of a most iniquitous faction, as if he had been a corrupter of youth, though he restrained them as with a bridle? Was not he destroyed by the noxious juice of a pestilent herb, leaving to his fellow citizens the stain of perpetual infamy? Since even now the most excellent philosophers choose his most holy sect before all others, and swear in his name for the greatest and most earnest desire of beatitude. Lest, however, someone should blame this impetus of my indignation, thus thinking with himself, Behold now, shall we suffer an ass to philosophize to us? I shall again return to the narration from whence I digressed. After that judgment of Paris was finished, Juno, indeed, and Minerva departed from the theatre, sad and enraged, and showed by their gestures the indignation which they felt from being rejected. But Venus, full of joy and hilarity, exhibited her gladness by dancing with all her choir. Then wine, mixed with crocus, burst forth on high from the summit of the mountain, through a certain latent tube, and flowing in scattered streams sprinkled as it fell, and an odoriferous shower, the goats that fed round it till being dyed into a better form, they changed their proper whiteness into a saffron color. And now, the whole theatre exhaling a sweet odour, a gulf of the earth absorbed that wooden mountain. When, behold, a certain soldier ran through the middle of the street in order to bring, to the people now demanding it, that woman from the public prison, who, as I have said, was condemned to wild beasts on account of her multiform wickedness, and detained to be my illustrious bride. What was intended also to be our genial bed could be most distinctly seen, for it was transparent, being made from the Indian tortoise, was tumid with a plumous heap, and floored with a silken coverlet. But I, besides the shame of being publicly connected, and besides the contagion of a wicked and polluted woman, was also in the highest degree tormented with the fear of death, thus thinking with myself, that in the venereal embrace, while we were adhering to each other, whatever wild beast should be sent in to the destruction of the woman, it would not be so prudent and sagacious, or so tutored by art, or so frugal and temperate, as to lacerate the woman who was placed by my side, and spare me as one uncondemned and innoxious. Being therefore solicitous, not for my modesty, but for my life, while liberty was granted to me of indulging my own thoughts, my master being intent on aptly preparing the bed, and all his servants being partly occupied in hunting, and partly attentive to the voluptuous spectacle. No one believing that so mild an ass required to be so attentively guarded, I gradually withdrew myself by an occult flight. And when I arrived at the next gate, I hurried away with most rapid steps. When also, with great celerity, I had travelled over six thousand entire paces, I arrived at Kentria, which city, indeed, is said to be the most noble economy of the Corinthians. But it is contiguous to the Aegean and Saronic Sea, where also there is a port, which is a most safe receptacle for ships, and is very populous. Avoiding, therefore, the crowd, and choosing the solitary shore, near to the erectation of the waves, there, stretched on a most soft bed of sand, I refreshed my weary body for the chariot of the sun had declined to the last boundary of day, and sweet sleep overpowered me when I gave myself to the evening repose. End of chapter 10, part 2
LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Albrecht. The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass, by Apuleius. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter 11, Part 1. Being awakened with a sudden terror about the first watch of the night, I beheld the full orb of the moon shining with excessive brightness, and just then emerging from the waves of the sea. Availing myself, therefore, of the silent secrets of opaque night, as I was also well assured that the primary goddess possessed a transcendent majesty, and that human affairs were entirely governed by her providence, and that not only cattle and wild beasts, but likewise things inanimate, were invigorated by the divine power of her light and of her deity, that the bodies likewise which are in the earth, in the heavens, and in the sea, are at one time increased as she increases, and at another time, conformably to her decrements, are diminished. Being well assured of this, I determined to implore the august image of the goddess then present, fate being now satiated with my calamities so many and so great, and administering to me the hope of safety, though late. Having, therefore, immediately shaken off sluggish sleep, I rose promptly and cheerfully, and directly applied myself to purification by washing with marine water, and having merged my head seven times in the waves, because according to the divine Pythagoras that number is especially adapted to religious purposes, I joyfully and readily thus supplicated with a weeping countenance the transcendently powerful goddess. Queen of heaven, whether thou art pure and nourishing Ceres, the original parent of fruits, who rejoicing for the discovery of thy daughter didst banish the savage nutriment of the ancient acorn, and exhibiting a milder aliment, dost now dwell in the Illusian land, or whether thou art celestial Venus, who in the first origin of things didst associate the different sexes through the intervention of mutual love, and having propagated an eternal progeny from the human race, art now worshipped in Paphos, which is washed by the surrounding sea, or whether thou art the sister of Phoebus, who by relieving the pains of parturient women by lenient remedies, hast delivered into light such a numerous multitude of men, and art now venerated in the illustrious temple of Ephesus, or whether thou art Proserpine, terrific by nocturnal howlings, restraining with a triform face the assaults of spectres, closing the recesses of the earth, wandering through various groves and propitiated by different modes of worship, with that female light of thine, illuminating every city and with moist fires nourishing the joyful seeds of plants and through the revolutions of the sun dispensing uncertain light by whatever name by whatever rites and under whatever form it is lawful to invoke thee graciously succour me in this my extreme calamity support my fallen fortune and grant me rest and peace after the endurance of so many cruel misfortunes let there have been enough of labours let there have been enough of dangers. Remove from me the dire form of a quadruped. Restore me to the sight of my kindred. Restore me to my Lucius. And if any offended deity oppresses me with inexorable cruelty, may it at least be lawful for me to die, if it is not lawful for me to live. Having after this manner poured forth my prayers, accompanied by miserable lamentations, sleep surrounding me, again oppressed my merced mind in the same bed and scarcely had i closed my eyes when behold i saw in a dream a divine form emerging from the middle of the sea and raising a countenance venerable even to the gods themselves afterwards the whole of the most splendid image seemed to stand before me having gradually shaken off the sea but i will also endeavour to explain to you its admirable form if the poverty of human language will but afford me the power of an appropriate narration, or if the divinity itself of the most luminous form will supply me with a liberal abundance of fluent diction. In the first place, then, her most copious and long hairs, being gradually entorted and promiscuously scattered on her divine neck, were softly defluous. A multiform crown, consisting of various flowers, bound the sublime summit of her head. And in the middle of the crown, just on her forehead there was a smooth orb resembling a mirror or rather a white refulgent light which indicated that she was the moon vipers rising up after the manner of furrows environed the crown on the right hand and on the left 
and cerulean ears of corn were also extended from above her garment was of many colours and woven from the finest flax and was at one time lucid with a white splendour at another yellow from the flower of crocus and at another flaming with a rosy redness but that which most excessively dazzled my sight was a very black robe fulgid with a dark splendour and which spreading round and passing under her right side and ascending to her left shoulder there rose protuberant like the centre of a shield the dependent part of the robe falling in many folds and having small knots of fringe gracefully flowing in its extremities glittering stars were dispersed through the embroidered border of the robe and through the whole of its surface and the full moon shining in the middle of the stars breathed forth flaming fires nevertheless a crown wholly consisting of flowers and fruits of every kind adhered with indivisible connection to the border of that conspicuous robe in all its undulating motions what she carried in her hands also consisted of things of a very different nature for her right hand indeed bore a brazen rattle through the narrow lamina of which bent like a belt certain rods passing produced a sharp triple sound through the vibrating motion of her arm an oblong vessel in the shape of a boat depended from her left hand on the handle of which in that part in which it was conspicuous an asp raised its erect head and largely swelling neck and shoes woven from the leaves of the victorious palm tree covered her immortal feet such and so great a goddess breathing the fragrant odour of the shoots of arabia the happy deigned with a divine voice thus to address me behold lucius i who am moved by thy prayers am present with thee i who am nature the parent of things the queen of all the elements the primordial progeny of ages the supreme of divinities the sovereign of the spirits of the dead the first of the celestials and the uniform resemblance of gods and goddesses i who rule by my nod the luminous summits of the heavens the salubrious breezes of the sea and the deplorable silences of the realms beneath and whose one divinity the whole orb of the earth venerates under a manifold form by different rites and a variety of appellations hence the primogenial phrygians call me pesenuctica the mother of the gods the attic aborigines cecropian minerva the floating cyprians Faphian venus the arrow-bearing cretans diana dictina the three-tongued sicilians stygian porserpini and the eleusinians the ancient goddess ceres some also call me juno others bellona others hecate and others ramnusia and those who are illuminated by the incipient rays of that divinity the sun when he rises viz the ethiopians the arii and the egyptians skilled in ancient learning worshipping me by ceremonies perfectly appropriate call me by my true name queen isis behold then i commiserating thy calamities am present now through my providence favouring and propitious dismiss now tears and lamentations and expel sorrow now through my providence the salutary day will shine upon thee listen therefore attentively to these my mandates the religion which is eternal has consecrated to me the day which will be born from this night on which day my priests offer to me the first fruits of navigation dedicating to me a new ship when now the winter tempests are mitigated and the stormy waves of the deep are appeased and the sea itself has now become navigable that sacred ceremony you ought to expect with a mind neither solicitous nor profane for the priest being admonished by me shall bear a rosy crown in his right hand adhering to the rattle in the very precinct of the pomp without delay therefore cheerfully follow the procession when the crowd is dispersed confiding in my benevolence when also you approach the priest gently pluck the roses as if you intended to kiss his hand and immediately divest yourself of the hide of that worst of beasts and which for some time since has been to me detestable 
nor should you fear anything pertaining to my concerns as difficult. For in this very same moment of time in which I come to you, being there also present, I order my priest in a dream to do those things which are to be done hereafter. By my command the thick crowd of people shall afford you room to pass through them, nor amidst the joyful ceremonies and festive spectacles shall any one abhor that deformed figure which you bear, or malignantly accuse you by putting a sinister construction on the sudden change of your form. Only remember, and always retain it deposited in the penetralia of your mind, that the remaining course of your life must be dedicated to me, even to the boundaries of your last breath. Nor is it unjust that you should owe your whole life to that goddess by whose assistance you will return to the human form. But you will live happy, you will live glorious under my protection, and when, having passed through the allotted space of your life, you descend to the realms beneath, there also in the subterranean hemisphere, you, dwelling in the Elysian fields, shall frequently adore me, whom you now see, and shall there behold me shining amidst the darkness of Acheron, reigning in the Stygian penetralia, and being propitious to you. Moreover, if you shall be found to deserve the protection of my divinity by sedulous obedience, religious services, and inviolable chastity, you shall know that it is possible for me alone to extend your life beyond the limits appointed to it by your fate. The venerable oracle being thus finished, the invincible goddess receded into herself. And without delay, I, being liberated from sleep, immediately arose, seized with fear and joy, and in an excessive perspiration, and in the highest degree admiring so manifest an appearance of the powerful goddess, having sprinkled myself with marine dew, and intent on her great commands, I revolved in my mind the order of her mandates. Shortly after, too, the golden sun arose, and put to flight the darkness of black night, when, behold, a crowd of people filled all the streets with a religious and perfectly triumphant procession. All things likewise independent of my peculiar joy seemed to me to exult with such great hilarity that I might have thought that cattle of every kind, every house, and even the day itself rejoiced with a serene countenance, for a bright and placid day suddenly succeeded to the frost of the preceding day, so that the tuneful birds also sang sweetly, allured by the tepid heat of the spring and with bland warbling soothed the mother of the stars the parent of the ages and the mistress of the whole world the very trees likewise both those which were prolific with fruit and those which were barren and only offered a shade being relaxed by the southern breezes and delighted with the germination of their leaves produced through the gentle motion of the branches sweetly whistling sounds and the sea the loud crashing noise of its storms being appeased, and the turbid swelling of its waves having subsided, softly washed the shore. But the heavens, the cloudy darkness being dispersed, were bright with the clear and serene splendor of their own proper light. Behold, then, the preludes of the great pomp gradually proceeded, beautifully adorned, conformably to the votive diligence of every one concerned in the procession. This man, being girded with a belt, represented a soldier. That, being clothed with a short cloak and carrying scimitars and javelins, was adorned like a hunter. Another, having golden socks on his feet, being clothed with a silken garment and precious female ornaments, and with false hair on his head, assumed the appearance of a woman by his gliding step. But another was remarkable by his boots, his shield, his helmet, and his sword, and you would have thought that he came from the school of the gladiators, nor was there wanting one who represented a magistrate by the fasces and the purple vests, nor one who feigned himself to be a philosopher by his cloak, his staff, and his slippers, and his goatish beard, nor those who with dissimilar reeds represented the one a fowler with bird lime, the other a fisherman with his hook. I also saw a tame bear which was carried on a bench in a matronal dress and an ape with a woven hat on its head, and clothed with a Phrygian garment of a saffron colour, carrying in its hand a golden cup, and representing the shepherd Ganymede, and likewise an ass, to which wings were agglutinated, and which walked near to a certain old man, so that you would have said the one was Bellerophon, and the other Pegasus, and nevertheless 
you would have laughed at both. During these ridiculous amusements of the people who wandered about everywhere, the peculiar pomp of the saviour goddess advanced. Women, splendid in white garments, expressing their joy by various gestures, and adorned with vernal crowns, scattered from their bosom flowers on the ground through the path in which the sacred crowd walked. Others, with mirrors placed behind their backs, showed to the goddess the obsequiousness of the crowd, as if it had come for the purpose of meeting her. There were also others who, carrying ivory combs, imitated the adornment and combing of royal hairs by the motion of their arms and the inflection of their fingers. And there were likewise others who sprinkled the streets with drops of genial balsam and other ointments. Besides this, there was a great multitude of men and women who propitiated the goddess, the offspring of the celestial stars, by lamps, torches, wax lights, and other kinds of artificial light. Afterwards, sweet symphonies resounded from the most delightful modulations of pipes and flutes. A pleasant choir of the most select youths, in splendid white garments, every way closed, followed them, frequently singing an elegant song which an ingenious poet had composed through the favour of the muses, and which explained the meaning of the procession. Pipers also, consecrated to the great Serapis, proceeded among those musicians whose songs were antecedent to the greater vows, and sung the accustomed modulation pertaining to the god and his temple, the oblique pipe being extended to the right ear. And there were likewise precursors, who proclaimed that convenient room would be given for the sacred procession to pass. After this there was an influx of a crowd of those who had been initiated in the sacred rites of the goddess, consisting of men and women of every degree and of every age, resplendent with the pure whiteness of linen garments. The women had their anointed hair enfolded in a pellucid covering, but the men had their hair perfectly shaven, and the crown of their head was exceedingly bright. These terrene stars also of the great religion of the goddess produced a sharp sound from the brazen silver and likewise golden rattles which they held in their hands. But those principal men that presided over the sacred rites, and who were clothed in a close-drawn garment of white linen hanging down to the extremities of their feet, carried the most illustrious spoils of the most powerful gods, and of these the first exhibited a lamp shining with a clear light, not resembling those lamps of ours which illuminate nocturnal banquets, but it was a golden boat-cup which emitted a larger flame from an aperture in the middle. The second was clothed in a similar manner, but carried in both his hands altars to which the auxiliary providence of the supreme goddess gave a proper name. The third proceeded, raising a palm-tree, the leaves of which were subtly gilt, and also the mercurial caduceus. The fourth exhibited the symbol of equity, viz. a left hand, fashioned from the palm or inner part expanded, which seems to be more adapted to equity than the right hand, because it is naturally sluggish, and is endued with no craft and no subtlety. The same person also carried a golden vessel, which was round like the female breast, and from which he poured forth milk. The fifth bore a golden corn-fan, full of golden branches, and another carried an amphora. In the next place, without delay, the images of the gods carried by the priests of Isis proceeded, not disdaining to walk with the feet of men, this terrifically raising a canine head, but that being the messenger of the supernal gods, and of those in the realms beneath, with an erect face partly black, and partly of a golden colour, bearing in his left hand a caduceus, and shaking in his right hand branches of the flourishing palm-tree, whose footsteps a cow, in an erect position, immediately followed. This cow was the prolific resemblance of the all-parent goddess, and was carried on the shoulders of one of the blessed servants of this divinity, and who acted the part of a mimic as he walked. Another carried a sister or chest containing arcana, and perfectly concealing the mystic symbols of a magnificent religion, and another bore in his happy bosom the venerable effigies of the supreme divinity, which was not similar to any cattle or bird or wild beast, nor even to man, but was venerable for the subtlety by which it was invented, and also for its novelty, was an ineffable indication of a more sublime religion and which was to be concealed in the greatest silence. But this effigies was fashioned after the following manner. There was a small urn, 
formed of splendid gold most artificially excavated the bottom of which was very round and which was externally engraven with the admirable images of the egyptians the orifice of this urn which was not much elevated was extended into a prominent rivulet but a handle adhered to the side opposite to the orifice and receded from the urn by a spacious dilatation on this handle an asp sat raising its neck which was scaly wrinkled and tumid and embraced it with one fold of its body and behold the benefits and the destiny which the most powerful goddess had promised to me approached and the priest was present bringing with him my salvation and adorned in a manner conformable to what the divinity had previously announced in his right hand he carried the rattle of the goddess which was to me a crown and by hercules a crown by a necessary consequence because through the providence of the greatest goddess i vanquished the opposition of most cruel fortune after having encountered so many labors and so many dangers nevertheless i did not run violently though i was agitated by a sudden joy fearing lest the tranquil order of religion should be disturbed by the hasty impetus of a quadruped but i hesitatingly passed through the crowd with a quiet and perfectly human step and with a gradual obligation of my body the people giving way to me through the interference of the goddess by the priest as i might very well perceive recollecting the nocturnal oracle and admiring the congruity of the office which he was commanded to perform immediately stood still and spontaneously extending his right hand presented to my mouth a crown of roses then i trembling and my heart leaping with continual palpitation devoured with great desire and a greedy mouth the shining crown in which delightful roses were interwoven nor did the celestial promise deceive me for immediately my deformed and brutal figure left me and in the first place indeed my squalid hair fell off and afterwards my thick skin became attenuated my broad belly became narrow and the soles of my feet passed into toes through my hoofs my hands are no longer feet but are extended to their erect offices my long neck is shortened my face and my head become round my enormous ears are restored to their pristine parvitude my stony teeth return to those of a human size and the tail which before especially tormented me was nowhere to be found the people admire the religious venerate so evident an indication of the power of the supreme divinity and the magnificence and facility of my restoration which resembled the nocturnal images in my dreams extending likewise their hands to the heavens they proclaim with a clear and unanimous voice such an illustrious benefit of the goddess but i being fixed in excessive astonishment remained silent my mind not being capable of receiving a joy so sudden and so great and i was dubious what i should first and principally say whence i should assume the beginning of a new voice and more happily commence my speech as my tongue was now restored to me and in what magnificent language i should return thanks to so great a goddess the priest however who through the divine admonition knew all my calamities from the beginning though he himself also was astonished by that remarkable miracle having first signified his wish by a nod ordered that a linen garment should be given to me for the purpose of covering my nakedness for as soon as the ass had despoiled me of my abominable vesture i well fortified myself with a natural covering as much as it was possible for one who is naked to do by closely compressing my thighs and carefully placing my hands over my private parts then one of the religious cohort having promptly divested himself of his upper garment most rapidly covered me with it which being done the priest with a joyful countenance and by hercules astonished at my now human aspect thus addressed me o oh, lucius you have at length arrived at the port of quiet and the altar of pity having endured many and various labours and great tempests of fortune and been tossed about by mighty waves of calamity nor did the nobility of your race nor your dignity nor even the learning in which you abound at all benefit you but falling into servile pleasures through the lubricity of flourishing youth you have brought back an inauspicious reward of your unhappy curiosity the blindness of fortune however while she has tormented you by the worst of dangers 
has brought you by her improvident malignity to this religious beatitude let her now go and rage with the greatest fury and let her search for some other subject for her cruelty for hostile misfortune has no power over those whose service the majesty of our goddess vindicates to itself what advantage has iniquitous fortune derived from robbers from wild beasts from servitude from the various circuits of the roughest paths and from the fear of death to which you were daily exposed you are now therefore received into the protection of fortune but of the fortune that can see and who also illuminates the other gods with the splendour of her light assume now a more joyful countenance and more adapted to that white garment which you wear attend the pomp of your saviour goddess with triumphant steps let the irreligious see let them see and acknowledge their error behold lucius rejoicing in the providence of the great isis and freed from his pristine miseries triumphs in his own fortune nevertheless that you may be more safe and better protected become one of this holy order which you will hereafter rejoice that you embraced and now dedicate yourself to the service of our religion and voluntarily subject yourself to the yoke of this ministry for when you have once entered into the service of the goddess you will then in a greater degree enjoy the fruit of your liberty the excellent priest having thus prophesied and breathing with difficulty was silent end of chapter eleven part one read by todd albrick chapter eleven part two of the metamorphosis or golden ass this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Albrick. The Metamorphosis or Golden Ass by Apuleius. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter 11, Part 2. I afterwards walking, mingled with the religious crowd, accompanied the sacred pomp, being known and conspicuous to the whole city and distinguished by the fingers and nods of the men all the people spoke of me and said the august power of the omnipotent goddess has restored this man to the human form happy by hercules and thrice blessed is he who is deserved by the innocence and probity of the former part of his life such an illustrious protection from heaven so that after a manner being born again he is immediately affianced to the ministry of sacred rites while these things were said, and during the tumult of the festive vows proceeding gradually, we now approached to the shore of the sea, and came to that very place in which, on the preceding day, I, while I was yet an ass, had taken up my abode. The images, which the priests of Isis carried, being there properly disposed, the chief priest dedicated and consecrated to the goddess a ship, most artificially fabricated, on all sides variously adorned with the admirable pictures, that is, hieroglyphics, of the Egyptians, and exquisitely purified with a burning torch, an egg, and sulphur, at the same time pouring forth from his holy mouth the most solemn prayers the splendid sail of this blessed ship had a vow inscribed on in it in large letters these letters renewed the vow which had been made on shore for a prosperous event of the new navigation now the mast of that ship was raised which was a round pine tree tall and splendid and conspicuous by its remarkable top the stern also of the ship was decorated with a goose with an intorted neck and was refulgent through being covered with golden spangles and the whole of the polished keel consisted of shining citron wood then all the people as well as the religious and the profane emulously heaped together corn fans full of aromatics and things pertaining to supplications and poured into the sea a milky paste till the ship being filled with copious gifts and auspicious prayers was freed from the ropes that held the anchor and was restored to the sea with a peculiar and serene wind after likewise it had proceeded so far that the view of it was uncertain to us each of those who carried the sacred symbols again took what he had brought and began cheerfully to return to the temple in a decorous manner and in the same order of procession in which they came from it 
but when we arrived at the temple itself the chief priest and those who carried the divine images and who some time prior to this had been initiated in the venerable mysteries being received into the sanctuary of the goddess disposed in a proper order the breathing resemblances then one of these whom all of them called a scribe standing before the doors the company of the pastrophori which is the name of the members of that sacred college being cited as to an assembly uttered from a lofty chair auspicious wishes from a book in which they were written for the great emperor the senate and the equestrian order and for all the roman people and likewise for the nautical ships and for all those who are governed under the empire of this our hemisphere and then he pronounced in the greek tongue and after the grecian manner ploiophasia which signified that divine service was ended and that it was lawful for every man to depart which words were followed by a clamour of the people signifying that all things would happen felicitously to all of them afterwards the people being full of joy carrying with them branches of olive sweet herbs and garlands of flowers and having kissed the footsteps of the goddess departed to their own habitations nevertheless my mind would not suffer me to go even the breadth of a nail from that place but being attentive to the image of the goddess i recalled to my memory my former misfortunes swift fame however had not in the meantime been idle but had everywhere narrated in my country the adorable benefit of the provident goddess and my memorable fortune that is my restoration from the asinine to the human form at length therefore my domestics and servants and those who were nearly allied to me by the bond of consanguinity laying aside the sorrow which they had conceived from the false relation of my death and exhilarated by a sudden joy hastened immediately to see me who had been divinely saved and brought back as it were from the realms beneath and presented me with various gifts with the unexpected view of these i being delighted gave them thanks for their worthy gifts for my domestics had providently taken care to bring me what would be abundantly sufficient for the expenses of my dress and my food having therefore spoken to each of them as it was my duty to do and narrated to them my pristine sorrows and my present joy i again betook myself to a survey of the goddess which was to me most delightful and procured for myself a temporary habitation within the enclosure of the temple still applying myself to the private services of the goddess being inseparable from the society of the priests and a constant adorer of the great goddess nor did i pass any night or any sleep without some vision and admonition of this divinity but she ordered me by frequent mandates to be now initiated in her sacred mysteries to which i had been some time ago destined but i though it was what i very much desired was nevertheless restrained by religious fear for by diligent inquiry i knew that the service of religion was difficult that the abstinence which chastity required was sufficiently arduous and that life which is subject to many casualties is to be defended by cautious circumspection frequently revolving these things with myself i deferred the being initiated i know not how although hastening to the accomplishment of it on a certain night i appeared to myself to see in a dream the chief priest offering to me his full lap and on my asking what that was he answered me that the contents of his lap were sent to me from thessaly for that a servant of mine whose name was candidus had arrived from the same province when i awoke i revolved in my mind frequently and for a long time what the vision portended especially as i was certain that i never had any servant who was called by that name nevertheless i believe that some gain was undoubtedly signified by the priest offering me the contents of his lap thus being anxious and attentive to that more abundant gain i impatiently waited for the opening of the temple in the morning and while the white veils by which the image of the goddess was screened from the view of the profane being drawn aside in different directions we implored the venerable face of the goddess the priest going round the altars which were disposed in order applied himself to divine works and together with the usual prayers poured from a vessel water drawn from a fountain which was in the penetralia of the temple the sacred rites therefore being now properly performed the religious loudly announced the first hour of the day by their morning adorations and behold the servant suddenly came from my country whom i had there left after photis by her base errors had forced me to be tied by a rope that is to become an ass 
for my kindred had brought back with them my servants, and also had recovered that horse of mine, which I recognized by the spot on its back, after it had been sold to various persons. Hence I then especially admired the sagacity of my dream, that besides the congruity of the promised gain, it had restored to me my horse, which was of a white color, under the designation of the servant Canadus. After this I, being still solicitous about the same thing, assiduously applied myself to the worship of the goddess, perceiving that the hope which I had conceived of future good was now confirmed by the present benefits. Nevertheless, my desire of engaging in sacred offices increased daily more and more. Hence I frequently went to the chief priest, and most earnestly entreated him to initiate me in the arcane mysteries of the sacred night. But he, though otherwise a severe man, and celebrated by his observance of that abstemious religion, deferring my request mildly and gently, and in the way in which parents are accustomed to moderate the immature desires of their children, allured my mind, though otherwise anxious, by the solace of better hope. For he said that the day in which he who desired he might be initiated was indicated by the will of the goddess, and that by her providence the priest was chosen who ought to perform the sacred rites, and that by her mandate also the expense necessary for the ceremonies was ordained. All which circumstances, he thought, should induce me to wait with obsequious patience, since we ought by all means to avoid eagerness and obstinacy as faults, and neither be dilatory when called, nor precipitate when not called. He added that there was not any one of their number who was so lost to a sense of propriety, or rather so destined to death, as to rashly and sacrilegiously dare to engage in the service of the goddess, and thus contract a deadly guilt, unless she peculiarly ordered him to do so. For the gates of the realms beneath and the guardianship of life are placed in the hands of the goddess, and the delivery of her mysteries is celebrated as a thing resembling a voluntary death and a precarious life, because she is accustomed to choose for this purpose men who, having arrived at a great age, are now placed in the extreme boundary of their life, but to whom nevertheless the great arcana of religion may be safely committed, and who, through her providence, being after a manner born again, are restored to the race of a new life. It therefore was requisite that I should also wait for the celestial mandate, although by the clear and manifest favour of the great goddess I had some time ago been called and destined to her blessed service, and that I should now abstain from profane and nefarious food, no less than other worshippers of the divinity, in order that I might with greater rectitude accede to the more secret arcana of the most pure religion. Thus spoke the priest, nor was my compliance broken by impatience, but I attentively performed daily the laborious service pertaining to the observance of sacred rites, with mild tranquillity and laudable silence. Nor did the salutary benignity of the powerful goddess deceive me, nor torment me by the delay of a length of time, but she clearly admonished me, by no obscure mandates of obscure night, that is, in a nocturnal dream, that the day was now arrived that had been always the object of my desire, and in which she would put me in possession of my greatest wish. She also informed me what sum of money would be requisite for my procuring the sacred apparatus, and at the same time appointed for me, as the minister of sacred rites, that very Mithras himself, her own chief priest, who, she said, was conjoined to me by a certain divine consent of the stars. But I, by these and other benevolent precepts of the supreme goddess, being mentally refreshed, sleep having left me, though it was not yet clear day, immediately proceeded to the dwelling of the priest, and having found him then going out of his bedchamber, I saluted him. And I had now determined to request more firmly than ever that I might commence my religious service, as a thing that was due to me. But he, as soon as he saw me, began prior to me thus to speak, O oh, my Lucius, how happy and blessed are you! whom the august divinity has so greatly honoured by her propitious will. And why, said he, do you now stand idle and make any delay? The day sought by your continual wishes is now present to you, in which you will be initiated in the most pious arcana of sacred rites, by these my hands, through the divine mandate of the multi-nominal goddess. And the most humane old man, taking hold of me by the hand, led me immediately to the doors of the most ample temple, 
and having performed the office of opening them in the accustomed solemn way and making the morning sacrifice he took from the most inward parts of the aditum certain books written in unknown characters that is in hieroglyphics partly compendiously suggesting the words of a discourse by the figures of animals of every kind and partly fortified against the inquisitive perusal of the profane by knotted accents and which were bent after the manner of a wheel and folded in each other like the tendrils of a vine from these books he informed me what must necessarily be prepared by me for the purpose of initiation immediately therefore i strenuously procured the previous requisites and somewhat more abundantly than i was ordered to do partly through myself and partly through my associates and when the time as the priest said required it he led me to the nearest bath which was surrounded by a company of religious men and when he had placed me in the accustomed bath he himself washed me and sprinkled me with water in the purest manner after he had first implored the pardon of the gods again also he brought me back to the temple and there placed me before the footsteps of the goddess two parts of the day having been now passed over and having given certain mandates in secret which are too holy to be uttered he clearly ordered before all that were present that i should abstain from luxurious food during those ten continued days and that i should not eat the flesh of any animal and should refrain from wine these precepts therefore having been properly observed by me with a venerable countenance the day had now arrived in which i was to appear before the image of the goddess isis in order to be initiated and the sun descending led on the evening then behold there was a conflux of the people on all sides every one honouring me with various gifts according to the ancient custom of sacred rites then also the priest all the profane being removed taking hold of me by the hand brought me to the penetralia of the temple clothed in a new linen garment perhaps inquisitive reader you will very anxiously ask me what was then said and done i would tell you if it would be lawfully told you should know it if it was lawful for you to hear it but both the ears and the tongue are guilty of rash curiosity nevertheless i will not keep you in suspense with religious desire nor torment you with long continued anxiety hear therefore but believe what is true I approach to the confines of death, and having trod on the threshold of Proserpine, I returned from it, being carried through all the elements. At midnight I saw the sun shining with a splendid light, and I manifestly drew near to the gods beneath, and the gods above, and proximately adored them. Behold, I have narrated to you things of which, though heard, it is nevertheless necessary that you should be ignorant i will therefore only relate that which may be enunciated to the understanding of the profane without a crime the morning arose and the solemnities being performed i came forth consecrated in twelve sacerdotal garments in a dress indeed very religious but of which i am not forbidden by any law to speak because it was seen by many who were then present for by order of the priest i ascended a wooden throne which was in the very middle of the sacred dwelling that is of the temple and was placed before the image of the goddess and there i sat conspicuous in a garment which was indeed linen but was elegantly painted a precious cloak also depended from my shoulders behind my back as far as to my heels nevertheless to whatever part of me you directed your view you might see that i was remarkable by the animals which were painted round my vestment in various colours here were indian dragons there hyperborean griffins which the other hemisphere generates in the form of a winged animal men devoted to the service of divinity called this cloak the olympic garment but in my right hand i carried a burning torch and my head was decorously encircled with a crown the shining leaves of the palm tree projecting from it like rays of light thus being adorned like the sun and placed so as to resemble a statue on a sudden the veils being drawn aside i was exhibited to the eyes of the people afterwards i celebrated the most joyful day of my initiation as my natal day by delightfully pleasant and facetious banquets the third day also was celebrated with the same ceremonies and was accompanied by a religious breakfast and the legitimate consummation of the initiation and having stayed for some days in that place i enjoyed through the divine image that is the image of the goddess 
an inexplicable pleasure being indebted to it for a benefit which can never be repaid nevertheless through the admonition of the goddess having suppliantly given her thanks though not such as she deserved yet to the best of my ability i prepared myself very slowly to return home having therefore with difficulty burst the bonds of my most ardent desire of remaining with the goddess i at length prostrated myself before her and having for a long time wiped her footsteps with my face the tears bursting forth interrupting also my speech by frequent sobs and as it were devouring my words i thus addressed the goddess thou o holy and perpetual saviour of the human race being always munificent in cherishing mortals dost employ the sweet affection of a mother on the misfortunes of the miserable nor is there any day or night or even a slender moment of time which passes unattended by thy benevolent interpositions thou protectest men both by sea and land and dispersing the storms of life dost extend thy salutary right hand by which thou drawest back the inextricably twisted thread of the fates and dost mitigate the tempest of inclement fortune and restrain the noxious courses of the stars the supernal gods reverence thee and those in the realms beneath attentively observe thy nod thou rollest the sphere of the universe round the steady poles dost illuminate the sun govern the world and tread on the dark realms of tartarus the stars move responsive to thy command the gods rejoice in thy divinity the hours and seasons return by thy appointment and the elements reverence thy decree by thy nod blasts of wind blow the clouds are nourished seeds germinate and blossoms increase birds swiftly passing through the tracks of the air wild beasts wandering on the mountains serpents concealed in the ground and the enormous monsters that swim in the sea are terrified at the majesty which invests thy divinity but i who in celebrating thy praises possess but weak abilities and for offering sacrifices but a slender patrimony have by no means eloquence sufficient to express all that i conceive of the dignity of thy nature nor are a thousand mouths and as many tongues nor the eternal series of unwearied speech equal to the arduous task i will therefore be solicitous to perform that which a religious though poor man may be able to effect for i will image to myself thy divine countenance and most sacred deity and perpetually preserve it concealed in the most secret recesses of my soul after this manner having implored the supreme goddess i embraced the priest mithras whom i now called my parent and clinging to his neck and giving him many kisses i begged him to pardon me that i could not remunerate him in a manner adequate to such mighty benefits and therefore i had been for a long time engaged in giving him thanks i at last departed and proceeded directly to my paternal abode in order to revisit it after so long an absence hence when a few days had elapsed i rapidly collected together my viatica in bundles through the admonition of the powerful goddess and entering into a ship i directed my course towards rome being likewise certain of prosperous winds during my voyage i quickly entered into port afterwards travelled with great rapidity in a chariot and arrived at this hallowed city on the day before the ides of december in the evening nor afterwards was any concern of such principal importance with me as that of daily supplicating the supreme divinity of queen isis who is there propitiated with the greatest veneration under the name of isis capensis which appellation she is allotted from the situation of her temple lastly i was an assiduous worshipper of her divinity being a foreigner indeed in her temple but a domestic of her religion and behold when the great sun having passed through the sign-bearing circle that is the zodiac having completed the year the vigilant care of the beneficent goddess again interrupted my sleep and again admonished me of initiation and sacred rites and i wondered what she was preparing for me to do and what future event she announced for how is it possible i should not since i appeared to myself to have been already abundantly initiated while therefore i partly discuss my religious scruple in my own mind and partly avail myself of the counsels of the priests a novel and perfectly admirable circumstance took place for i found that i was only initiated in the mysteries of the goddess but not in those of the great god and supreme father of the gods the invincible osiris 
for though the nature of their divinity and religion is connected or rather is transcendently united nevertheless there is the greatest difference in the initiations into their mysteries hence it ought to be known by me that the great god required that i should be one of his servants nor did the thing long remain ambiguous for on the following night i saw in a dream one of the priests clothed in linen garments who carrying thyrsi and ivy and certain other things of which it is not lawful to speak placed them before my household gods and occupying my seat announced to me that i should prepare the banquets of a magnificent religion he also walked gently with a limping step the ankle bone of his left foot being a little bent in order that he might afford me some sign by which i might know him all the darkness of ambiguity therefore was removed after such a manifest declaration of the will of the gods hence as soon as i had performed the morning salutations of the goddess i diligently inquired whether any one of the priests resembled him whom i had seen in a dream nor was he wanting for i immediately beheld one of the pastophori exactly according with the nocturnal image not only by the indication of his foot but also by his stature and features and who as i afterwards knew was called asinius marcellus a name not foreign to my transformation without delay therefore i went directly to him who was not ignorant of what i intended to say because he had already been admonished by a similar mandate that he should initiate me in the mysteries of osiris for on the preceding night while i was adapting crowns for the statue of the great god he seemed to himself to have heard from that mouth of his by which he pronounces the destiny of everything that he should send the madurensian to him who was very poor and to whom his sacred mysteries ought immediately to be administered for the god said that by his providence renown from religious studies was prepared for the madurensian and great gain for him that is for asinius marcellus after this manner being affianced to sacred concerns i was retarded contrary to my wishes through the slenderness of my means to pay the necessary expenses for the money which i had spent in my journey had consumed the small substance of my patrimony and the presents which it was requisite i should make in rome in order to be initiated in the mysteries of osiris exceeded those which i had before made in a roman province hard poverty therefore being greatly adverse to my desire i was tormented being placed according to the proverb between a sacrifice and a stone nor was i less urged by the pressing mandate of the god and now being frequently stimulated not without great perturbation at last by command of the divinity having sold my garment though but small i collected a sum sufficient for the purpose and this very thing i was expressly ordered to do for the god said to me would you at all spare your garments in attempting to procure anything which might administer to your pleasure and are you now when you are going to be initiated in such great mysteries dubious whether you shall commit yourself to poverty unattended with repentance all things therefore being abundantly prepared again being satisfied for ten days with inanimate food and besides this being also instructed in the nocturnal orgies of the chief god serapis i now complied with the divine mandate full of that confidence which my knowledge of a kindred religion produced this circumstance afforded the greatest consolation to my peregrination and at the same time more largely supplied me with the means of subsistence for the deity of good event being favourable i supported myself through the gain which i acquired in the forum by pleading causes in the latin tongue behold also a short time after this i was again excited by the unexpected and perfectly wonderful mandates of the gods and was compelled to undertake a third initiation but i not lightly solicitous and in a state of great suspense frequently exercised my thoughts in considering what the intention could be of this new and unheard-of will of the gods and what could still remain to be added to an initiation already twice repeated for i said both the priests have either wrongly advised me or less fully than they ought to have done and by hercules i now also began to entertain a bad opinion of their fidelity while however i was thus fluctuating in a stormy sea of thought and agitated as if i had been insane the mild image of the god thus instructed me by a nocturnal vision there is no reason it said that you should be terrified by the long series of religious rites as if anything had been previously omitted but you ought rather to be exceedingly joyful on account of the honour which the gods assiduously pay you and to exult that you will thrice obtain a thing which is scarcely even once granted to others 
and you may justly presume from that number that you will always be blessed moreover you will find that this third initiation is very necessary for you if you now consider with yourself that the garment of the goddess with which you were invested in the province remains deposited in the same temple and that you cannot supplicate at rome on solemn days in a garment of this kind or be rendered illustrious by that blessed vestment when you shall be commanded to put it on in order therefore that you may be happy fortunate and healthful again with a joyful mind be initiated in sacred mysteries by the command of the great gods osiris serapis and isis thus far the persuasive majesty of the divine dream announced to me what was requisite to be done nor did i neglect the affair afterwards nor defer it by supine procrastination but immediately relating what i had seen to my priest i lived chastely and abstained from animal food and having of my own accord extended my abstinence beyond those ten days prescribed by a perpetual law i brought what was requisite for my initiation spending more largely from a pious intention than with a view to what was wanted nor by hercules did i at all repent of my labours and expenses for by the liberal providence of the gods i was sufficiently enriched by forensic gain at length after a very few days had elapsed the god osiris who is the chief of the great gods the highest of the greater the greatest of the highest and the ruler of the greatest not being now transformed into some foreign person but manifestly deigning to speak to me in his own divine words seemed to me in a dream to declare that i should now indubitably plead causes in the forum with renown and that i should not fear the slanders of the malevolent which the learning i had acquired by laborious study would there excite and in order that i might minister to his sacred rites mingled with a crowd of other religious men he chose me to be one of his pastophori and also placed me among the quinquennial decurions and lastly my hair being again perfectly shaved i joyfully performed the duties of that most ancient college and which was established about the time of scylla not shading or covering my baldness but rendering it in all parts conspicuous End of chapter 11, part 2 Recording by Todd Albrick End of the Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass, by Apuleius Translated by Thomas Taylor